Good morning. Um, there'll be opportunities at our morning break and also at, at lunch and in the afternoon break to, to, to make new friends and new clients and, and whatever. Um, there's still a few people coming through security, but I think we really do need to get started. We have a very full day. Um, there's a lot of information we want to give you, and we're going to make uh, ample provision during the presentations for you to ask questions. So, so we're not just going to be talking at you the entire time. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, and with, with that, um, I'd like to introduce um, on his second day the new bureau chief for the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, which is a bureau that I work with, I'm assigned to as the Federal Preservation Officer for the FCC. Um, Rick? Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for uh, joining the Commission's Environmental and Historic Preservation Compliance Training Seminar. Uh, for those of you who I have uh, yet to meet, uh, my name is Rick Kaplan, uh, the very new Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Uh, and I should know from the outset that I, myself, I'm far from historic or in need of specific preservation, uh, as it's only my second day. Um, but uh, there are other public servants who you hear from today who uh, qualify for the term historic, and uh, I'll leave the subject matter uh, to them since they're the experts, and I think they'll, you'll find what they have to say very fruitful and hopefully helpful uh, as you all move forward, as we have a, such a great uh, crowd here of uh, people from diverse areas of uh, industry and preservation. Uh, I have uh, managed to serve at the commission uh, now for over two years and for the last year as the chief counsel for the chairman. Uh, and anyone familiar with the chairman well knows that one of his primary areas of interest is ensuring that our nation leads the world in mobile communications. And wireless services in particular are central to the economic, civic, and social lives of nearly all Americans. And we're in the midst of an incredible communications revolution, the likes of which I think we can all uh, understand and recognize we haven't seen for some time. Our increasing demand for all things mobile, especially mobile broadband, has put a new premium on new and upgraded network infrastructure. In plain terms, that means, at least in part, the need to continuously site and upgrade thousands of towers across the country. But the aggressive build-out this country has undertaken and that we at the Commission continue to encourage must also be accompanied by a strong appreciation and understanding of Congress's goals in enacting the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. The Commission has long viewed these twin aims, build-out and preservation, as compatible and has developed thoughtful rules in conjunction with industry and preservationists to ensure that both can be accomplished. Let's make no mistake, the federal law clearly reflects the nation's commitment to preserving and protecting its vast historic resources. The National Historic Preservation Act expresses a general policy of supporting and encouraging the preservation of such resources for present and future generations, and has directed federal agencies, including the FCC, to consider their importance in our activities. Specifically, the Act provides for the preservation of an environment that truly represents the nation's social and historic diversity by determining whether any proposed federal undertaking will, quote, diminish the integrity of the property's location, setting, feeling, or association. I touch briefly on these overarching goals merely to provide the context for what we are really attempting to achieve today. A workshop or seminar can be just that in many respects if we lose sight of its underlying purpose. I suggest only that as we work through the compliance issues on the agenda today, we stop to reflect on the greater sense of community and history that has led to the development of the rules at the heart of today's discussion. I would like to uh, thank in particular our federal agency partners with whom we are collaborating in today's session and this effort more broadly, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, the R Rural Utility Service, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They have each demonstrated their unwavering commitment to these important matters. I'd hope to offer a special personal welcome to the Choctaw Tribal Historic Preservation Offer, Officer, Mr. Terry Cole, but unfortunately, we were just informed that Terry is under the weather and is unable to join us. Uh, we wish him a very speedy recovery. Uh, we have uh, signaled to the bullpen, however, and listed our own Jeff Blackwell, who heads the FCC's Office of Native Affairs and Policy, to lead the tribal issues conversation today. Uh, we are proud of the close relationship we have developed with tribal leaders on matters of mutual interest and uh, undertake our treaty obligations with the utmost seriousness. The challenges of deployment and preservation are no more evident than on tribal lands, 
where the mobile divide is at its height and where it's imperative to protect and preserve unparalleled sacred cultural heritage. We also recognize the importance of preserving tribal sites of significance that are located beyond today's tribal lands. We will also be hearing from the State Historic Preservation Officers and representatives from the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. I anticipate that these sessions will generate robust dialogue. I should also note that we have a special guest today from, I guess we'll call it out of town, joining us today, Alexander Sven, uh, directing, uh, the, the director of the licensing department of the Liberia Telecommunications Authority. Is Mr. Sven here? There we go. Ah. Sorry to meet you from across the room, but how you doing? Uh, he's here in part because the Republic of Liberia has enacted an environmental protection law containing similar provisions regarding infrastructure, infrastructure siting to our own. So we welcome you, Mr. Sen, and uh, it's an honor to be sharing our experiences and learning from each other. Thank you. Uh, he'll definitely win the prize for the longest trip, uh, I don't think. I don't think I'm getting ahead of myself on that one, unless someone all right, corrects me. In addition to the Commission's Wireless Bureau staff, you'll also be hearing from our colleagues from the Media, Consumer, and Public Safety Bureaus. Uh, I just want to close by saying I can't overstate the importance of advanced communication networks to securing our nation's economic security and vitality. I recognize the work, and the Commission recognizes the work that so many of you in this room do uh, to meet that goal. The list of benefits a cutting edge and ubiquitous network can yield uh, has been well chronicled from new exciting opportunities in education, energy, healthcare, to more jobs and economic growth for all Americans. Together with our state and tribal partners, we can help facilitate the robust communications networks that our, nations, our nation requires in a responsible manner and one that does not compromise our rich histories and collective legacy. Thank you for, again for taking the time to join us today and our very capable staff, and uh, we'll work through these issues with you closely. I'm now pleased to turn the proceedings over to Jeff Steinberg, our Je Deputy Chief in the Spectrum and Co Competition Policy Division at, at the Wireless Bureau, who oversees facility siting issues for the Bureau. Jeff. Thanks, Rick. Um, as I look around the crowd today, I see a number of familiar faces. Welcome back, always good to see you. I also see many more people who are new to me and really glad that you're all here. I think you'll get a lot out of the day. Um, just to briefly introduce who I am, I am Jeff Steinberg. I'm Deputy Chief of the Spectrum and Competition Policy Division. And one of my principal responsibilities in that position is to manage the Wireless Telecommunication Bureau's work um, regarding infrastructure. And in turn, the major portion really of that infrastructure work is our environmental and historic preservation policy and review. Um, among my, the many valued staff members who work for me on these projects is Steve Del Sordo, who is the Federal Preservation Officer for the entire commission. So while the Wireless Bureau um, is directly responsible for wireless telecommunications facilities, we're also involved in the review for everything else that the Commission licenses. Um, the goals today are very, very important, but also pretty simple to state. Um, very briefly, what we're out to do is to make the review process work the best that it possibly can to ensure that environmental and historic preservation effects of towers are fully considered and at the same time, not to impede, impede the rapid deployment of services that are essential in today's economy. It's our experience that the process works most smoothly and most effectively when everybody involved knows what to expect. Now, this means not only knowing what the rules are, although that's obviously critical and we're going to spend some time on that, and not only knowing what our electronic systems are and our processes, although we're going to spend time going through that as well, but also just the little tricks of the trade that help everybody communicate in what is really at bottom a collaborative process without misunderstandings and without delays. So for those of you who are new to this, um, I think you're going to get quite an education today. And for those of you who are old hands, maybe you'll pick up a new idea or a new perspective that will help your work go a little easier. Equally important today, we want to learn from you. Now, I think the only drawback of the wonderful attendance that we have here today is that we can't make the program as interactive as we might otherwise have liked. But we recognize that we can really do our job right only when we understand the challenges and the realities that all of you are facing out in the field. So we've built in as much time as we can in the agenda for questions and for participation, and I encourage all of you to speak up. 
I'm particularly excited about two of the sessions that we have planned for this afternoon that focus on areas of the work that we have not always spent as much time on in the past. Um, in the first of these st sessions, staff from our Media Bureau and our Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau are going to talk about the special considerations that affect towers used for public safety services and for broadcast services. Understandably, as we do this work, we often get caught up in the wireless towers that make up the vast majority of the towers that we do, that, that, that we do regulate. Um, but it's important to understand that public safety systems and broadcast services have, in, in some ways, very different um, both regulatory regimes and technical challenges. And even if your focus is on you know, historic preservation or on endangered species, um, it helps to understand that context. After that, we're going to um, hear from our federal partners at NTIA, RUS, and FEMA. Um, these agencies' funding processes are becoming more and more implicated in the same towers that, that, that we review as part of our licensing regime and, and um, antenna structure registration. Um, and so it's important to understand what it is that they do and how our processes integrate together. Well, we have a packed day in front of us, and you don't want to spend it listening to me any more than I want to spend it standing up here talking. Um, I'm going to try to be here for most of the sessions today so that I can learn from you and from all our wonderful panelists that we have. Um, but for now, I'm going to um, turn it over to the first of our, you know, getting to the meat of the program today, back to Steve Del Sordo. Thanks. I also want to thank everybody for for coming. Um, just when we started this, as I mentioned earlier, we weren't sure what kind of turnout we would get. And the, it, not just the numbers, but the range of people that have chosen to spend their own money to, to come to uh, to DC to listen to us talk to them um, is very impressive. And I'm very impressed that you all took the time to do that. And as Jess said, we we do want to make this interactive as much as we can. It's hard. We have a lot of information we do want to give you. Some of it's going to be, in some respects, repetitive because a lot of you have been doing tower work for a lot of years. Some of you have not. And one of the reasons why the, the staff at the FCC, especially in the Wireless Bureau, thought we should do this is that we're seeing unevennesses in, in some of the, the material that's submitted to the State Historic Preservation Offices, those SHPOs, and material that's submitted to the tribes. So we're trying to, to, to even all that out so that everybody who has a, a part of the review process. And, and we like to think of the, of the SHPOs and the, the, the tribes, the stakeholders, um, as our partners in the review of towers because everybody has input, some, some guidance direction they want to give. And when everybody has that kind of an input, when things get integrated in a good fashion, the projects tend to turn out to be better. Um, and we also recognize that it's real important to have um, broadband and cell coverage. So we're trying to do this as an efficient and effective way as possible. Um, our NPA works real well, uh, and we, we have a lot of other agencies that, that wish they had our NPA that they could use. And one of the reasons why we have the program comment from the Advisory Council, which we'll talk about in a little while, to for the tower projects that are funded by FEMA, for, by NTI and RUS, is that we have such a good system that works very well and hopefully it doesn't cause people too much pain. Um, I need to set my PowerPoint presentation up. I've been told that a lot of you already have, uh, if you have Blackberries and so forth, have received the links for the handouts. Okay. And this is a day talking about environmental compliance and uh, primarily Section 106 in NEPA, National, National uh, Storm Preservation Act and the uh, National Environmental Policy Act. 
There are other environmental regulations as well, but this is where, where we want to start. And a couple of things that we wanted to, to, to sort of reconvey to everybody as, um, as reminders for what it is that we do at the FCC. Um, <coughs> as a federal agency, environmental compliance obligations rest on the FCC as a federal agency. Ultimately, we're responsible as an agency for making sure that all of the projects that our licensees build or, for, or people who build for our licensees um, properly complete the process. And um, if something goes awry, it, it's, it's this agency that gets yelled at by the advisory council, gets yelled at by governors, and gets yelled at by SHPOs. And we, we try to avoid that kind of pain. Um, it's not a lot of fun. So that's one of the reasons why we're here. Um, our rules also impo impose enforceable duties on licensees and, and our applicants. And a lot of the work for towers, and, and it's fine that it's done this way, is done by consultants, engineering firms, and cultural resource firms, and, and whomever to, to do different pieces of this stuff. But at the end of the day, when there is a problem with a tower project, the people we, re we really need to talk to is, as an agency are the licensee, it's the tower proponent. Um, it's useful to have a conversation with the, the archeologist or the historian or the engineer, but we really need to talk to the licensee. And if there's a real serious problem, we try to avoid those that requires enforcement action. Our enforcement's against our licensee and not, um, not the archeologist. And for those of you with a legal turn of mind, we do have a fair number of attorneys if, if you need a reminder about our, our CFR part, there it is. Um, and for us, the project is, is not just the tower, it's also the fence, the equipment sheds, the access roads, power and fiber connections, and other related aspects of, of, of the project. And one of the things that Jeff talked about, tips and things to share, one of the things that's real important for you to take back to your own entities, whether you're, you work for a licensee, you work for a tower company, you're a consultant, is that when the person on the ground is setting up the lease arrangements with the property owner, please remind them that even if they own a, a, a backhoe and a bulldozer and like to play with it on Saturday afternoon, to stay away from the lease area and don't go trying to be a nice guy and go grade the land for, the, for your new tenant. Um, you have no idea what kind of a complication that arises. So um, I know that's not in any of our regulations and guidance anywhere, um, but I think Don and I were trying to fuss out a case last week where somebody, I don't really remember what state it was, um, somebody had a, a backhoe and they wanted to play with it on a Saturday afternoon. And they, they caused their, their landlord and the shippo and the tribes all sorts of grief. We worked through it, but nonetheless, we try to avoid that kind of stuff. Um, this is a real important one. The height of the design of the tower is not relevant in determining that a proposed tower is subject to NEPA in Section 106. That can be a cell tower or shorter. Uh, that we, we will, we're getting involved more and more in DAS systems and how to regulate those. We'll talk about those a little bit later, but we're still trying to figure out how DAS fits in in terms of the MPA and our rules because that's evolving technology. And we always are gonna have that issue, um, but we're, we're, we're working on it. So one of the things that would be real helpful for you to take away from this session, let me scoot around this way so I'm, you don't have your back, is that if you're gonna be working on a DAS system, you might wanna come and talk to us first unless you've got some experience with DAS. And if, uh, and if the SHPO that you're gonna be working with or the local community that you're working with doesn't have a lot of experience with DAS, is nervous about a DAS system, come and talk to us first and we can try to help sort through some of those um, compliance issues. The grant of a license is not permission to construct. You all complete a variety, variety of licenses and one of the things you need to recognize is that if you have a geographic license or a site license because you're a public safety entity or a broadcaster or whatever, the fact that you have that license is not permission to construct a tower. You need to go and complete our environmental compliance process, <coughs> do a little paperwork before you can start construction. So don't start constructing just because you say, well, I've got my license. And we find that that's confusing for a lot of folks, especially those people that 
build a tower a lifetime. So the public safety entities get very confused with that. They think because they've got their SEC license, they can go put a tower up. And that's, that's not how it works. And so we need to work with them. And it's one of the, the valuable services that our Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau provides is that kind of guidance to say you need to, to go through our environmental compliance process through wireless to, to get the compliance process completed. The Media Bureau does the same thing because those people don't build towers the way um, the commercial projects build. And people are building a lot of towers. Last year, just through our TCNS system, which a lot of you are familiar with, we had 12,000 entities registered through TCNS. So a lot of towers, a thousand towers a month. And I suspect this year is going to be even more. And, you know, it's the form six of one. If you say no, that doesn't mean that that really is no. Um, environmental compliance at FCC, section 106, NEPA, we also have endangered species, migratory birds, wetlands, floodplains. We're not really going to talk about those much today. Uh, we really want to concentrate on, on the NHPA. Uh, the National Star Preservation Act, for those of you who are sort of new to this uh, or, or don't, I've been doing historic preserva preservation work for better than 30 years. So um, this is all second nature to me, but I know for a lot of the folks that are engineers and some of the attorneys that are here, this is new information. So while it's basic, we wanted to, to get that um, out there. Um, the National Star Preservation Act created the National Register of Historic Places, created the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Um, by way of, of creating the historic preservation program in every agency and an, F, and an FBO. Um, I have my job because of the National Historic Preservation Act. Actually, I've had several jobs because of that. Um, just by way of background, before I came to the FCC, I was on the staff of the Advisory Council. Before I went to the Advisory Council, I was actually a private contractor doing work for clients, just like a lot of people here do. Um, and before that, I worked for State Historic Preservation Office for about 12 years. So I've, I've done a lot of this kind of stuff. And so um, I know how the process works. And also, I've never worked for a tribe. I've never worked with tribes. Um, tribal Historic Preservation Offices, and they're relatively new. Um, Section 106 requires federal agencies to, and this is an important thing to, to remember, Section 106 does not dictate a result dictates a process. Section 106 is a process. When you complete the process, you've, you've done what you need to do. And one of the things that you'll recognize if you've done a lot of FCC tower work is that tower projects can have adverse effects, but that doesn't mean the tower can't go up. We'll look at mitigation measures and other things that need to do to, to reduce those uh, adverse effects. And that's something that Don Johnson, my colleague in, in the Wireless Bureau, is going to talk about later this morning or this afternoon. Um, the NHP defines an undertaking as requiring a federal permit, license, or approval, um, and, and that's what the FCC considers the tower construction is an undertaking under the NHP dues relationships, licensing, and tenant structure registrations. So that's our hook. There is a, a delegation letter from the Advisory Council which permits our licensees and their consultants to work directly with the tribes, work directly with the state historic preservation offices, consulting parties, to, um, to during the review process. And um, in some respects, you need to consider that delegation letter makes you, to be real direct about it, my representative. And so I encourage you all to be good stewards of that delegation letter um, because it we just need to do a good job. Um, and we have two program agreements, co location agreement, okay, delegation agreement. Um, it's important to remember that with the tribes, the tribes are not obligated to talk to our licensees or our consultants. We have the tower construction notification system, which we'll talk about um, later today, but that provides notice to the tribes. It's not considered consultation with the federally recognized Indian tribes. And the tribes are under no obligation to respond to TCNS notices. And if, and if you've been doing this work for a while, you recognize that if tribes aren't responding to TCNS, you need to move a project forward. Um, 
you're going to spend a lot of time talking to Anne-Marie Jabieski in our Gettysburg office, who is here today, and she'll be up front um, today a couple times. And this I can't emphasize enough. If you're having a problem, if a SHPO is, is pushing back on something, if a tribe is causing, asking some questions, if consulting parties are asking questions, don't wait till the last minute. Don't wait until your client pulls up with a, a tractor trailer full of steel. Um, call us the first thing. Um, my business cards are back there. You all know our numbers. And we'll post that um, a little bit later. In, in fact, my phone number, if you want to write it down, is 202-418-1986. And just call. Um, don't wait until the last minute. It's a lot easier to deal with simple questions and, and some issues without waiting to the end where we've got to extract a whole lot of difficult feelings. Um, the co-location agreement does some very good things. Um, nationwide programmatic agreement, the MPA, uh, has additional exclusions. It, I've highlighted some of these things in, in, in red, or passes for red in PowerPoint presentations. Um, while the MPA doesn't require our licensees to do additional survey work for tower siting, we establish an APE where you're required to go and work with the State Historic Preservation Offices to see what's in their files to, um, to identify historic properties. Those things that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places or eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places, you are not required to do additional survey work. I know some of you do because you, you feel that's the appropriate thing for your, your business plan to do, which is fine. But you need to remember that one of the reasons why we ask you and require you to notify the tribes about your projects is that the tribes oftentimes are not on their ancestral lands, and they may have um, lands and, and sites in areas where they were removed from that need to be identified and worked with. And so we do require you to work with the tribes, to engage the tribes in identifying traditional cultural properties, religious tribal and cultural sites. Towers and federal lands and reservations. This is, this gets to be an interesting process. Um, our MPA does not apply on federal land. So if you're putting a tower up on BLM land, on Forest Service land, on Park Service land, um, whatever, you use that agency's, the landing on agencies, Section 106 environmental compliance process, and not the SECs. And we don't really need to be involved in it unless you need us to be involved in it for some reason. Um, now, a lot of projects, especially in the West, can be on a mix of lands. The tower may be on private land but you need to cross the BLM uh, right away for your fiber, or you need to use that for access to the private property. Um, that makes them very much a hybrid, and we have no control over what the BLM, Forest Service, Park Service, whomever, is going to require you to do to, for that piece of this project that goes across their land. I, mean, I can't call BLM up in Wyoming and say, with towers on our land, so, or our private land, it's our, they're our licensee, so we'll do the 106 session this way. They, that doesn't work that way. And I'm sure you also recognize that, and I use Wyoming for a very specific reason, because Wyoming has 10 different regional offices in the BLM, and there are 10 slightly different ways of doing Section 106, and that's, that's totally out of our control. Um, the NPA also does not apply on tribal land, on reservations, the BIA often takes the lead for those. It depends on the BIA's relationship with that particular tribal entity as to how the Section 106 process is going to be done on that, that project. But one of the things that, that we will remind you is that when your tower projects are on a reservation, even if they're on private land within a reservation, you need to, to um, let us know early in the planning process that that's occurring, and don't rely on TCNS as your notice to the tribe on whose land you're building, even if it's on private land within the reservation. Um, they 
don't always appreciate uh, the lack of comment, the lack of response. So you need to go and, and literally knock on their door and say, we're building on, on somebody's private land within the reservation. Here's what we're planning on doing. Here's the access roads. How can we um, partner with you to move this process forward? And um, it's real, so it's real important that you do that. Um, on tribal religious and cultural sites, I don't need to know, and nor do our licensees need to know, why a site has tribal religious and cultural significance. It's simply sufficient that a, tri a recognized tribal elder, it's not just anybody can say, people can tell the tribe that this is some place where I go to pray or I collect plants, but I need the tribe in the Section 106 context to, to verify that. So if the tribe says to me, this is, a, this is a traditional cultural property, this is a place where we go to do things that are important to us from a cultural or religious standpoint, I don't need to know what that is. What I do need to know and what the tribe, well, I, and I, I will ask the tribe if, if you need me to, they need to tell me what the boundary is of that <coughs> religious or cultural site so that we can avoid that site and uh, sometimes that's subject to negotiation and that's a service that we provide. We will help you negotiate with, with the tribes or the, the SHPOs and, and anybody else. Um, do the best we can. Um, you also need to recognize that tribes and SHPOs can request an expanded APE. The APEs that are in our NPA are minimums. <coughs> They're recommendations. If, if for some reason a site particular project requires a, a, a larger site, a larger AP, they can request that. And again, we have oversight over that. Yeah. Um, for owners and carriers, the entity constructing the facility, towers or antennas must comply with FCC environmental regulations. Co-locations may be excluded. You need to read the co-location agreement. Um, and one of the things that we're going to try to encourage you to do today and, and going forward is uh, while we, we expect you to understand our, our rules and regulations, if, there, if you're unclear about how our rules and regulations apply to a particular project, give us a call. Call me, call Don Johnson, um, and we'll interpret our rules for you. Because remember, there are rules. Um, so, um, it depends on the situation, uh, because one of the things that I learned, the, the question, question was what form do our answers take? And one of the things that I, as a federal employee, try not to do is to give real general advice, because I don't know where that general advice is going to go. So I'd rather deal with a specific project and give you an answer to a specific project. And it, sometimes it'll be responses on a, on a phone call, sometimes it'll be an email, it just really depends. And some of it depends on how busy basically Don and I are. You know, if you catch us in a really busy week when everybody's asking us the same kinds of questions, um, you'll get a shorter response. And if, if there's, there's, a, there's a rare occasion, what, once a month, Don, I guess, when we have an hour or two where we're not really horribly busy. Um, you get a, you get a different response, but we we'll, we'll try to, to give everybody a fair opportunity. Uh, as a reminder, Diane Dupert's going to talk about TCNS. It's a voluntary system, and we consider the information in TCNS to be proprietary information because the tribe set their um, geographic areas of interest. Um, and, but remember that. TCNS does not substitute for the sexual, for government to government consultation. And if a tribe asks for government consultation, um, which is their right, then you need to contact the FCC and, and we'll, we'll um, become deeply involved in that process. We're very proud of our E106 system. Diane, who helped design the system, will talk about that in a little while. Um, it's the only one of its kind in existence in the federal system, as is TCNS. Um, and you know we'll, we'll just sort of leave it at that. Um, 
one of the, one of the reasons why we had the program comment with with um, NTIA and RUS and FEMA is they like our E106 system and TCNS. Remember that we're ultimately responsible for compliance. Uh, we establish and enforce our rules that are binding on our licensees. We negotiate policies and processes with the advisory council, ship hosts, and tribes. That's, that's our responsibility. And we also resolve adverse effects in disputed cases. If there's a problem, we are absolutely involved till, till the very end. And the SEC staff includes communications attorneys. Don's an attorney. We have engineers. Um, none of them are here with us this morning. Um, and then I'm the Federal Preservation Officer. My background, I'm an historian, uh, although I started out as an archaeologist. Um, but I consider myself to be an historian. Um, and one of the reasons why I mentioned that we have engineers is that frequently we're asked by SHPOs and by communities f to um, review the engineering documentation that, that a tower company or licensees are submitting f as part of their application process. And we have the trained staff here that can interpret those RF maps. And um, that can be very helpful for the process. And other regulations, and in the interest of time, we'll just go through them because you should all be aware of those. Uh, when an adverse effect is recommended, it's almost done. The SHPO and the, and the TIPO concurs, the applicant must notify the SEC and the Advisory Council. If there's an adverse effect, the, the consultant, the licensee, is responsible for making sure that we have complete documentation, as does the Advisory Council. And I like things in electronic format. If you try to mail things to the SEC, I should have brought one down. Every once in a while, somebody mails this to me, this giant package that includes all sorts of color maps and color photographs. And all of our mail is irradiated here, so I don't see it for a couple weeks to begin with. But the irradiation process fuses all that stuff together. And so I have really nice doorstops that serve no purpose whatsoever. So use the E106 system or send me an email, send Don an email, um, and it just works a whole lot better. Um, so we encourage you to do that. Uh, adverse effects do not stop a project. And to go forward, if there's an adverse effect, the applicant must submit an alternative analysis. What other sites should you look at? And a mitigation plan. We do conditional no adverse effects. They're permitted under our rules. Commits the, the SHPO to condition the recommendation for no adverse effect by requesting certain sets reduce the tower, paint the tower, um, whatever the conditions are. Um, use of this option, which is why it can be popular sometimes, is it does not require an MOA or an EA. If there is an adverse effect that's not a conditional no adverse effect, this is an adverse effect, um, you're required to, to do an MOA to resolve that adverse effect and also file an EA here at the SEC. And some useful websites. Which basically are, are FCC websites. And these URLs are for the old FCC website, not the new FCC website. And both of them are, are live at the moment. Okay. Are there any questions? Yes? Um, one of the things that we're going to try not to do today is talk about migratory birds and endangered species. One, <laughs> <laughs> and you probably all recognize why, but one of the nice things about being the Federal Preservation Officer is that um, those are not areas of my responsibility, so I can't answer any <laughs> questions about endangered species, migratory birds, and I don't know, Jeff, whether you want to say something, just, just sort of to get the that that subject out of the way
Just sort of very quickly, um, first of all, on endangered species, you know, endangered species are one of the things that are a required um, you know, thing to look at under our rules right now. And, um, and so it is important to, to go through that process to either um, you know, confirm that there are no endangered species present in the area, or if there may be endangered species in the, in the general area, either to, to get a sign off from Fish and Wildlife Service or to have your own qualified biologist um, go out there and, and confirm that they're, they're not on the site. Um, and if they are on the site, then there's a process that needs to be done with Fish and Wildlife. So that, so that I think is pretty well established. Um, you know, if you need help with the details of it, we have members of the staff who know it in more detail than I do, um, Don among them. Um, um, as far as migratory birds, we are in the process of conducting a programmatic environmental assessment that will focus, um, it, while it's, um, it's, it takes a step back and looks at the entire environmental process, the main, the main focus of it is going to be on migratory birds um, in light of the, the court remand that we had on that subject, um, you know, evaluating whether um, whether um, antenna structure registrations as a whole have a significant environmental effect in the, in the area of, of migratory birds. And based on that would be considering um, you know, whether changes to our rules are appropriate. Um, in, in the interim, if, you know, if Fish and Wildlife Service is raising issues about migratory birds, um, you know, you can come to us for, um, you know, for assistance on a, on a particular tower. Um, you know, if we do have the, the catch-all provision in the rules that, um, you know, that, that issues can be raised if, you know, even if something isn't within one of the eight categories in our rules, um, that, um, you know, that an environmental assessment may be required. I, I think if you've received something from Fish and Wildlife on a particular tower, um, that, that may cause some concern, certainly come and talk to us about it, but, but we are not requiring any um, you know, general review for effects on migratory birds at this time. Thank you for that, Jeff. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Pardon me? Right, right. The, the collocation provisions in the NPA National Union Collocation Period are, are very specific and de depending on what it is that you're doing in terms of a project, we could talk about them. So I think that's probably a project specific kind of question. Um, but I'd be happy to talk to you during our breaks or whatever about something you're doing in particular. Um, for one of the things that's going to help facilitate what we're going to do today is trying to stay away from, from specific project specific questions. Uh, we can answer those during the breaks and the next will be around. I'll be here all day. Um, but um, you know but I think we'll just need to look at some general questions that will work the best. Yes sir. From the overview perspective, you mentioned that twelve thousand uh, birds were taken from the Pro went through last year and I think before the shot clock process got started there was something like thirty The, okay, I guess the which shot clock are you talking about? Well, the FCC shot clock for for municipal governments for, so lo for local siting. Yeah, but that, of course that applies to the to the tribes as well. But I think to the point when the Obama administration took over, right. I think there was about thirty two hundred or thirty three that were either in local zoning or with NPA and NEPA issues. Mm -hmm. We, we are working actively to clear those back. We, we always are working actively to clear old cases. There's a few that are stuck in the process simply because the issues are so hard and the parties involved aren't willing to, to negotiate or compromise. So that they're always going to be around. But, but we've been working very hard within our bureau to reduce that number. At the, at the moment, I, I'm not sure what it is. I certainly don't know what the numbers are. Yeah. But you know, we we spend a lot of our day going, we're trying to resolve all cases. Any other questions? Yes.
Okay. The the question was on the the old form 620 and form 621, and those old forms are no longer valid. You need to use the new forms, uh, which were. There's not a great deal of difference between the new forms and the old forms. But the new forms obviously were designed to, to comply with the way our E106 system works. But you can fill them out on, on the E106 form print system, print them out, and you can mail them to the SHPOs if they don't participate. But you'll find that once you get used to, if you get used to anything, it, um, it's a whole lot easier to be able to use it, do it electronically, rather than try to use a typewriter or some other. I know some of you have designed your own forms, uh, but we, you, you need to be using the current SSC forms. Yes, sir. Right. The, the question was on the E106 system. I have 20 SHPOs that, that use the system. One of the things that's been slowing the process down is a lot of states have their own regulations for archiving um, their uh, Section 106 compliance uh, documentation. And so one of the things that we have on our website is instruction for you to call each of the individual SHPOs. Virginia and New Jersey only accept electronic submissions because that's how they're set up. Other states want both electronic because it makes the reviews faster, but they need the hard copies to comply with local uh, regulations. Some of the states have uh, one in particular, uh, which is one of the larger states, has a cumbersome internal process they're trying to resolve. So I would suspect that over the next year, more of the states are going to sign up because they want to. It's, it's not a question of them not wanting to. It's a matter of having to deal with with internal systems. And remember that um, archaeologists and historians aren't always necessarily tech savvy. So we're getting there. Okay. Yes, one last question. Right. There are things that work in specific locations, and everybody acknowledges that it's it's okay, and it results in a section 106 process being completed, and nobody being unhappy about properties that are being missed or being adversely affected. Then it's sort of okay, but I would be more comfortable if you use the minimums in the APE. I understand why it happens, especially in urban areas, and and. And maybe there's some things you shouldn't tell us. Okay. Um, I do want to keep us on track and um, as best I can. So we're running a little bit late. Um, I'm going to we'll do a presentation with Diane Dupert on our electronic systems. And while she's doing that, um, after she's done, we'll take a short break. One of the things I'm going to ask our security. I know you all had to turn your laptops and Blackberries on and so forth to go through security. Well, when you go to lunch, the guards are going to ask you the same thing when you go to the cafe. I'm going to see if we can somehow get that done a little smoother. Um, so, Diane? Diane Dupert is, is, um, works in our Gettysburg field office. So she, she got up real early this morning um, to come down here. And she helped design the TCNS and E106 systems, and um, ruin. Yeah, they do. Yes. So, give us a second while we get ourselves situated here. Yes. And then I'll let you pick out which one you want. To start with.
Good morning. I'm Diane Dubert. I'm a program analyst with the uh, Technologies, uh, Systems, and Innovations Division with the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. And I'm the system analyst for the uh, Tower Construction Notification System, the E106 System, and the Antenna Structure Registration System. So I'm very tower system oriented. <laughs> um, TCNS. Uh, is the acronym we use, and everybody uses it to use it to describe the tower construction notification system. And it was deployed in 2002 and enhanced in 2005 um, to accommodate the referral process. That's part of the. Um, okay. uh, TCNS is an online system that facilitates. Um, the compliance with Section 106 in re in regards to tribal consultation, and um, overall the system is running very smoothly. So uh, I know Steve asked me to just kind of walk through the, the the PowerPoint presentation that we use to kind of train people how to use the system, what it's and how it works. Um, uh, TCNS it's an online password protected system that notifies federally recognized Indian tribes and Alaska, Alaska Native villages um, in regards to proposed tower construction um, in areas in which they have specified specific interests. Tribes have um, signed on to TCNS and they have specified their areas of interest um, at either a statewide level or down to a granular countywide level. So they can come in, they have their own logins and passwords into the system and have their own views of the notification data submitted, your attachments that are uploaded. They have online access to view all of that information online and then respond via the system, which the system generates an email back to the consultants um, with their comments, requests for in further information, et cetera. Um, in order to use the FCC's online systems, uh, you need your FCC registration number, which is a, an acronym FRN. Um, if you currently hold an FCC, if your applicants hold an FCC license, you can use their FRN and password to register um, to use the E106 or the TCNS systems. If uh, you as a consultant want to establish your own uh, login and password, um, you can use um, you can obtain that FRN using the Commission's registration system, which is CORS. Um, there's the website um, on the screen, and it'll be in your presentation as well. Um, then once you obtain that FRN, you actually have to call our customer support to actually register that FRN as a specific entity type um, to get access to the system. A SHPO and, uh, or tribe or you as a consultant has specific screens and permissions within the system. And we use that FRN to give you those specific permissions. From the wireless telecommunications uh, homepage um, to access uh, TCNS, the link takes you, oh, this is the CORS, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the CORS process to register for an information. Then from there, we go to TCNS. The login where you enter your FRN and password. Should you have problems accessing the system or have problems with while you're submitting or completing the online forms, you can always submit an online help request via this link. Someone will call you back, email you uh, in regards to getting you an answer to any question you have. The home page that you as a consultant will see gives you several options to submit a new notification, update the status, um, refer a specific notification where uh, there have been unresponsive tribes, and you can also do a referral of a, of a notification where you have not used TCNS to make that initial contact to the tribe. The first screen in, in the data entry is the structure owner and contact information. Uh, the email address that you enter on the screen are, is the email address where all the system notifications are sent to. The second screen is where you enter your structure and location information. And the third screen is the summary screen <coughs> that lets you verify the data you've submitted. The system will automatically determine the county of the site based on the coordinates that you submitted. 
and uh, this is important based on the fact that the tribes has specifically designated counties and states um, for their areas of interest. The summer screen allows you to cancel out if you decide that this isn't what you want to submit. You can edit, um, and this is also where you would add um, documents uh, to the notification that can be reviewed by the tribes. And a lot of the a lot of the documentation that tribes request are maps um, and other project details, surveys, and this is the attachment utility. Um, the attachment size is 10 megabytes or less. So if you have a file size that is larger than that, you have to split it up and, and attach it in, in multiple uh, attachments. After verifying everything, you hit the submit button and you get this online confirmation. At the same time the online confirmation is sent to you, you get an email as well um, regarding the successful submission. The TCNS um, is a process as all the notifications received within the last seven days. So we have a one time a week process um, that goes out uh, where it comp compiles all of the notifications received and creates an email specifically for each tribe who, th where, that will list all the um, projects that, are, that fall within their geographic areas of interest. Some tribes designate their um, re their way their the way they get the information is by email or letters, and uh, so we we process emails and letters out to the tribes, and then at, on Fridays uh, each Friday, um, then the system will process an email um, back to you as a consultant that will list all of the tribes and any other additional information uh, regarding their preferences or their review process back to you for each notification that you submit. In 2005, the FCC in, um, released a declaratory ruling in regards to um, tribal consultation and in regards to referral of tribes who have not responded within the first 30 days of the initial no uh, notification to the tribe. And that online referral process is now accommodated, has been accommodated in TCNS and if after the, third, the first initial contact is via the system, the second contact to the tribe is outside the system, then the referral of the tribe on the, is allowed, permitted o online on the 41st day after the tribe's first contact within the system. TCNS has a specific link refer this notification and the system has a timetable that tracks when you can sum, uh, submit the tribe for uh, referral. Each referral will list all of the tribes notified and will um, provide, indicate those that have um, the no, no response equals no interest. Um, it will also have a link to those that replies from tribes who have responded um, via the system. You can select the tribes that you need to refer. Add, you will add the date of your second contact outside the system and continue to the referral summary and again submit that. Once that comes in you'll get an online confirmation as well that has been uh, submitted for referral processing and again once a week the system will take all of those referrals and send a specific 20-day letter um, advising the um, tribes that uh, they're that we're requesting a final request submitting telling uh, asking them for a final uh, determination on a site you also get a um, an email um, in regards to um, the successful processing of that 20-day letter and when that 20 day starts information in regards to that 20-day process. Um, I have some uh, technical support and phone numbers, um, the e-support line. Um, a lot of you, I, I recognize a lot of names on, <laughs> on the sign-in list, so um, I know a lot of you email per me personally regarding questions. If you 
if you can't get me you you please do call our helpline and they will you know get someone else who you can help you as well um, recently I know we've been handling a number of requests um, to correct TCNS information that was originally submitted and um, Unfortunately, right now, uh, TCNS doesn't have an amendment, an online amendment process. Um, so uh, we have, the consultants are emailing me or uh, submitting uh, any support requests or calling our, our uh, customer support requesting this data be updated. And, and we will do that um, in the interim until we've, uh, you know, get the system uh, updated. And um, but we just want to remind you that you do have uh, an obligation to let the tribes know of the changes that you make. Um, As Steve in, uh, indicated, the E106 system, uh, we have um, is it we have 20 online shippers, right, participating. Um, uh, this this system is uh, will facilitate your completion of the 620 and 621 forms online. Um, it gives you the ability to complete them, at, upload your attachments, print them out, you know, mail them to the shippers. Um, as when the SHPO is participating online, all communication is electronic, and it's done via you know email notifications back and forth, um, and uh, it seems to be working real well. We have we have a couple of, of things that you know we need to iron out as far as processes on um, when when filings get put get into a negotiated or disputed status. And uh, you know we've been working on a case-by-case -case basis in regards to moving them out of those statuses into completed and getting them you know closed. Again, uh, these screens will walk you through um, getting an FRN as well. Um, the, the same FRN that you use for TCNS, you can use for E106. And uh, the FRN registration process through cores. The TCNS homepage, um, the login um, button takes you to the screen and, and you select the, the same login as used for either system. Submitting a new filing, um, you, can, you then choose which form, the 620 for new construction, 621 for co-locations. An FRN registered in the E106 system as an applicant will pre-fill on the screen, and we have the copy application applicant information uh, hyperlink that allows you to complete easily the same screen for multiple filings for the same applicant. And we have that same feature for the consultant as well. Your FRN will pre-fill. You can click this button and you know pre-fill this screen with all of your contact information. <coughs> A separate screen is used to um, input your additional staff used for each each project. The site information allows you to copy the site information from a, TCN, a prior TCNS filing. And then there's a, just a few um, other data elements that you need to complete um, on this screen in to, to go through to the next. Um, the one issue I know we do have is uh, the edit with the zip code and the coordinate. Um, there's an edit check with zip codes to verify that they are, the coordinates are within where they're supposed to be. And um, I know sometimes our GIS uh, that we use to, ver to do that verification isn't quite up to date sometimes with, with, with what you guys use. Again, email me, you call our, um, our help desk and email our tech support and we'll get that fixed for you or determine what exactly zip code the system is looking for. 
you'll see several informational icons throughout the um, online application. If you use your mouse and roll over those, it will display detailed information regarding particular questions. Uh, the project status screen it allows you to indicate the current status of your project. The determination of effects, you indicate the direct and visual effects of the project and whatnot, the local historic properties, if any. The tribal uh, involvement page, um, answering the question um, whether other whether tribes have been notified, um, what the system will do whenever you copy from TCNS, it also copies all the tribes notified, um, their responses, their indications of interest, which is all part of the, of the 620 uh, package that goes to the SHPO, and then you have a link to actually view that information. Uh, at any time after a filing is submitted, you can update it um, with any new TCNS tribal information you may receive, and you would come back in and update your uh, 620 filing or 621, and come to the screen, click this update from TCNS, and it will update all of the TCNS tribal information and replies. And then when you submit that update, it also notifies the SHPO as well. Um, there's also a, a feature to add tr uh, tribal contacts made that are not federally recognized tribes. There are certain areas that re require um, local or state recognized tribes, and this is where you would add those um, uh, contacts. Um, listing an FRN for a tribe, a, a um, uh, local government or other consulting party is optional. However, if they provide you with an FRN, that will then allow them online access to the filing and then just to the filing on which their FRN resides. It doesn't allow them access to any other filings. The historic properties page, um, there are several questions in regards to um, what type of uh, properties are, were identified and then a link to add this list each historic property. Um, any any uh, listing of 10 or more historic properties can be uploaded as an attachment. And then there are several pieces of information regarding that historic property that are required here. The local government agency. Um, applicants are required to consult with uh, a local government um, that has jurisdiction over the area where the proposed new structure um, is going to be located and um, this link allows you to provide us the contact information in regarding that agency or agencies. The other consulting parties contacted, applicants can designate any other person, agency, or organization that, are, that is interested in the, a proposed structure. Um, information about the filing, um, again, if uh, that consulting party provides you an FRN, you can upload that and uh, give them online access. Designating the SHPO is um, a drop-down box, and we usually pre-fill it based on the state in which the, um, the site is going to be located. You can also designate other um, deputy SHPOs or other state SHPOs as well access to that filing. Um, before, certifies, before certifying, um, you any filing attachment requirements um, are determined on uh, certain questions answered throughout the filing process, online filing process, those attachments must be uploaded before you can actually sign and submit. And again, you use the same attachment utility. Um, it, it is pre-filled with the different types of attachment requirements. Once you've add, had the, have add, added all of the required attachments, can continue to the certify. Um, if an error is found throughout the filing, you can 
you will get an error message here and the actual site, uh, the actual page on which that information is found uh, where the error is um, will be highlighted and you'll be able to actually jump back to that screen, make the correction and uh, save that correction and then jump back over to the certify. The online signature and certification and submit um, will then give you this confirmation, this online confirmation, and includes the, your file number, the lead SHPO information, the information about contacting the SHPO in regards to whether an a actual paper copy needs to be sent to their office. And then at the same time you receive the online confirmation, um, the system will generate an email notification um, to, the, to the SHPO, um, to you, the applicant, and any other email addresses that were included in the filing. And those consulting parties who don't have an FRN, or don't have an email address, I'm sorry, do not have an email address, we will generate a letter letting them know that this particular filing um, in which they are listed as a consulting party was submitted. And if they want further information, they, they contact us. We have a hyperlink to, uh, that allows you to view and print the actual FCC form 620 or 621. It also, the last page of that form will list all the attachments and <clears throat> each attachment description is a hyperlink to the attachment. So you can actually click that link and print each attachment as necessary from this page. Okay, this returns you back to um, the My Filings page. And this page also gives you access to all of your filings in all their, the various statuses with, throughout the E106 process. Incomplete filings will be displayed on your draft tab and any, any filing that is not completed and submitted after a 30 day time frame will be automatically deleted by the system. The submitted tab um, will, sh will show you all of the filings that have been submitted and are still within that 30 day review period by the SHPO. The applicant name is a hyperlink to actually access the filing information. These are your actual uh, filing uh, detail pages. The overview tab provides high level filing details like your applicant name, site information, um, the SHPO. It also gives you your clock, your 30 day review, your SHPO review period clock. Um, in a submitted status, it, it's that type of clock. Once it goes into negotiated, we have other types of clocks that will keep, keep you informed of the time frame in which the filing is still maybe in. Depending on the status of the filing and the type of the participant, the login, um, different various button permissions will be displayed. Um, Submitted status filings will, um, for an applicant, you are permitted to update, withdraw uh, the filing, and a SHPO, they will, when they log in, they will have buttons that will allow them to concur, concur with conditions, not concur, or request more information. Disputed status filing have uh, other permissions as far as the applicant being able to appeal to the FCC or they can choose to negotiate and taking those different actions will put that filing in the other various statuses throughout the, the process. You also have access on this page to view the submitted recommendations to de of the determination of effects by other consulting parties um, who, are, who can log in online. Um, you can also record determinations sent to you. If someone, a consulting party who doesn't have online so access, sends you a recommendation, you can log into your own filing and record that for them so that you have a one-stop shop for everything that's going on with your filing. These two links allow you to view a PDF of the completed SEC Form 620 or 621, and it also allows you to view all of the attachments in a separate, a separate window. Uh, this section displays the determination of effects submitted on the filing by the consultant and then also the determination of the SHPO and or FCC if uh, the FCC gets involved. The transaction log tab displays all changes that are made in an update from one version to the next. And the system will retain a previous version of every filing each time it is updated. 
This section here uh, d displays the, ver the various versions uh, that a filing may go through, and uh, the hyperlinks allow you to access a view-only uh, version of that filing. For each update, the transaction log displays um, the description of the change, the original value, and the, and the new updated value. The comments tab will display all comments added by um, the online participants, and it will also allow you to add a comment. Each time a comment is added or a, an action is taken where a comment is also um, part of that action, all of those comments are in one place here on this comments tab. This is an example of a notification uh, from b based on a, someone adding a comment. The Documents tab displays all documents uploaded to the filing after it is submitted. Any online consulting party can upload a document. To view any of these documents, you click the PDF uh, icon. The link there is to upload a document. Again, documents the same as a, other online filing attachments are a limit of 10 megabytes. Again, when a document is added, an immediate email is sent to all parties with emails, uh, email addresses. The history tab displays a, uh, a listing of significant events that have occurred throughout the filing, and each, each event is identified by a date, the description, and the source of the event. You can, we also have a feature to email the, a PDF of the actual 620 and all of the links to all of the attachments to, to someone. Uh, as long as you have a, a valid email address, it'll allow you to do that, allow you to uh, also add an optional message. That's an email ex example. The system will identify those filings where a SHPO does not participate online with this icon identified there by the arrow. The system, it, it will allow you to record SHPO responses, add comments, add documents, and uh, of, of to, to any of these filings where the online filing, uh, online the shippers are not online participating. And this, again, allows you to maintain a complete record of uh, the E106 process in the system. Going into the details of a filing where a SHPO is not participating online will, again, give you different button permissions. And uh, one of the permissions is to record the response of a SHPO who doesn't participate online. Again, you indicate that SHPO concurrence, um, add any comments, and update it. With that update, the filing will then move to a different status, most likely completed, if the SHPO concurs. Um, and you may want to note that, um, that throughout the data entry and um, any online processes or actions you take, um, we do have common questions, and we have a help, a help text, help files. Um, we also have links to technical support and our FCC customer support uh, center numbers and the submit helpline, uh, help online help request. Again, um, I know uh, the, one of the most frequent um, uh, issues that, that um, come through are, is the zip code and the coordinate edit, um, and we do you know, work on a case-by-case -case basis with those. Um, I know there are, there are sometimes filings get held up in the negotiated or disputed status um, within the system, and it's based on uh, how the SHPO concurred or concurred with conditions um, uh, online. And uh, we and we will work with you. I we get Steve to you know review as long as we as long as the online filing um, documents the SHPO concurrence. You know we will assist you know manually moving that filing through to to closure um, I will have my business cards as well back on the table uh, later and so you can pick up so you have my email address and phone number um, again if you can't get me please you know contact our technical support our help support and you know if you have any questions the same but have any questions if I can't <laughs> answer them we'll Yeah, if there are any questions for Diane or Emery is also in the room. Why don't you go up here in case there are questions because Emery's your your TCNS buddy. <laughs> she's 
She's also for against the vote. They got up real early this morning. Yes, yeah, she's she's the legal buddy, and I'm your technical buddy. <laughs> and I just got back from Oklahoma. I was in Oklahoma all last week. I was there for nine days, meeting with about 200 tribal members and me, the Polish lady. So. Um, it was really good, and later on I'll tell you some hot topics in Indian country that came about. Anybody have TCNS questions? Yes? Okay. E106 question, it's not a TCNS. It's an E106 question, not a TCNS question. Thanks for picking that up. I'm sorry. The question was just a little more clarification about the use of the old 620 and 621 format and forms in the context of E106 as a voluntary system. How would I generate? Well, you can't use the old forms. That's, that's the bottom line. I that. that. You can't use that. So you need to use the new office management budget approved forms. The other ones don't work. You, you don't have to use the E106 system, but you'll find that generating the new form, the, the form that's current, not the new form, the form that's current, that if you do it online, it'll save it for you. I know a lot of companies that do this stuff all the time, use them as archives, and it makes it real easy to send me copies of the stuff because um, I can have instant access to it. So. So I would, we encourage you to use the E-106 system and those forms. So what's what's your question beyond that? It sound voluntary at that point. <laughs> well, it's voluntary. No, it's voluntary in that the SHPOs aren't required to accept them. The consulting parties aren't required to accept them. But you are you are required under SEC rules to generate a Form 620 or Form 621. That's not voluntary, never was voluntary. There's only one approved Form 620 and only one approved Form 621. The way to access those in the easiest fashion, I recommend you use the E106 system. If you want to go back to our website, the old website, and pick up the link to the form outside the E106 system, you're welcome to do that. Why you'd want to go through all that effort and not use the E106 system, which will save it for you, you can work on it as a draft for 30 days. Let it sit for 30 days, not touch it. As long as you touch it once within every 30 days, mm -hmm. it'll save it for you. Why Why not do it that way? I mean, if you want the extra work, that's fine. That's your volunteer effort. Yes. Um, how do we do a client for how Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can obtain an FRN on their behalf. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, he asked um, if you have clients that don't have an FRN, don't want to get an FRN on their own. If um, what, what do you do? And um, our recommendation is you can go to Cores and register um, for an FRN on their behalf. I was telling everybody how easy it was because everybody was telling me how easy it was. And so one day I just thought, I need an FRN. So I, I, I got one within minutes. It's very, very simple. It really is. Go ahead. Uh, in, in theory, you can. I discourage you from doing that because the, the SHPO needs to know the tribal response in order to give you a valid answer. So while our rules permit you to do the tribal notice and the SHPO review at the same time, that's not a good business because you may get a SHPO um, okay, but the tribe may have a serious objection about what you're doing and it's gonna want SHPO opinions and, and interaction. So, um, it's not not the most effective way to do business. Yes. Uh, 
Um, for, for all of our electronic systems, we would welcome your input. Um, TCNS especially, and I'm allowed to say this, Diane can't. It's a real old clunky system because it was designed, what? 2002. To, yeah, so it's nine years old in electronic terms. That's, that's ancient history. Um, so if you have thoughts and suggestions about what would make TCNS and U106 better, send them to Diane, send them to me or Amory, whomever. Send them to somebody at the FCC. Um, I have my own list of improvements. Um, <coughs> the trick is to find somebody that will pay for them here at the SEC. Um, so, you know, that's that's the issue. We know that they need improvements. I mean, I'd love a geographic information interface in TCNS and in E106. Um, and someday I'll get it. But it's just going to take some patience. Are there any questions from over here? Yes, ma'am. The, the question is, what happens when you contact a tribe through TCNS and then the tribe responds and says they have an interest and then um, you send what they need and then you never hear back? And, and that happens a lot. Um, that's really a bad situation. The best situation you can have is if the tribe doesn't respond at all because the tribe probably doesn't have interest and they're just going to let it time out. But you can't request a letter. Uh, we have what's called a 20-day letter where we contact the tribes and say um, it's down to the last 20 days please let us know and then it just times out if they don't let us know you're saying they've asked for something you've sent it and then you never hear back what you do in that case is you contact them here and there whenever you can and then contact us and then we try to get a hold of them for you and work it out um, but y you're right it it can take a very long time the biggest problem is a lot of these very traditional tribes have to talk to their tribal councils. And that's really great if the council meets every day, but usually it's once a month or once a quarter. So if, if they need to talk to their whole council about a project and the council just had a meeting last week and they're not gonna have another one for three months, your project really is on the back burner because um, they wouldn't hold you back if they thought the site was okay there must be some problem it might be too close to a burial mound it might be too close to a tcp a traditional cultural property and so they really want to work it out in those cases if they say to you it's going to be months i would start trying to open up a dialogue with them and send them exactly what they need so when they do have their meeting finally um, with their council they have everything they have photographs they have uh, the archaeological survey, everything that they might need is right in front of them. And maybe it might be, behoove you to also take them to the site so that when they're talking about the site to their council, they can say, you know, I was there. I'm the TIPO and I went there with our medicine man and when we were at the site, you know, you know it costs a lot of money to, to take people out to these places and all, uh, especially if they're in one state and the project's in another. But it might really speed up the process because they might say, you know what, we don't need to wait three months for the next meeting. We now see where it is and it's fine. Or you know what, I think if you just move it 10 feet, now that we're here, we know. That's the only thing I can suggest. Yes. Uh, through TCNS and E106, where some of the information provided either has changed such as the coordinates or it was initially not exactly accurate uh, in terms of what the final coordinates right. power you height whatever you can't do that on your be. own after the initial time and no no where we're, we've already received triple concurrence and received comments back from tribes oh, and that's okay. all gone okay e106 have you gotten comments from the shippos that's right i was i was organizing the rest of the day uh, what was your question again? 106 and yeah. you've gotten comments back from the SHPOs. Right. How do they do updates? Um, you, you go into the system. If you got, if you have SHPO comments you want to add to the system, just go in and upload them as a PDF. It should be fairly effective that way. Diane, do you have any thoughts? Or? No, no. 
Oh. Right. Oh, they they move. Answer the question. One of the things you need to go back and, and politely request of your clients, the people that are building the towers, is if, if they really could figure out what they wanted first, because we're getting, you have no idea how mad some of the shippos are, especially the bigger states with lots of uh, population centers or the tribes get. When they had, had to look at a single tower project four times, um, and you know, so they. You need to encourage clients to, to get it done once and not fuss with it that much, but then the technical part, you can answer. To technically, to, to actually do it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, TCNS, again, there's no amendment process, and um, you would have to uh, you know, let us know. Like, email me, contact our tec technical support, tell us what you need updated. We'll update that record. Um, we'll let you know it's done. Then to... Uh, update the E106, you would just go back in. It, it may be in a completed or closed status, and you can reactivate it. Then you can update it, okay? The shipper will be advised, will get the email notifications that that has been reactivated and updated. However, the shipper will not be able to like click a concur button. They will, they will, you'll have to let them know that you, re you know, I would, I would do a personal email or phone call saying, hey, we reactivated it, we updated it. Um, so they can go in and add a comment. Then you can, again, then come back to us and we'll close it out. As long, but right, we, this was not anticipated as, as many corrections as we're getting. We're, and, and it's been a lot, it's been pretty frequent here lately. And, um, and that's something that, you know, we need to take into consideration in regards to, you know, updating the systems to accommodate these new processes that we're coming, that you all are facing. Um, so, but right now that's kind of our workaround. Um, to to do it manually. No, they no. Uh, unfortunately, the contact. What is adequate contact to the tribes about the updates? Okay, if you made a very small change, like let's say your coordinates were off just five, ten feet. You contact Diane, Diane goes into the system and she changes it for you. Just a few feet, I don't think you need to contact the tribes. Uh, 20, 30 feet, if you, you already have the list, the quickest way to do it is just to call them back and say, you know, you've already approved this, but in abundance of caution, I wanna let you know that it is 30 feet away, especially if you are right on a county border because a tribe, tribes often just ask for a certain county, and if you've moved it over so close and they did not ask for the neighboring county, then that's a problem. Over 30 feet, you probably should resubmit it, and that sends you way back, you know. So if I were you, I would just try to get it right the first time <laughs> because it really, you don't want to start all over again. <laughs> we have time for, for one more question. Somebody. This man had his hand up very quickly. No. No. Actually, um, the question is basically. Can you go back and can you search TCNS and the same thing would go for E106 to see where other tower projects are? And you can't do that. Um, you probably could do that within E106, which is a newer system, if you were working for, let's say, Verizon and you were looking for Verizon towers because your FRNs will match up. But otherwise, you can't really do that. Then. Because remember, the TCNS contains proprietary information for the tribes. And E106 actually contains business information along with tribal information on, on site. So we're, we try to restrict who can have access to particular site information. Um, we're going to get ready to take a, a break for about 15 minutes. We're running about a half an hour behind. Uh, so don't go real far. The, the restrooms, if you need to use those, are out the doors. 
up the corridor, up the stairs, first corridor to right, they're down that way, men's and women's rooms. If you really need a coffee fix, um, go up to the elevator to um, courtyard level CW and go through the doors to security. Um, I discourage you from um, taking your Blackberries and laptops with you because I'm trying to get them not to make you check them when you go back through security again. But um, we'll see. We're in that process. The other thing that I want to let you know is that I made arrangements for IT department. You've all gotten the link, or some of you have gotten the link already for the handouts. IT has figured out a way for us to post the PowerPoint presentations on, on the same kinds of URLs. Um, what they're going to do is convert them from PowerPoint, because there's no way to lock a PowerPoint. So they're going to take the, the PowerPoint presentations, convert them to PDFs, so that you'll be able to look at them that way. And so um, you have no idea what kind of a triumph that is for Diana and I, because we've been dying to get the E106 and TCNS PowerPoint presentations out there, but they're too large to email. Um, so so I, I, that sort of makes my day. Uh, with that, it's quarter of 11 by the clock at the back of the room. Be back here by 11 o'clock, ready to go. Um, and thank you for all your questions. And when we, when we come back, we're going to have the three SHPOs um, with uh, their, their panel discussion. We're actually not doing too bad in, in terms of time. Um, I had a request because it's on the agenda, and we sort of touched that a little bit, were common mistakes by consultants. And that sort of is going to get us, lead us into a nice segue into the, the SHPO panel. Um, real quickly, and this is one of the reasons why we encourage you to use E106. Common mistakes are mapping errors. Um, I've, I've had to do site visits because towers were, were put on maps 75 miles away from the actually were constructed. Um, there's one company who will remain nameless to put a, a tower up because the surveyor screwed up in the town's right away. The town wanted to take the foundation out for a cell tower. Uh, they worked that out. Um, people are making mistakes by not including proper photographs. You need to use color photographs, color maps. Black and white doesn't cut it. Um, also, um, I love to drive the U.S. and I've grown cross country any number of times. My wife does all the driving and I, I sit and look out the windows, which means that more or less, I know when you stood in the, in the parking lot down in the hollow behind a tree to say that there's no cell tower visible from this historic site. Um, I had that happen with a with a national, an important national park out west, and I knew that the consultant, because I had been there the month before, had had ginned his photographs to make it look like you wouldn't see the tower. Not not a good thing to do. Um, I've been to every state except Hawaii, Alaska, and Nevada, and I'm still trying to figure out a way to get to Nevada. I'll get there eventually. Um, so, and because I've done consulting work and I've worked at a shipo, I understand how this stuff works. So. Um, also, you need to be real careful when you go to do the site, site files at, at the SHPO offices to make sure you've looked at everything. Some states have geographic information systems, so you can go online or look at a map. And what you need to recognize is the SHPOs, um, I'm actually surprised that the SHPOs that are here today actually got out of the office because they keep on losing staff. Uh, and they just disappear and they don't get replaced. And, and um, So not all the sites that are historic properties either because they're on the National Register or because they've been uh, determined eligible actually make it into the GIS system immediately. Sometimes In some states there's a year backlog. I don't know what it is in, in your particular states. Um, so you need to look in the paper files because they know the stuff's in the paper files and you have no idea how thankful I am that I have SHPOs to do all my work for me because of those 12,000 projects last year Don and I, who do most of the, of the environmental siting work, we probably look at 200 cases in a year's time. It's a small percentage. They're the ones that have adverse effects or there are problems with them. And then we, we spend a lot of time on the phone with a lot of the others. But the real hard reviews, they do most of the work. And you know, those are the things that they're telling me waste their time when they have to say, the photographs aren't right, the map's wrong, the, you don't have all these store properties. Um, and they're real nice 
the, at the SHPO offices, and this is the message for the archaeologists and historians who are doing that kind of work. And they'll tell the archaeologist, the historian, that you know you didn't do all this. The forms are incomplete. I'm not so nice, and I tell your clients because I think the clients need to know because they're ultimately responsible. So if I hear from a SHPO, especially on a consistent basis, that a particular firm is always turning in inc incomplete forms. I'll talk to the firm, but I also let the clients know because they have too much to do to, to be slowed down. It's the same thing with, with multiple changes to a single tower project. Um, other common mistakes are, are you know, tribes pretty much are, are done properly in terms of notice. Um, when a tribe requests information, and I've gotten this complaint from some of the tribes, especially um, the tribes that are resident in Oklahoma. If a tribe asks you for information, make sure you send them that information. It's not just the tribes of Oklahoma, we're all over the country. Because these guys travel like I do. And I have a number of tribes that are getting together lists for me for tower projects that they said they were had an interest in for which the company never sent them that information. And Don and I were anxious to get that list. Uh, because you need to, to be closing that loop. The tribes are an important part of this process, which is why I personally discourage you, nor rules permit you to do TCNS notice and ship a review at the same time. Do the tribes first. Close, get that loop mostly closed. Um, the other common mistakes are, are um, having um, archaeologists do adverse effect determinations for buildings. Archaeologists don't stand upright. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's not what they do. So you need the professional qualifications and standards are there for a reason. Archaeologists to assess uh, effects assessments for things that are in the ground. Unless that particular archaeologist has specialized training. Some of them do. Some of them can do, under the professional qualifications standards, do assess assessment effects for buildings and landscapes. Landscapes get to be a tricky thing because you've got TCPs, you've got cultural landscapes, and we're a little more flexible in terms of how we look at that, but you need to be looking at those cultural landscapes. It's becoming more and more important in Section 106 review. Uh, the, Par the National Park Service has been pushing that as an issue. The Advisory Council talks about it fairly frequently. A lot of the SHPOs, especially in the Western states, are very conscious that there are landscapes and the effect that towers, actually what I'll say, the impact the towers have on those landscapes, we won't necessarily say effects. Um, and remember, with SEC is always the backstop for that. So with, with that out of the way, um, I'm real pleased that we have a SHPO panel, because as I said, they do the majority of the work uh, in the tower reviews. They're, they're our partners, um, our, our very valuable partner, and this process wouldn't work without their assistance and their role in this, which was established by the National Historic Preservation Act. They have, a, um, in my SEC world, a direct responsibility to look at tower projects. I always see those projects that they don't get to, uh, have, that have adverse effects, and I have 15 days to look at them. That's one of my shot clocks. That's why I asked the question earlier about what shot clock are you talking about. Um, any tower projects that have adverse effects, then I uh, obviously get to see. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Betsy Shirk from the Georgia SHPO on, on my side. Then in the middle is Beth Cole from Maryland, and then Mark Holma from the state of Virginia. And I, th I think they, you drew straws, and so Beth is going to go first? Okay. Oh, well, before you start, I'll, I'll forget this if I don't. Um, my IT department has uh, figured out a way so that we can post on another set of URLs all the PowerPoint presentations for today. So um, I think that includes my vacation slides from this morning. Um, so, so we'll be sending that list around probably later this afternoon. So you, and I'm not sure how long they'll stay up, but we'll try to get them to stay up at least for a couple weeks. OK. okay. That's Good morning. I want to thank Steve for including us on this panel today and participating in this training. We were very excited to hear about it. We see a lot of FCC project reviews in our world, and I think this training provides a great opportunity for us all to learn from each other, share information, so that hopefully the process will go more smoothly for all of us. Um, and I think we share that as, as you do as well. 
Um, we just wanted to spend a little bit of time, each SHPO giving a little bit of perspective from their state, and then hopefully there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. Um, I think one of the most important things to recognize is get to know the SHPOs in the state within which you're working. Uh, even though we're all reviewing projects under the NPA, there are subtle differences from state to state in terms of procedures, information sharing, um, what the concerns are in terms of historic properties, the types of consulting parties out there. So it's really going to save you a lot of time in the long run to make that contact first so that you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, and a lot of states post guidance reg regarding their um, FCC review procedures on their websites. I know we do in Maryland. Um, so a couple points I'd like to highlight that I think will help make your jobs easier as well as our jobs. Um, one of the biggest issues that we see is the quality and completeness of the Form 620 and 621. Um, and I think when you're using the E106 process to fill out the form, hopefully that's helping to guide you to make sure you've included all the information, but the quality and the accuracy of that information is really, really critical. Uh, we base our reviews on the information that's submitted to us as well as the information that we have in our own databases. So quality of the information in, it's just going to make our job easier if we don't have to come back and ask for additional information. Um, making sure that the information is accurate too, again, I think this came up earlier this morning, but making sure your tower designs, heights, locations are the way they're supposed to be. We'd like to review these projects once, not multiple times. Um, it is important to come into your SHPO library to access the information. I know in Maryland some of our information is available online, but it is not complete and is not fully up to date. So you really need to make the effort to come in and look at the information that we have in our library as well as our accompanying databases. Uh, and make sure that the people that you send into the library know what they're doing so that, again, you're getting the most accurate information so that when you do submit your forms, especially when they're going online, you've got the right numbers. Uh, it's very embarrassing to find out you've misidentified a property. Um, we like to see copies of whatever consultation has taken place with the local government included as part of your submittal. If you've already done that process first, it makes our jobs a whole lot easier and you don't end up with a lot of this back and forth between the local and the state review. Um, also make sure that you're only including information on your form that's relevant to your project area. Um, sometimes we've seen consultants kind of get a little bit of lazy, you know, I don't want to see a list of all the NR properties for a given county, you know, focus in on what is your actual APE. Uh, the same goes for identifying your list of consulting parties, really identifying those parties that are relevant to your project, not just in some geographic proximity. Um, and then it's also very helpful that your attachments are clear and legible. Um, photographs should really be illustrating what it is you're taking a picture of. If it's blurry, if it's fuzzy, there's really no point in including it. So again, if you pay, pay a little bit of attention to the quality of the information that comes in, it just makes our turnaround time so much easier. Um, another big issue we like to highlight is making sure you're doing appropriate coordination with other consulting parties. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we like to see you do the local process first and then including that in your Form 620 and 621. Um, but make sure you're identifying other consulting parties relevant to the project area. Um, and I think you'll hear some more about this from Virginia well, but certainly in, in our area there are a lot of um, National Park Service lands that are nearby within the APE. Um, so making sure that you have identified them, um, your local heritage areas, preservation organizations, as well as owners of adjacent properties, particularly owners of historic properties. They have a vested interest in the property, and if you've included them up front, again, you know, you'll show that you've given them that opportunity to comment on your projects. Um, when you get into sort of your assessment of effects for visuals, um, pictures worth a thousand words. Um, so we like to see balloon tests and visualizations to accurately affect visual effects when it's appropriate for a given resource. When you do balloon tests, it's really helpful if you invite your other <laughs> consulting parties so that they can actually see the balloons at the same time, be given that opportunity to take their own pictures. A lot of times that can allay a lot of fears at the, as you get through the resolution of effects if people have been there and seen the same thing at the same time you're doing your balloon tests. Um, and so it's really important to share that information with your consulting parties. Um, when you're getting into avoiding adverse effects, um, again, I think we, we're pretty successful in Maryland in working out ways to avoid adverse effects. We have very few cases that get into the adverse effect threshold, and one of the, your biggest ways for avoiding is by using an appropriate site selection process. 
because a lot of times with ad additional scrutiny in terms of where you need coverage, you can avoid where some of those hot spots are going to be. Um, and then also looking at minimization efforts through appearance, size, vegetative screening. Um, but again, use your consulting parties in this process because a lot of times they may have views, suggestions that, that we're not even thinking about that can help in terms of avoiding and minimizing adverse effects. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to emphasize was use of the E106 process. We do use it in Maryland. We like it. It makes it easy for us. Um, I think it really helps facilitate consultation and coordination, and it makes it easy. You know, I like getting those reminders that say your 30-day clock is coming up. Um, because FCC projects are one of many projects that we review. In our office, we see about 5,000 projects a year for our global federal and state agencies doing work in Maryland. So we have many hats that we're juggling. FCC is just one small um, part. So anything that you can do to make our jobs easier makes it better for us. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague in Georgia. Okay. Good morning. I'm Betsy Shirk with the um, uh, Georgia Historic Preservation Division of the Department of Natural Resources. We are the State Historic Preservation Office in Georgia, and I'm the Environmental Review Coordinator for our program and for our office. We review around 2,000 projects a year, and um, this it varies on types, but seems to remain rather consistent, even with some of the changes in economy and all. But also consistent is the percentage of cell towers of those around 10 percent, and um, so around 200 a year is uh, are the mainly new towers, a few co-locates. We're not able to respond to about one in four of the um, new tower uh, documentation projects that we receive because. Um, we don't have enough information uh, to comment. And that's not necessarily uh, not complete forms, but it's more to do with the programmatic agreement, national programmatic agreement that does not require surveys. So if it's um, just consideration of the previously, of the surveys for architectural resources. So the, uh, consideration of only the previously identified architectural resources. Um, much of our state has not been surveyed, um, definitely not recently, and lots of ours are from the 70s, so uh, many, many decades are left out, even if they were up to date in the late 70s. Um, so if we suspect that there are historic properties in the area, rather than responding with an opinion, we just go ahead and take the option under the programmatic agreement to um, just not respond. Of course, this doesn't stop or slow down the process. It just um, allows us not to go on record with an opinion on effects that is not supported. This also makes the public participation very important, as Beth mentioned, and we do check uh, to see that the appropriate parties have been notified. We check the Form 620s. Often what we have are the letters that are sent out, understanding that often there are no responses, but um, at least the, um, the option has been afforded to the different groups to, um, to uh, identify some properties mainly that they're aware of and uh, that we didn't have in our databases. Uh, we do on our website have, as allowed under the programmatic agreement, have a um, list of, for public participation, so that is out there to help. Uh, consultants and client, uh, their, do the uh, Form 620s and make sure they cover the bases, uh, particularly down to, not necessarily down to the local or neighborhoods, even though we encourage those con uh, contacts, but um, off, a lot of times they come in under the zoning as well, and I think it does work out for the best if those groups are involved from the beginning with the Section 106 as well. <coughs> Um, we do, we do ha actually we do have a number of resources brought to our attention that are then considered by the um, the consultants uh, as far as for the effects to historic properties uh, for a project uh, used through that vehicle. I'd like to also emphasize, as um, Beth did, that. Um, that uh, another major part, a major step in the uh, consideration of historic resources 
and effects for projects is the um, after an adverse effect has been identified to actually be able to uh, provide a meaningful consideration of alternatives to either avoid, hopefully avoid, if not minimize, but then to go ahead to the resolution. We do rely on the FCC um, at this point because of course we're not engineers and a lot of what we get to support that the tower needs to go a certain spot is uh, engineering sort of coverage and things like that, which is understand that that's the whole need and purpose for the, the cell towers, but we're not able always to see if the alternatives, uh, different sites, or even um, uh, lowering heights or, or change in design might be an option and still provide the, the, um, the need or purpose of the cell tower. So um, mitigation and avoidance are really at the heart of the planning process. It was established in section 106 and so um, as I say, we, we do consider that an important step and um, often it's um, one of those that's just sort of glossed over between the, the effects finding and then the moving to mitigation. Then a uh, final thing I'd also like to note is for the E106 process and actually Steve and has covered and um, others have covered it but we were, Georgia was in on the trial but we we're not able to integrate it into our system at this time. So we do receive hard copies of the um, forms and uh, we also um, have some databases with records on them, but they're not complete. And so we also do need um, consultants to come into our office, make appointments to check our, our files to um, be able to see the, uh, all the previously identified properties not only in our survey files um, and identified sites but we uh, a lots of de other projects primarily Department of Transportation that were just really large projects and had a lot of um, document survey documentation there in our environmental review files and so we're also um, do encourage consideration of those and if that's not checked off then we do uh, know about some of the properties through pre, um, previous environmental review projects. So um, we would like to go ahead and move toward the electronic, totally electronic, and hopefully at some point we'll be able to. Okay, Mark. Thank you, good morning. Um, my name is Mark Holma. Um, I'm with the Department of Historic Resources, which in Virginia is the SHPO office. I want to thank Steve for including me in this, in this panel discussion, and I want to, um, acknowledge and commend the commission on its fabulous security apparatus that it has out there. <laughs> um, I had it coming in, I had a sinking suspicion that that was actually to protect us from, from you guys, but hopefully <laughs> that is not the case. Um, as I'm sure my colleagues will, will agree, um, in Virginia and in, in other ship offices, one of our major roles in the 106 process is to assist you and the federal agency and your um, clients through the 106 process. Um, and we, we take that very seriously, so we, we try to look at it as a collaborative effort. We hope that um, we have a good enough relationship with the consultants that work um, with our office that you can pick up the phone and call our, our um, reviewer and and talk things out and I should say I'm here under false pretenses because um, I don't actually do the day-to-day -day review of cell tower projects I had for many years um, for those of you who work in Virginia you probably see Chris Novelli his name on on letters quite a bit Chris is the the day-to-day -day, um, reviewer for for the projects I get involved if um, a project is particularly controversial or if it gets to the point of an MOA, I'll, I'll take it over. So I do have um, a, a lot of experience dealing with, with FCC projects, but um, lately it's, it hasn't been on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I just want to emphasize a few points that my colleagues had, had mentioned, and the first is consulting parties. Um, in Virginia, we prefer that 
um, a larger net is thrown. Um, this is partially to protect you all um, and partially for self-preservation because when someone notices a cell tower going up in next to or near their historic house or a historic house that they have, have come to love, they don't call the FCC, they don't call you, they call us. And they say, why are you allowing a cell tower to be built? And of course, we all know that the shipboat doesn't allow anything, um, but it's hard to explain to an irate property owner why their beloved historic property or the house that their grandmother was born in is being um, overshadowed by this 400-foot cell tower. So um, we do prefer that um, you're more cautious with um, the, the consulting parties as far as involving the public. And it's not really anything to be afraid of. As Beth mentioned, the consulting parties sometimes can be your best friends in that if, heaven forbid, it comes down to an adverse effect, um, they can give you some good ideas as far as what they would like to see um, regarding mitigation. Um, as m many of you may know, um, in Virginia, we do not have uh, resident federal tribes. We do have a number of state tribes um, that should be fairly recognized and are trying to be fairly recognized. Um, but that does not mean we do not have federal tribes that are not interested in what happens in Virginia. And we've noticed that over the last few years, they have become more and more interested in what happens in Virginia. And they do have um, you know, ancestral lands. Um, we see a lot of interest from the Catawba, for example, or the Eastern Band of the Cherokee. So do not assume that because there are not any resident federal tribes in Virginia that federal tribes are not interested in what happens in Virginia, because they are, and they will let it be known. Um, as I mentioned, we do have several state-recognized tribes. Um, I believe, it used to be eight, I believe the number has recently increased to 13. Um, and many of those are seeking federal recognition. So you may have to deal with them officially anyway um, at, at some point. But if, if something is, is happening on a land that the Mattapanai or the Pamunkey are interested in, um, you may want to, to contact those, those um, state tribes. We also have a state agency, um, the Virginia Council on Indians, which kind of represents the interest of Indians in Virginia. Um, they have one staff person, and so it is probably likely that if you contact the VCI, and I encourage that, especially if there's going to be a, an, an issue with uh, prehistoric sites, um, there's a good chance that you may not get a response, um, which is fine. You gave them the chance. But if you do get a response, um, we take um, what the VCI s says very seriously in the ship office. They're uh, actually a uh, sister agency in our secretariat. And so we have a very close working relationship with, with the VCI. Also, um, as Beth mentioned, um, in Maryland, or in Virginia as in Maryland, we have a lot of park service land. Um, so if the, the project is occurring near uh, a park, um, the George Washington Memorial Parkway, um, Blue Ridge um, Parkway, um, please contact that park or the, the um, park service, they're, they're the controlling um, headquarters for that uh, park service property. Um, because uh, we take, again, we take what the park service says um, seriously. In fact, we have a programmatic agreement with the park service our office does that um, if something is going to affect Park Service land, um, we will let the Park Service know. So we, if you do not let the Park Service know what's going on, we'll rat you out to the Park Service, um, but in a loving, paternal kind of way. <laughs> well, that's National Park. But now that you mention it, we do have state parks. and. And, and county parks, and I, I know we have at least one representative from uh, Virginia County here, and, and we'll rat you out to, to Justin if, if you do anything you shouldn't be doing in Prince William County. Um, so, you know, there's some obvious consulting parties that kind of get um, overlooked. Um, 
another one is um, property owners of historic properties. Um, consultants are very good about identifying historic properties, historic you know, houses that are on the register or have been determined eligible. But for some reason, they don't make that extra jump a lot of times and, and knock on the door and say, hey, are you going to have a problem with a 300-foot tower going you know, next door? <coughs> and again, once the, the cranes come out and start building that tower, who gets the phone call? It's going to be us. And that's when you don't want your project to be stopped. Um, once you have the you know the engineers out there you you want to really protect yourselves from from surprises like that um, also in Virginia well this is kind of in the in the next topic we have some unique um, resource types I guess I would say and 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 admittedly the resource types that are kind of hard to get your your mind around a lot of times um, Virginia has battlefields. Virginia has a lot of battlefields. And we have rural historic districts. And we have a lot of rural historic districts. And we have big rural historic districts. Um, so we have a lot of historic landscapes that, you know, sometimes it might not be a good idea to put a cell tower in or near. Um, so take that in consideration. Um, we do have, it used to be on our website, I'm not sure if it still is because we um, re-engineered a website a little um, earlier in the year, but we do have guidance on um, assessing visual effects to, to landscapes. And if it's not on our website, please call Chris and ask for that because he, he can email it to, him, to you. Um, and just on the topic of battlefields, this kind of goes back to consulting parties a lot of most battlefields in Virginia are not within um, Park Service land they're just kind of out there they're someone's field or or um, you know just open space but there is a constituency for them a loud constituency a active con an active constituency um, we have a lot of regional and statewide um, preservation groups um, specifically also dealing with, with um, Civil War battlefields, um, you know, the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation, Civil War Preservation Trust, I think that's national, um, but we also have some from state, one, state ones. Um, if you're dealing with a battlefield, you, it's probably a good idea to get in touch with those um, organizations that, that have a special interest in those battlefields. I um, also want to give a shout out to the American Battlefield Preservation Program. Um, they are overwhelmed, but we also send a lot of people to them um, when there's not a, an actual NPS park that the battlefield is associated with. Um, we'll often send um, consultants to NPS at the American Battlefield Pre uh, Preservation Program um, because they kind of um, attempt their horribly understaffed but attempt to deal with those battlefields that aren't claimed by any other uh, part of the Park Service. Um, another point that I'd like to, to make is I know that the PA says that um, only officially designated properties have to be considered and we respect that but if you read a little further there's a little pot spot that says that the SHPO can bring things to y'all's attention and in Virginia we're not um, shy about doing that there's a although we have a very good um, database um, on GIS based database that's available online it's called a data sharing system DSS um, that has a lot of well has all of our survey information on it um, most of that is just survey information. Uh, most of the properties that we have or know about have not been um, um, determined eligible or looked at for National Register nomination. And we do search when you send us your information and tell us what's there that's eligible for the National Register. We also look at the stuff that you didn't mention that's in your APE. 
um, and we'll go and look and if it looks interesting like hmm you know this is something that could be eligible we'll let you know about it I mean we'll, we'll tell you about it again part of that is to protect you all and part of that is self-preservation because that house that didn't get considered is that owner is going to call us and why and ask why was my house not considered as historic when it obviously is eligible and we would we have to say with a with a you know a little uh, downcast eye well yeah that looks pretty historic to us so I guess my advice would be to um, protect uh, I don't want to say protect yourselves that sounds so you know antagonistic but um, do your due diligence and maybe a little bit more because one you won't be getting letters back from us saying why didn't you consider this or who, why didn't you contact these people but um, also because it's a way to um, do that to to identify problems and it's easier to identify and deal with the problems at the beginning than it is at, at the end um, just one more thing about battlefields and rural historic districts which I f forgot to mention um, as Steve mentioned earlier the the APE the three quarters and the, the mile and three quarter mile um, are, are guidelines um, when you're dealing with with battlefields and rural historic districts you might want to look a little beyond those those guidelines um, to, to capture those and consider those and as always if you have a question about well you know is do I should I go the extra quarter mile and, and take in this battlefield into the AP you know the the PA does say you know you can consult with us and you can talk with with the SHPO and determine what is an appropriate APE and the, the best time to do that is not when you send in everything and us having to tell you well I think you need to extend it it's before you send it to us give us a call and tell us your issue and we can talk through it then and uh, that is all I have Thank you very much for that, guys. Um, I really appreciate your, your making the effort to, to come into the, the big city, especially I understand it's getting hot and humid outside. Um, are there questions for our esteemed panel? Yes. What encourages you to want to do What kind of power do the National Park Service as a consulting party, what kind of power do they have is to hold up a project um, considering that that site might not be eligible for the National Register? The Park Service, I'll, I'll start off. I don't know, is this on? I, I didn't, they didn't I, well, I guess it's going yeah, um, to. The Park Service has as much power as any other consulting party. Um, they're allowed to comment. The federal agency has to take their comments into account and that's it yeah park when it's a park service site all one of the things that that some people get this is a, a common mistake they, they'll i get my memory jogged every once in a while um all national parks that are historic parks are automatically listed on the national register of historic places when they are declared a national park so all the civil war um battlefields that are national parks are automatically listed and, and yeah we we did have the one consultant that wanted to put a tower was doing work for a client 10 feet from this the park boundary side that said i'm a civil war battlefield park and they never mentioned it in their report and never mentioned the fact that they were digging on the battlefield even though it wasn't part of the national park you, you need to have some common sense to that kind of stuff um there is a problem there is an issue not a problem that you need to recognize is that with the battlefields that are in private ownership because the national battlefield program is working real hard to identify all those national those battlefields as important to American history they're not always evaluated so they're always not necessarily an historic property under the terms of our NPA 
and um, so that when you're doing those kinds of things you need to be cautious but you're actually not required to consider that in terms of, of, of going through the SEC section 106 compliance process but in terms of being a good steward and a good neighbor um, you might want to work with the community and the SHPO on that. Um, I encourage the, the National Battlefield Program to, to evaluate all your battlefields that you're identifying um, and they're trying to do that as best they can but um, you know just as, as you know we're all limited in terms of staff Park Service is limited in terms of what they're able to accomplish as well. We're recording this, so we tried to get. Uh, in terms of being like a good neighbor and actually identifying property owners who uh, might own historic properties, generally speaking, our clients aren't going to let us actually con identify them and reach out to them directly. And generally, what we end up doing is doing posting a public notice. Uh, what are the FCC's and the SHPO's guidelines as to what's adequate for public notice? Our rules are uh, not vague, but they do require public notice. And the way we look at it is that you need to use the community standard. Um, a legal notice in a newspaper, as if it was a zoning notice, works real well because a lot of people see those. I know in my community, I read the legal notices every day uh, just because there's a couple projects I'm waiting for them to happen. Um, and that's just what I do. Um, but that gets people's attention. Some people will, will do newspaper ads, um, but in some communities, not everybody reads the newspaper. And so there are some communities where posting a, a notice on a bulletin board at the courthouse satisfies that community's public notice requirements. So it's, it's, in some respects, it's situational. My personal preference is for an ad in the newspaper of general circulation in the community, not 100 miles away. We've had people do that, too. Um, so that, that doesn't work. Um, have, the question was, how many days once satisfies the requirement? And it, again, it depends. I know newspaper ads, you know, if you're putting an ad in the Washington Post, uh, you're spending a lot of money. If you're putting an ad in my local newspaper, um, you're not spending much at all. Um, so it, it varies, but at least once. Any questions from over here? You guys are pretty quiet over on that side. I'd like to, go, I'd like go ahead. to add on to the second part of your question about the owners of potentially affected properties. Because I mean, the public notice is one thing, but I think you get into another area where you have owners of a historic property that may or may not be affected by your project. And again, I think you have to use a certain level of due diligence. Um, if your client doesn't want you to reach out to them, there's a good chance your SHPO is going to come back and say, this person needs to be included. We may have already heard from that person. Um, your local government may ask you to reach out to them. Um, in general, there's always a balancing act you have to make in terms of how much is enough reaching out. And a lot of times people, I think, are reluctant or fearful to reach out to other parties because they're afraid they're going to slow the process. But in the long run, you may find your process slowed even further if you haven't reached out at the beginning and they end up getting involved. So, you know, you kind of have to balance that out. And I kind of use as your gauge, what is the real potential for that resource to be affected? And if there's a good chance that resource could be affected, by all means, bring the person on or organization, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agree. Somebody, this question prompts another thought. Um, I know a lot of the licensees, this is addressed to, to you folks who are licensees or tower builders in the room, you often tell your consultants not to call the FCC and frankly from my, my viewpoint that doesn't really serve a purpose because you've got your consultants trying to figure out something that they, they need to, to ask the FCC about so you need to, to lighten up a little bit. Um, you know, it just doesn't serve any real purpose not to allow your consultants to, to, to talk to myself or to Don. Um, you know, we're not ogres. We're not going to take your licenses away or anything like that. We're, we're trying. We come to work every day trying to help you all get the process done. So if you don't let your consultants talk to us, we can't help you, which is sort of the bottom line to that. And the same thing with the ship hosts. We, we sort of want to help. It's our nature. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I have a projecting voice. Thanks. 
Uh, for agencies that, or for SHPOs that don't have an online database of all their properties, are there any other resources other than just coming into the library to do that research to find out what properties are in the area? I'm thinking with sites where you might be two or three hours from the nearest SHPO office and you just don't necessarily have the budget to spend six hours driving in and out to the office to find those properties. <laughs> That's kind of what I figured. <laughs> your clients need to give you the financial resources to do your job. If, if they're not going to let you do that, the tower's not going to go up. You need to go to the ship office, and if it costs money, it costs money. Just any, anybody else before we get back to you? <laughs> You've used up your questions. It's working. On a similar note to that question, uh, are there guidelines when the SHPO doesn't require us necessarily to come in? For instance, if it's a Form 621 submission on an existing tower where the only reason we're initiating Section 106 review is due to a small compound expansion, um, would we then actually still have to come in if the underlying tower itself uh, may have um, already undertaken the whole review? Would you then provide us relief from actually visiting your office to review records that the underlying tower already reviewed? Well, I think, again, you'd have to look at when was it previously reviewed, when was it constructed. I mean, new information comes into our office on a daily basis, so if there's any shadow of a doubt, you know, you really need to do your due diligence and come in and look at the resources. I just want to, I think my director would, um, say I was remiss if I didn't put a plug in for our, our system, the DSS system, for a nominal subscription fee. <laughs> you can have access to our entire database, our entire survey form at your keyboard in your office. If you want further information, contact our archives. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Do you have a PayPal account? Excuse me? Do you have a PayPal account? Um, I could organize one, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, for, for a lot of, the, I mean, everybody would like to have electronic systems. Uh, and we've, we've been helping a couple of SHPOs develop electronic systems because they like what we do here. Um, but it all costs money. And, you know, the world just costs money. You need to spend the money to, to get your business done. Are there any other questions? Um, I know that we have some, some other SHPO staff in the, well, at least when they registered anyway. Are there any other SHPO representatives here that want to, to raise their hand and say wh where you're from? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Are there any? I know this. Okay. Um, yeah. Ba basically, no, actually, I have somebody in the back, but she was way in the middle of the room. So basically, what she's saying is that in D.C., she's with the D.C. DC SHPO. Um, you need to work with their office. They don't see a whole lot of new tower projects, but everything is a landscape issue in the District of Columbia. So if you want to put up any kind of a tower project, locations, whatever, you need to go and talk to them. They have their information on, on their website, all the surveys there, but um, so you need to. Are there any other SHPOs here? I know there was. I'm not a SHPO, Stephen, but I'm Justin Patton. I'm a okay. archaeologist in Prince William County. Um, and uh, if you're putting up a tower in the county, I encourage you to 
encourage you to give me a call or talk to the planning, call the planning office. Um, we'll be happy to work with you. Um, we have a lot of towers going up in the county and um, it's, uh, it keeps me busy. So just wanted to introduce myself. Thank you. Okay. And I know there was one other, two other states registered. Did they actually make it? Um, okay, well, that's fine. Nancy, do you want to? No, okay. Um, okay, with, was, was there somebody? Okay, all right. Um, okay, I want to thank the panel. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I think, you know, you, you need to, to really give the, the SHPOs a good hand because they're the, the gatekeepers to your review process. Um, and I really appreciate your taking the time out of your busy days to come up and spend some time with us. Um, we're going to take um, just a real quick second. I'd, rather, I'd prefer that you not get out of your chairs um, and wander off because our next session is going to start. We're running a little bit late um, but because we're going to start talking about some tribes, um, the role of the tribes in the Section 106 process in, in the NEPA. So thank you again very much, guys. We ready to go? Okay. Um, as as our as our bureau chief had said this morning, Rick ha or uh, yeah, Rick Kaplan, uh, Terry Cole, who was the the tipo for the the Choctaw Nation, had wanted to be here today to make a presentation and to talk to you all, to meet you all. Um, Terry, I thought would have been a valuable presentation because one of the things that he is doing is working with the other tribes that are resident in Oklahoma to help organize them. They have conversations all the time um, and uh, they're working together to improve their portion of the Section 106 process. Um, but Terry had some surgery, he's recovering, uh, but he can't travel just yet. So filling in for, um, for Terry as best we can. It's, it's hard, but uh, I'm confident. Um, I have Jeff Blackwell, who is, you've been with the commission again now for almost a year. Uh, Jeff was formerly our tribal liaison and uh, went out back into the private industry and now is back um, as the office director for our, our office of, of tribal affairs and policy. And then Anne Marie, everybody knows Anne Marie. Um, and those of you who can pronounce her last name get a special gold stars. Um, I've actually learned to spell it. I have to type her email address all the time. Um, Anne Marie and I talk almost every day, and this is one of the things that I think is important for you to recognize is that there's a lot of connections here within the FCC. I mean, Don and I obviously see each other every day because our office is nearby. Anne Marie's in our Gettysburg office, um, and she works with the TCNS process. I also spend a lot of time talking to tribes. Probably 30% of my time is involved with with. Um, engaging the tribes in the Section 106 process, answering questions, helping them out. Um, I go to tribal meetings and all. So with that, um, we're going to turn it over to, to Jeff. And you feel free to do you know, your own little personal introductions. And then we'll um, get into some questions after presentations. So Jeff, thank well, you. Thank you, Stephen. Heshche, uh, Chukma. My name is Jeffrey Blackwell. I am an enrolled member of the Muscogee Creek Nation. I'm also of Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Omaha descent. Uh, Stephen is right. I, I worked at the commission before as a liaison to tribal governments and senior attorney uh, for almost six years. And um, we, we tried to start an Office of Native Affairs and Policy at that time, and for several reasons it didn't happen. I, uh, after several years here, I received a, a uh, an offer that I was not allowed to refuse by my father's people and was called home to service and spent uh, 
five years working for the Chickasaw Nation, Chickasaw Nation Industries, and never dreamed that I would be coming back. Uh, I used to tell people in any country that I was a uh, former recovering Fed. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to tell them that I'm a recidivist. <laughs> but uh, I, I serve as the chief of the Office of Native Affairs and Policy. And when I was talking with the chairman about the creation of the office, I told him that that title actually meant something in Indian country. But I was advised against changing the name of the title of the, uh, the head of the office. But um, I want to thank the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and, and Steve for inviting me to participate today. Uh, the Office of Native Affairs and Policy is part of the Commission's NEPA team. Uh, we work closely with WTB and, and the Media Bureau. And both of those institutions have uh, engaged in Herculean efforts to address the lack of services on tribal lands nationwide and are uh, really ahead of the curve in, in helping the tribes address some pretty extraordinary and uh, incredible, uh, incredibly low penetration rates. Uh, right now in Indian country, there is uh, less than a 69% telephone penetration rate. And there is anecdotally somewhere incredibly low, uh, a 5 to 8% broadband penetration rate. And uh, I, I mean that literally, incredibly low. The number is so low that it is, in fact, very difficult to measure. So in an environment uh, as diverse as the Commission's uh, separate bureaus and institutions, the Office of Native Affairs and Policy uh, was designed, created to develop and drive a Commission-wide agenda to address uh, the many issues and needs of Native communities, American Indian tribes, Alaska Native villages, and Native Hawaiian communities uh, throughout the Commission. And I was very fortunate that in my time here at the Commission before, I, I was part of the NEPA team and, and worked on, uh, it was some of the most challenging work I think I've ever done, um, worked on the programmatic agreement, the best practices, the tower construction notification system. And so these are very familiar and uh, friendly issues uh, to me. And uh, I'm uh, flanked on both sides by folks that have developed a, a uh, a real credibility in Indian country and integrity among the tribes. As I'm sure you can imagine, it is a place where the United States government uh, has not always had a sterling reputation. Uh, but that is changing, and it's through the efforts of folks like this. So I really look forward to hearing what uh, they have to say as well. Uh, Anne Marie is, unlike anybody I've ever known, has been embraced by the tribes and uh, really makes that tower construction notification system work. And uh, if any of you be, have ever worked with her, she's so hard to get along with. It is, <laughs> it's such a challenge on a daily basis. But um, really, when, when you begin to think about 106 issues, the major difference, I think, between what our panel and the tribal issues are and, and the state issues is that uh, really the, the needs for telecommunications, the, the 106 process, uh, there is such a cultural difference that uh, the National Historic Preservation Act in Indian Country is the way by which tribes uh, protect and preserve their cultures. So yes, we have battlefields in Indian Country, and yes, we have historic properties, uh, but also we have living, breathing, vibrant cultures that for many, many generations uh, were on the wane and were threatened and now are waxing again. Are now there is a, a renaissance of tribal culture and when you are talking to tribes about the 106 process, often you are talking to tribes about things, impact, potential impact. Uh, you're scratching the surface of some of the most sensitive issues around preserving that culture. And um, I think on an individual basis, none of us would ever want to impact the belief system of, of somebody else where you uh, you know, were you talking to somebody that you just met and inadvertently said something that was offensive to their, their beliefs as a, uh, as a Catholic person or as a Muslim person? Um, at a more macro scale, with the pressures of time and money, uh, those, uh, those values uh, sometimes get stressed. But it's worth it to, to remember uh, sort of our values individually as, as citizens of the United States and and what it is to be um, good corporate citizens and good participants. Uh, in our office, in the Office of Native Affairs and Policy, uh, we interact on a daily basis uh, with the tribes. We're working with all of the different parts of the commission. And uh, 
I think virtually all of the frustrations that you may experience working with tribal nations, uh, we have as well. Uh, we have timing challenges and response challenges. Uh, I think that it's important also when we, we have to generalize, we have to say tribes, um, but genuinely those 565 plus tribal nations and then not counting the Native Hawaiian organizations, they're all vastly different as different as the nations on the globe are these nations. That they are local governments with an amount of sovereignty that approaches international sovereignty and a dedication to their land and people that rivals any on the globe. So, um, but often are much more interested in working directly with you as industry and representatives of the industry than, than working through us uh, to, to talk with you. It is your efforts that impact their opportunities most directly. So um, there's real opportunity for relationship building. Uh, when we were um, shuffling very quickly because of uh, Thippo Cole's uh, in inability to join us, uh, we thought we might speak some, take some time to try to convey some, some lessons learned. And uh, as they say in the made-for-TV movies, change the names of the parties so that you know, so that the innocent are protected and, uh, and uh, folks don't realize that it's your cases we're actually talking about, but that, uh, but that we also share some insight in, in our experiences so that, so that lessons are more easily learned. So with that, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick it to Anne-Marie and in the time that we have, uh, we'll share ideas and concepts and bounce some ideas off of one another. So, Anne-Marie. Yeah. I, uh, like I had said earlier, I just uh, spent a week in Indian country. I was in Oklahoma and Tulsa at the um, Hard Rock Cafe where the Society of American Indian Government Employees were having their annual meeting. And um, I attended the first two days. It was just classes from um, the top tribal attorneys, um, Walter Echo Hawk, amazing, amazing attorney. Um, Stephen Pivar, a lot of you have his book, uh, The Rights uh, in Indian Country. Um, just really fantastic speakers. And they kept talking about the, the trends right now. And I just wanted to mention to you, um, they felt, and I agree with them, that President Obama being an adopted member of um, the Crow tribe of Montana has a, a lot to do with that. When he was campaigning, he was actually formally adopted into the tribe. Um, his name, I have it down here, is One Who Helps People Throughout the Land. And uh, his parents are Hartford and Mary Black Eagle. And uh, if you watch the inauguration, his adoptive parents were, were at the inauguration. Um, they were also saying that uh, one of the things that President Obama did was he, he promised Indian country that he would try to hold summits and his very first year he held the first tribal summit. All 565 federally recognized tribes were invited and again this past year, uh, just a few months ago, December 2010, he held the second tribal summit. Um, at the second summit, he announced that the United States has now adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, 147 nations voted on that. Uh, 143 were in favor, four were opposed, and slowly the, the last four uh, also adopted it, and we, the United States, were number 147 out of 147. So, uh, but he announced at the Tribal Summit, uh, a lot of people are very concerned about that because um, uh, one of the articles uh, talks about uh, tribes having the right to their own lands, their, their ancestral lands, and people are, are concerned about how that's going to go and, and what that's going to mean. Uh, but, but it was adopted. It's a non-binding non agreement. But I wanted to put it out there because uh, the whole week, everybody was talking about this UN declaration. Trust me, it's big. Just Google UN declaration on the rights of indigenous people and, and, and you can read it. Um, tribal fees. People are talking about tribal fees a lot. I didn't even want to bring it up, but I talk about it all day, every day to people, so I thought I might as well just talk about it. Um, I'm guessing that there are now about 40 tribes that are charging fees, and they go from $25 to $1,000. It seems like um, $300 uh, is what most people are charging right now, that they're, the tribal review fee. They do it in all different ways. Um, sometimes they'll tell you right up front, when you get the list of tribes, it'll say, you know, the name of the TIPO, and then right there it'll say, we always require a topo map, we always re require a street map, and we always require a $150 fee, something like that. 
or they might immediately tell you uh, that they are interested in a project and then when you write back to find out what they're interested in then at that point uh, they submit their fee the FCC t continues to remain neutral on uh, the subject of tribal fees. These are sovereign nations. We, we do not, um, government to government, our government does not tell their government what to do. So right now, uh, and for all these years, we've just remained neutral on that. Um, like Jeff Blackwell was saying, there is a strong movement to go back to traditional names. You're going to see a lot of that. So what I encourage tribes to do, if they go from a very short four-letter name and suddenly it's this huge, huge name and people don't understand that it's the same tribe, I encourage them to, for at least a year, put, you know, formerly known as so-and-so. So you know which, which tribe we're talking about. There's a big movement. There's also a very big movement to go back to traditional names. Um, yourself. So uh, one woman comes to mind, and I just love her, um, Giwegi Gukwe uh, Martin, the Tippo of the Lackview Dessert. You know, um, try to learn her name. She, she's a wonderful woman, and you're going to start getting a lot, a lot of that. Uh, and that's all I have as far as um, trends. You know, I, I, I wanted to share, um, I, I think that a lot of the issues for, for tribal uh, in the 106 area, they kind of fall into two separate areas. We're, we're talking about this way, uh, this yesterday. It, it's really sort of the, you know, I, I think 10 years ago we were concerned much more around um, the interest, that, that industry's interest and your interest being uh, more in the area of why and what. What is being impacted? Why? And, and wanting to know uh, many issues behind that. Um, that cultural veil. Uh, and I think we were all a little bit surprised, I was at least to um, personally, to see that it was really more how. It was really, you know, how are we, how do we, how do we comply with these regulations and, and how do we move forward in a, in a quick manner. So um, looking back a, a few years on, on, I guess, eight, nine years on uh, these rules and in the TCNS, uh, the Commission has uh, given you a number of tools that are uncommon in the federal uh, spectrum. And with some of the, the staff here, I mean, Steve is only the second of cultural preservation officers at the commission and, and, and fills that role uh, wonderfully and has developed some, some very beneficial relationships to the FCC and Indian country and that are to your benefit as well. Um, but not just in the professional staff and, our, and this institution's dedication to working with Indian country in a way that is a genuine, but also uh, resources like the tower construction notification system. Um, that having been said, though, it really boils down to uh, relationship building in Indian country. And just like any other business, the, the business is, is the people in it. Uh, you know, any business, it, there's the name up front, but it's the decision makers and the, the, the values of the people within it that, that really sort of shine through. Um, I want to tell you the Office of Native Affairs and Policy is here for you as a resource. Uh, we uh, also work across the different industries, not just with uh, Indian Country and with the Commission, and have been involved in a few of the more problematic recent uh, 106 cases. And uh, some of those are still in progress, but um, to the extent that, that you uh, uh, wish to reach out to us, please do. Uh, we all coordinate on, uh, if not a daily, a weekly basis, uh, and our, our staff in the Office of Native Affairs and Policy is uh, on, a, on a steep learning curve with the 106, uh, the 106 work. Um, but just so to help fill in why that relationship building is so important, um, and I, I sort of touched on this earlier, the, the, the values of Indian country, um, it, is, it is sometimes difficult to, to relate to if you are a member of one of the major religions in the United States. Um, the fact that they are largely practiced on uh, one day of the week, the, the fact, and, and major ceremonial times, that um, many religions are not necessarily uh, uh, daily, uh, have daily sort of uh, ceremonies. Um, in fact, even the concept of religion sometimes is difficult to relate to from the tribal traditional world because um, it's not a religion that is divorced. Uh, the, the, the tribal view in many, in many native cultures is that uh, the religious belief isn't viewed as some being something different than daily life. It is the way. 
It is the way in which you comport yourself on a daily basis. Um, the concepts of conversion or ministering are often not present in, in native belief systems. Uh, one does not try to convert one to a native belief. Uh, one cannot be of that belief system if one is not of that tribe. So, uh, and not that there are uh, always value judgments associated with that. There's just a difference that's, that's uh, reflected. In almost every situation, uh, personal, public, uh, governmental, private, uh, native issues boil down to the land. And uh, all of the history associated with it uh, often is, is uh, taken into account. Um, the native system of belief is, is a long memory. So some of what occurred uh, just a few hundred years ago seems like it was just the month before last in Indian country. One has to live with it often. Um, I guess one of the things that I have been surprised over the last uh, several years is that there haven't been more um, relationships that uh, result in more business uh, for you all as well uh, that have grown up. There's such an opportunity to uh, build and serve in Indian country. Um, and the needs of Indian country are so, the needs, the tribal needs are so diverse. Um, I live in Rockville, Maryland. My wife and I make our home now in Rockville, Maryland, which is, you know, a, a suburb, one of the major eastern cities like any other, and has the population density to attract a number of different types of services. Most tribes right now are uh, trying to formulate some sort of ag demand aggregation model to be able to obtain the services that you build and provide or in the value chain of providing. Um, so um, you might be talking to one part of a tribal government that in another part of the tribal government wants to talk to another part of the same institution that you're a part of. And it behooves you to build those, those relationships. And if you need uh, help in that regard, please let us know. Um, I, there are a couple of routine um, challenges that come up that you need to be aware of. Um, Tribal lands, uh, reservations are, are, I mean, to get a picture of it, you know, are, are on the national scene in the United States right now, we're, we're almost at four alarms because we have almost a 10% unemployment rate. Uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, chief from the North Plains and his development specialist came in to meet with our commissioners in our office uh, and explained that on his reservation they had a 78% unemployment rate and have all of the uh, health, safety, welfare, education, public safety, uh, law enforcement needs of any other uh, local government and are, are looking very hard at a wireless solution to be able to, to meet those needs. So not just to be able to, not just the opportunity to be able to have a 400, 500 minute package to talk to folks and catch up with your family, but also actually try to build an economy on it. So in an environment where you're looking to site facilities, uh, often a tribe is uh, looking at the flip side of that coin. I've talked with a number of tribes about the challenges of the 106 process being uh, reactionary in the way that the, the law is written. And I think if any one of us had sort of a blank slate and we're rewriting, I'm not sure I can expound on it that way, but um, there is a way in which that these procedures work that is, that is reactionary and the tribe sometimes um, suffer in that process in that they have the same sort of budget challenges that you have. So I've, I've spoken with a number of tribes saying, why, why don't you get ahead of this process? I mean, at the same time you're trying to develop and you're trying to respond to these letters and these TCNS inquiries, um, instead of being reactive, you know, folks aren't interested in harming your cultural resources. They're interested in putting in their infrastructure. Why don't you engage, and this is, this is, this is uh, us talking to the tribal, tribal leaders, why don't you engage in the sort of, um, a sort of zoning action to figure out where you want, where you would suggest uh, construction to occur, where it, where, it doesn't, where it isn't problematic, and then start building those relationships. I think at one level it, there's a challenge in that there's a lot of overturn or turnover. Uh, in, in, in both sides of this process. And in another, it's, it's just simply a, 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 uh, a resources issue. Uh, there, is a, there is one subject that I want to bring up. It is something that, that often um, 
non-Indian, non-folks that don't have experience in the tribal world sort of stumble into and, and, and immediately uh, uh, borrow the unfortunate history in the United States. Um, looking to site a tower within a reservation on non-Indian fee land within that reservation um, is a problematic situation. Um, and mostly because of the, the historical perspective. I mean, we all spent, what, at most 15 minutes in a 10th grade civics class studying about what happened in the United States with the indigenous populations, um, if that. And we all know that, I mean, everybody always refers to sort of the unfortunate history of, of Native American populations. Um, much of, after, after having been interned on reservations, uh, the federal aim policy of, of, of uh, removal uh, changed and switched. The pendulum sort of swung to that of assimilation and allotment. It was a period that was, um, you know, that historically is, is, is fraught with controversy and, and uh, criticism uh, because it's so um, uh, different from the way we view uh, diversity and the opportunities of diversity in today's world. But during the, during the assimilation allotment era, um, much of this land to which tribes have been placed in the United States was, was uh, carved up into individual allotments. And it is often the unfortunate history that some of the most valuable land, some of that land that was perhaps most easily accessible by transportation routes or, or irrigable land, uh, was absconded with, passed out of Indian ownership. So uh, imagine, if you will, Perhaps you own some land and somebody who was given that land by the government and continues to live within your property. And that is, uh, you know, those, those can be um, wounds that never heal. So uh, it is a difficult thing, and the tribes struggle with this as well, uh, it is a difficult thing to site infrastructure on tribal land. Uh, land reservations are exactly what they sound like. They're lands that are reserved for tribal use. Uh, but title is vested in the United States. And actually places where the tribes do own their land in fee, uh, there are still trust restrictions on those lands to be able to affect that title. And that process is a, is a lengthy one, uh, sometimes for good reason, uh, in, uh, in other agencies um, of the federal government. So to cite on tribal land, we, we know a number of places on, in Indian country where there are towers right up to the edge of reservations. And then we've seen uh, proposals uh, we've seen plans to build on lands within reservations that are non-Indian lands. And almost always that is starting from a very difficult place. Um, there was a case that involved um, the, the, the Assanese and the consultants going actually to a, a uh, not even going to the tribal government in that, in, in that instance, but going to a a um, subordinate city um, or, or township board to talk with them about the land. And um, it really set things off on the wrong foot. So uh, there may be different rules that apply on, on non-Indian fee land within reservations, but it is still uh, a very good idea. And I suggest strongly that you continue to coordinate with the tribe involved because uh, their view of the world is that all of that land is sort of the last vestige of where they were. Uh, it's fascinating. I, I worked for the Chickasaw Nation. The modern incarnation of the Chickasaw Nation government is 500 years old. So, um, and there are folks within tribal governments that, that are still waiting to see if this sort of democracy experiment is going to work out just a couple hundred years old. So uh, some of these tribes are thousands, and their patience is, is accordingly. And they can be some of your strongest allies. Uh, and become, we've seen uh, efforts in certain places where the, um, the relationship benefits and timing benefits from um, simple introductions. And if you need help in that regard, you're looking at three people and there are a bunch of folks in this agency that would, that would help you with that as well. So uh, that was just one thought I wanted to make sure and share with you. I wanted to uh, mention, um, as far as relationship building, people ask me all the time, well, how do I build a relationship? You know, I don't have the money to go out and meet with these people. 
And I, I suggest what, how I started. I just read every single thing I can get my hand on, hands on um, regarding the tribes. And if you only deal with, say, 10 tribes all the time, just every day check the newspaper, see if there's something mentioned about the tribe. Um, if you served your country, uh, definitely mention that. That is so big in Indian country. As a matter of fact, a few days ago, Thursday night, I was, was at a uh, Veterans Honor powwow, and they danced for five hours to the point of exhaustion and I kept saying, I just can't believe they're fancy dancing for so many hours. And people said, because it's for the veterans. You know, it's like, do that extra. You know, I'm Catholic. We go on pilgrimages. We get exhausted. And, and I can relate, you know, what they're doing. And, and it was just amazing, um, you, you know, the, the love of veterans. Uh, as most of you know, I'm sure uh, Native Americans serve the United States services more than any other group, more than the Polish people, the Italian people, um, Native Americans always throughout history and including today uh, th they serve their country and uh, there were so many people at this conference that were uh, serving in the Navy and the Coast Guard and Army and Marines it's just incredible so if you served or if your son or daughter is in, in the service just say oh you know well my daughter is serving right now in Iraq you know uh, just start building that relationship that way if you read that one of their leaders or, or someone on the tribal council um, has passed on uh, don't call the tribe that week and say, you know, you only have 10 more days. I, that is not the time to call. When I read that someone has passed, I immediately mark it on my calendar not to call that tribe for two weeks. Um, we just had a, a TIPO pass. I, I didn't even call the, the council to find out who they were going to appoint. I, I waited, you know, good two, three weeks before I even asked. Then I asked, um, and, and they don't, still don't have someone appointed, so they're, they're using the tribal leader. But, you know, you have to be sensitive to those issues. Um, and that's a great way to start. Just read everything you can get your hands on. And it's gotten to the point now where I'm so around tribes that even coming into this room, I thought to myself, I wonder if a smudging ceremony took place place yet and I thought gee I wonder who's going to say the prayer and I was looking around for an elder because you always ask the elder to say the prayer and I guess that would be me I'm probably the oldest here <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm not not from a tribe um, so you'll see you'll you'll start you'll, you'll develop these relationships and you'll just be amazed if you're going to a meeting on a reservation take tobacco with you present it, you know, ask whoever's holding the meeting, ask the host, say, I've brought tobacco for the prayer, and they'll tell you who the elder is. I'm not good at guessing. I might pick somebody who's 50 who looks 80 to me, and, you know, it's, it's best to just ask the host. Um, did you want to mention prayer at all or customs? Well, I, I think this is all really good advice. I mean, there are some serious cultural um, mannerism differences. Um, in my family, I grew up in northern New Mexico and in southern Oklahoma my uh, maternal grandfather was from Nebraska so I have I have tribal roots there and both my parents worked in federal Indian Affairs and I grew up in this uh, gray region between the federal government and the, and the tribal governments and uh, there are some cultural mannerisms that are genuine between what the way we sort of do things in in Washington and elsewhere uh, the term yeah 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 in Washington is is tantamount to uh, I'm with you I'm on board. You got my vote. You need to say no more. I got your back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and immediately you can shift gears in a conversation and move to the next subject. You know, the, the thing we got to do is, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Now the next thing is, and because time is money. In Indian country, that is one of the most offensive things one can do, to not listen to one express their thought entirely. So often tribal meetings are scheduled and then go much longer. And it is a, it is a sign of respect to not interrupt. Um, it's a cultural mannerism in, in the Eastern United States to interrupt. Uh, it is a cultural mannerism in Indian country not to. And that's often something that one never, one, one never sees. Uh, smiling and nodding isn't always necessarily a good sign. I, I've talked with a number of companies who've come out and said, well, how did your meeting with the tribal council go? Oh, it was great. They didn't have a single question. They smiled and nodded the entire time. And I thought, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, we got work to do. Uh, uh, Indian country, even our meetings w in the federal government with tribal governments begin with a prayer. Uh, and often their prayers that express uh, uh, care for our loved ones who are not there, 
uh, asking the Creator to bless those that have come so far, to uh, take us out of our, our, away from our worries and uh, allow us to, ex uh, to uh, be of one mind and share one's thoughts um, uh, carefully and uh, earnestly, honestly. Um, there are, uh, this, this concept of elder also is, is very important. Um, nationally in the United States, uh, as a cultural mannerism, we really celebrate youth. We celebrate youth a lot. I mean, we put cream on our face and, and dye our hair and go on diets and things because we want to remain youth, young. I, I've noticed a few gray hairs since we started this office, but um, in Indian country it is really age and age is what is revered more than youth. Um, age is so often, even informally, in meetings with tribes, a meeting will start and you can almost see without noticing how quickly a survey of those tribal leaders in the room, they'll identify the one who's the most senior by being the one who's the oldest among different, even from different nations. Um, and just so you know, I, I start out by saying these are very, very different tribes. By my mother, I am Omaha and Muscogee Creek. That's like being Finnish and Peruvian in the same family. So there are very strong differences. There are sometimes there are regional uh, similarities, sometimes there are regional complexities. One must not assume that all of Indian country is on the same page. Uh, if we were, none of this would be here. Uh, and there would be, and sometimes there are age-old uh, divisiveness. There's the age-old distrust in and among tribes themselves. So if you're going in to meet with one tribe, don't assume that anything that worked with the other is going to be the same. You're getting a fresh start. You're having a fresh opportunity. I think if any one of us had an opportunity to talk directly to the leadership of a country in South America or elsewhere where you could negotiate everything from the beginning, uh, we'd just be on the next jet down there to meet with them. Well, that's the opportunity you have with tribes as well. But because we weren't taught some of these things in our educations, we, we sort of start from a real a lack of understanding. Uh, as far as gifting, yes, it is a, it is a tradition among tribes to give uh, small gifts. It's, um, it's like, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a cultural mannerism that comes from um, an environment where trade was very, very important. Um, eating, sometimes I would suggest that if you are going to have a meeting, you uh, suggest a meal. Having eating together is like shaking hands in Indian country. It's a very important thing to, to share a meal. Uh, and it comes from a time when, you know, you couldn't go down to the corner store and always, um, you know, pick up food. Uh, but that having been said, I think that you'll find that uh, with uh, the generation of tribal leaders who are, who are now in office and with the generation that's transitioning, my generation is transitioning into tribal leadership, there is a higher and higher level of professionalism and a higher and higher level of ability. There are a number of tribes that are in um, a very, very difficult place. I mentioned that 78% unemployment and are looking to develop relationships and really aren't looking to one-offs. Tribes don't tend to see the outside world that way. They tend to see people that come and go as being, you know, that's, that's not of great value to either you or them but those who want to build a relationship and to which you plug your issues. That, that, that is really the more successful uh, process with the vast majority of these native nations. So, uh, and, and Anne Marie has absolutely been uh, uh, embraced, as has Stephen, uh, who's been named also as well on the North Plains. It is, a, uh, it is a place that a little bit of effort goes a very long way, you'll find. Um, and we look forward to being a resource to you. So uh, I'm, I'm yours for any questions. I have a, a couple things I wanted to, yeah, real specific things that, that um, Jeff and Emery talked about. When engaging with the tribes, when meeting with the tribes, it's a matter of respect. They want to be acknowledged as, as real people, which they are. Um, and recognizing that one of the common mistakes that I, s there, there are two big mistakes that, that derail engaging the tribes. One is when somebody calls up a tribe and says, my client wants to move this project forward, can you review it this afternoon? Because they've, they've had it for a week. That's, that's not the right way to approach it. It's not the right way to approach a SHPO either. Um, 
but really is the wrong way to start your relationship with a tribe by, by calling up and saying, I need this done right away. It's important. Um, the other thing is that being curt in emails or in phone calls, these are very proud people, as most people are, whether they're tribal or not. And having a junior staffer with with no real experience call up and say I, I need you to do this right away um, is not the right way to engage yourself to to any organization especially a tribe so when you're arranging your work uh, flow it might be best while you may have a junior staffer doing a lot of the legwork and the data gathering putting together the form 620s and 621s when it comes to directly contacting a tribe because you're doing a project on on private land within a, tri a tribal boundary or near a tribal um, piece of property or in an area that's sensitive to the tribes, have that contact be at a higher level in your organization. And if you need to, to ask Emery or I to, to help you with that, let us know. Emery especially, because Emery talks to, to tribal people every day, has a lot of um, different, different phone numbers that you all don't have, and we have different ways of talking to people. Um, Amory is so well liked that the people will call her up and just just talk for a while and share new babies and marriages and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we've gone out, of, it's not a matter of going out of her way, but we've, we've worked real hard to facilitate those kinds of relationships. And, and in many respects, we do that on your behalf. And so we are asking you on, on our behalf not to, to mess those relationships up because it's hard, it's hard work to go back and try to undo um, that semi-broken or broken relationship. And if you do make a mistake, apologize immediately. I have made so many mistakes. Everything Amory does is the school of hard knocks. And uh, you just immediately apologize. For example, I was at a meeting uh, last year and we were visiting various nations um, on one day of the meeting and we went to one nation and I had my son with me 17 last year and he bought a roach one of those uh, they're usually porcupine or horse quill a porcupine quill or horse hair that, you, that they wear as part of their dance regalia and he, he bought it for my husband for, for his dad and um, he said do you think dad would like this and I said it's really cool looking so we purchased it and we went down and somebody said to him oh what is that and it was everybody there was um, Native American and he was showing it and then one of the Native Americans put it on my son's head well apparently that particular roach is only used for very very sacred ceremonies I should have known better I shouldn't have had this teenager you know running around with it uh, and he had it on and the tribal leader came in and uh, my son is adopted from Russia he's white as snow blonde hair uh, did not look native at all and they just see and they, they were calling him pale face that because they, they everybody liked him they were teasing him so they see my son with this bleach bleach blonde hair wearing a very sacred object and that greatly greatly upset the leader and I, I could see it and then he went to um, a, a Clinket Indian and said you know wh what are those two doing and then she came over to me and said what are you doing and I was just mortified and so I went over to him and he, he was sitting eating and I knelt on the ground in front of him I knew this wasn't just gonna be a, oh I'm sorry I mean what what I, I should have been thinking but I was so focused on the food they had that squash soup that I love and you know and I was just trying to get my lunch they had a big buffet and and so I knelt by him and I totally explained what had happened how you know I wasn't thinking it was my fault how my son meant no harm and he looked at me and he said join me at the table which I didn't want to do my platter was <laughs> across the room but I did and I didn't eat that day and I just sat and talked to him and got to know him and now now we're friends but the minute you make a mistake another time an elder uh, from the Hualapai tribe uh, was dancing doing the opening prayer and he dropped his prayer rattle I was the closest to him somebody dropped something you know you're sitting right there I was and he's old I was, I was picked it up I just was about to pick it up and thank God a Native American friend was looking out for me and grabbed my shoulder and just threw me back before I touched this because in that culture he has to pick it up himself or bad things might happen and you know I would have done a very very bad thing here I am thinking oh aren't I being helpful you know I'm from the federal government I'm here to help you <laughs> you know so 
I, I've learned to to step back um, and and watch. I, I once entered a room, and they said, "Oh, we're going to have the the uh, prayer circle outside." I, it should have dawned on me, prayer circle. I didn't notice there was even a circle painted on the ground. How I missed all these cues, I don't know. And I almost walked right into that prayer circle. And thank God, again, someone you know saw me and grabbed me just as my foot. I literally fell backwards into their arms because I, I almost you know stepped into the circle. And that would have been a very bad thing. So if you're having a meeting with tribes, take a present. I always take um, pretzels because in Gettysburg, we have a Gettysburg pretzel factory. And a friend of mine owns it. And he's an FCC employee. So it's something that is, it's, it's, it's a small token and they're great beer pretzels, they love it. If you're from Virginia, take Virginia peanuts, that type of thing, and, and you know, you share your, where you're from with them. Um, if you're serving a meal, invite the elders to eat first. Always, always, always um, start out with a prayer because uh, you know, every tribe is different. All 565 nations have their own ways of doing things, but pretty much universally, they want to start a meeting with prayer so that your minds can join as one. Is that how they say it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So just just a few little tips so you don't make the mistakes that I've made over the years. And if you do make a mistake, apologize. You know, that, that may sound, that's funny. That may sound trite as well, to uh, take a small gift. But that's what that's what tribes do. When, when I was working at Chickasaw Nation Industries, we, we uh, had a sister company that had a chocolate factory, and we took chocolates to meetings. People love I mean, it was, I mean, it was a great way to break, but it was also in keeping with a small traditional mannerism that, that I'm sure there were other things that we missed because we weren't of their tribe, but we started the right way, and they knew that we were, you know, coming with an open hand. Um, I, I think also maybe one thing I should say, I'm reminded in, in some of what Stephen had just said, um, some of the differences between uh, the states and the tribes, the, the, the different people that are involved in, in, in the chain of what goes on in tribal historic cultural preservation. Um, not in many, many tribes, uh, somebody can't just be hired to do this work in a tribe. Sometimes you have to be from a certain clan. Sometimes there are hereditary responsibilities. Uh, I have responsibilities in the clan, my mother's tribe, uh, and I wouldn't be able to do things that were the responsibility of another clan. In other tribes, they're, they're, their interests are, uh, for certain parts of the United States are much more archaeological. But if something is found, then it may shift to an, an entirely different part of the tribe. It may shift to clan mothers within the tribe and not the tribal leaders. It may be the responsibility of a particular clan depending on what it is or where it is. So there may be complexity that you will never know, that we will never know about. Um, I'm reminded of a case uh, several years ago of a tower that was constructed prior to any environmental review. And if there was ever a case where, oh man, talk about the wrong place to build. It was the exact wrong, the wrong place. And we, um, we know that now. We didn't know that then. We were being told, we were being sent messages by the tribe and they would come at particular times of the year and they came from different governmental administrations of the tribe and believe me, that political level is also something that comes into play in Indian country. Just as we have political issues in our United States, Native nations do as well. But on subsequent years, we would get contact from this tribe, and then it, and then it, then it became a real issue. So um, Steve's predecessor and I went out to meet with them, and we were very sensitive to the fact that we, we, you know, we, didn't, we weren't going to take notes. We, we, we just needed to be sit, we, we needed to be convinced just with an element of, of convinced. And as we went in to meet with the governors and the lieutenant governors and the war chiefs and this entire cabinet assembled, um, there was one young man that looked like he didn't really belong there. He wasn't an elder. He was sort of pimply faced and young. But when it came time to convince us, he was the one who was asked by the governors and the war chief. The war chief is kind of a Secretary of State for several purposes and protecting shrines and things to stand and and voice the 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 position of the tribe and he was so close to coming he was he was they had discussed for so long how close he could come to violating a a religious tenet something that was so taboo that as he started to 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 speak his chin quivered and he, and, he, and he started weeping. He broke into tears. And we said, all right, l let's stop and take a break because I think we're getting close to something that we don't necessarily want on the record. We want to be very careful here. So um, 
in many many instances that's not the case but you're dealing in a realm where that there's that potential and that heightened sensitivity among the tribes is something that a little bit of forethought a little bit of of uh, understanding I think it's a great idea to read as much as you can get your hands on um, and if your questions in that regard let us know um, um, but a little bit can go a long way in that regard so um, for certain tribes uh, the, the 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 head of the cultural preservation office is there but the genuine cultural historical knowledge is in particular staff members because they're the ones who are the clan members or they're the ones that have the traditional obligation um, it is also a fundamental truth that in many cultural offices because they are um, tradition keepers uh, you know pipe keepers fire keepers clan mothers fathers responsible you know responsible for certain areas if there is something that happens that 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 harms the cultural belief system like a a, an accidental death uh, things shut down uh, the same thing happens in our office if there's a, a loss of life that is accidental it, it, it can really um, you, re you really want to give them the time to to put that thi put things back in order so um, back to you Steve okay. um, we have time for a few more questions for a few questions we don't have too many um, because I'm trying to, to sort of keep us on track um, down in the front In a group like this, I don't suppose there's too many that don't really wouldn't appreciate the opportunity to learn the cultural aspects of any tribe. Um, I, I find that uh, you're you know you're talking about just instances of you know oh shouldn't have done this shouldn't have done that compared to basically coming from a whole different culture and dealing with a whole nother culture you're just a little bit in the overlap area uh, the the main uh, you know issue I've come across most recently is uh, having you know wrapping it all together if you want to put a site in you need a service agreement and a service agreement comes from another area of the carrier company that isn't you know um, easy or it's not you know it's not a traditional thing for the people in construction and real estate to um, come up with a service agreement and and I understand that these things actually come back here to Washington uh, and I'm maybe you could give me some insight into uh, you know it, and in essence what I'm saying it's 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 I, my experience is it's not a problem with the tribe it's a problem with the client <laughs> Yeah. Okay, there's part of that I'm not going to comment on. Yeah. But <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just say one thing in that regard. I mean, the, the, this audience is, uh, we're really glad we're doing this today, but this audience is primarily concerned or consists of archaeologists, historians, a fair number of attorneys, people that represent um, some trade associations and um, nationwide carriers, um, headquarters staff. One of the people, one of the groups of people we we're really trying to, to get at here, maybe we'll just have to do a different kind of outreach, are the people that actually do the tower siting process that work directly with the local governments, local tribes, in trying to locate, identify the sites and go through the local permitting process. So um, it, it's a big education process and we're starting that. Are there any other you know, let me let me react to that. I, I think one of the things the office was created, our, our it was created to develop and drive a, 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 a commission-wide agenda on native issues, and that that's sort of what the national broadband plan and our, our implementing order says. Uh, in reality, what that means is we're trying to open up as many opportunities as possible for as many different services and business models as possible. To, to get service into these areas that um, sort of the typical modeling doesn't doesn't result in service so um, for instance I've talked with one tribe who said I, I wonder why they went to this fee land it's probably because they just wanted to get it up as soon as possible um, uh, by our count 75 percent of their consumers are going to be tribal and we know where there would be opportunities to build and we'd be willing to back them over at the Bureau of Indian Affairs and push hard for this construction 
uh, if they would be interested in talking with us about where to site the tower. This is the first we've heard of it. And so sometimes we sort of have to, uh, you know, things slow down then. Uh, when, but in, in basic terms, yes, we work on a government-to-government -government basis with tribes. And I think that as these rules begin to uh, develop and are implemented, that the different industries will see more opportunities. Um, I have been surprised in certain instances that there haven't been certain carriers that have stepped us up to say, okay, we'll be the, we'll be the service provider of Indian country. But there is complexity to that, that there is a depth of complexity. It's not just geography or poverty. There are a number of issues associated with it. We have time for one more question. There was somebody. Oh, okay. Over there. Um, one of my questions has been, how do we address or how do you suggest we address responses from tribes, particularly lately, multiple tribes have been talking about colony collapse disorder about the honeybees these concerns that are not necessarily tribal lands or uh, specific prayer places, but we're getting a lot of tribes that are asking, we are concerned about colony collapse disorder and how radio frequency and towers have to do with that. How do you suggest we reply? Yeah, that's a good question. I wish we knew the answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one of the I, things. I, I, I yep. think we we just need to take that one as a good question. Well, no, I I well, I also geared towards being helpful. The the um, one of the things we have open, one of the things we worked with the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau on is a notice of inquiry, a broad based notice of inquiry. Uh, that yesterday actually was the uh, the the first round of comments were due. Uh, the the Office of Native Affairs and Policy worked with all the other bureaus to initiate proceedings and for issues that we didn't think were yet ripe for rulemaking we created the, the chairman chairman Janikowski liked to refer to it as an omnibus notice of inquiry on all sorts of different native issues and and one section is uh, cultural preservation and tower siting and it would be valuable to have a discussion I, I think it would be a valuable use of our time to to learn more about this and maybe get this into the record so that we can we can take it into account formally um, I can see how a number of tribes, particularly in certain parts of the United States, would find that uh, culturally uh, directly related to their values. Sure. We do have yeah. some write-ups also. I know uh, when I, I deal with the Haudenosaunee, a lot of people uh, still call them the Iroquois, um, those six nations that form the Haudenosaunee, they're very interested in honeybees and in um, uh, radio frequency and we have some write-ups already from the FCC and statistics and um, if you just call 1-888-CALL-FCC and just just say a few key words uh, the call center that's the number for the FCC call center um, they'll send you a printout they can fax it to you email it to you and they can tell you some of the answers because we've seen this before with um, Freedom of Information Act requests and even uh, more so with congressional inquiries a so lot of people will send in. Yeah, and I think it's important. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about, because I raised the, the point of non-Indian uh, fee land within a reservation, we've talked about a lot about tribal lands. Uh, you know, the tribal interests are, are intense throughout the United States. I mean, there are certain places that were so native in nature and tribes are so far from them now, one need only look at the names of the states. Uh, there was one state that was such rich soil and hunting, we just called it Indiana. There are no tribes left in Indiana. So um, for the Chickasaws, also, um, for certain tribes, their, their, their view of 106 is, is complex. It can be many different things. The Chickasaw homeland was between the modern cities of Memphis and Vicksburg, and they controlled several hundred miles of the Mississippi. And during removal, it, it wasn't like... Um, dances with wolves. It was much more like Bosnia-Herzegovina. We, my father's people moved out of stick-built homes with, with uh, you know, picket fences to, to forcibly remove to Oklahoma. So, so the, the, the cultural and historic interest can be quite varied in nature. Everything from places where sacred objects grow to places that are, um, you know, 19th century homes. Um, and that's very, very different from tribe to tribe. Uh, and that reminds me, there w is a, I have to be careful here to not um, 
after I worked at the commission, there was another agency that sh shall go unnamed that um, approached us about a approached me about a, an issue they were having with the tribe and an undertaking that was um, on a prominent mountaintop. Um, and often, I, I'm not a specialist in spectrum propagation, but in certain parts of the West, it's amazing where some of the towers and some of the mountain peaks, you know, almost a one-to-one -one ratio in many places between sacred sites and the best place to broadcast or have a tower. Um, a commercial mobile radio tower. In this particular instance, um, the, the, the agency itself got involved in the 106 process. It wasn't something that the industry was as involved in. But the tribe was expressing the concern around a particular part of the mountaintop and the cultural resources that were there. And the agency, in a stroke of, of, of genius that came from within its, within its, uh, within its institution, uh, proposed to the tribe that it enlarge its, uh, its uh, area to include all of the sacred, the areas of sacred concern and to make it part of the, I think, 100-year leasehold so that while this one particular corner of the property was going to be impacted by the undertaking, the rest of the property would be protected under federal, under federal process so that there would be no other interest that could come in and, and harm it. And it was a lengthy process and discussion with the tribe, but the last time I heard about it, it that it was in process, that the tribe found that to be something that they could work together on, that there was a recognition of their value system, and that ultimately their concern was protection of more than just this one little area, but the entire area that was being impacted. And the agency had come up with a, a solution to that. Um, so I do think there are ways in which developing the reservation, thinking about this more than just from sort of the cut and dry 106 process may, may behoove you. I think we, we need to, to take a break there. Um, you all have been very, very patient, sitting very still. Uh, I'm impressed. Um, we're running a little late. It, it's take a lunch break. I had originally scheduled 45 minutes for a lunch break, simply because the logistics is going up to the upper floor and out to the courtyard. We still can do that. I'd encourage you to, to be as efficient as you can and try to get back here. It's five minutes to one by the clock in the back of the room by 1.30 so that we can, can continue. Um, Blythe Zimmer from the Advisory Council will be the first presenter um, th right after our lunch break. And we'll go through there. And thank you all. Our next presentation is uh, Blythe Zimmer with the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Um, before Blythe took on her training duties at the Advisory Council, she was the um, individual at the Advisory Council who worked on FCC issues. So she and I worked together um, on a, a fair number of, of difficult tower projects and, and a few easy ones too. Those are always much more fun. And um, now that Blythe has an executive position with the Advisory Council, uh, that role is filled, the liaison is filled now by Guy Lopez. Guy, did you come back? There, okay. Guy Lopez is, is now the advisory council staff member who um, sends me nasty letters when, when you guys screw up. <laughs> and hopefully that, after today, that's never going to happen again, right? Um, so with that, um, let me turn it over to Blythe to, to talk about the advisory council of historic preservation. Remember, that's one of those, those creatures that was created by the National Historic Preservation Act. And um, uh, Blythe? Thanks, Steve. Um, for whatever reason, the FCC's laptop rejected my PowerPoint today, so I'm going to save you all from looking at a screen again for at least just a few minutes, so bear with me here. Um, <clears throat> anyway, as, as Steve said, I was the FCC staff reviewer at the ACHP for about three years. Um, so though I am not your current like main point of contact, I'm glad we've pointed out Guy Lopez so you know who you can get in touch with with questions at ACHP. Um, this, is, this was a part of my world, my work world, and I guess still continues to be in many ways. Um, I wanted to talk to you all just quickly today with a few observations on a couple of things. First, our role, you know, 
what does the advisory council do in the nationwide programmatic agreement and why would you care about that um, also then a little bit about this process of uh, negotiating minimization and mitigation measures and developing agreement documents and you know some sort of things that we have seen that might be useful to you and I will close with just a quick word about the program comment that was mentioned earlier since that was something the ACHP actually issued um, that has bearing on your work um, the Advisory Council, is, as Steve uh, related this morning, of course is created by the National Historic Preservation Act. We're an independent federal agency. We issue the regulations that uh, implement Section 106 of NHPA. Um, of course, for a lot of your work with the FCC's telecom and tower undertakings, those regulations were modified some, or how they're applied to these undertakings was modified somewhat through the vehicle of the nationwide programmatic agreements, but the intent and spirit of those regulations is still there. Um, from a practical standpoint, the ACHP, of course, was one of the signatories to those nationwide PAs, and so we participate along with the other signatories um, in annual reviews and in monitoring kind of the overall scope of how those uh, nationwide PAs are implemented. Um, what we have seen, the, the, the NPA process, it sets up for Section 106 review and the Forms 620 and 621 um, have been successful at increasing the, the consistency of Section 106 reviews um, and Section 106 compliance for FCC uh, undertakings across the country. Um, the forms were really innovative, the two standardized forms, as they were the first uh, approved by the Office of Management and Budget for, federal, for the Federal Historic Preservation Program as a whole. Um, we occasionally still hear some gripes from SHPOs and others about um, the forms, but we consistently support their use. And we also wouldn't ever consider an adverse effect notification that comes to us complete unless it also includes a complete um, with all the attachments, Form 620 or Form 621. So we are users of those uh, pieces of documentation as well. Um, one observation, applicants, you all have to provide what those forms require, as we were talking about um, other standards, that's a minimum. Um, but there's <laughs> nothing in the NPA that says you can't go a little bit beyond that. Um, so, you know, some examples of that might be, as we heard from the State Historic Preservation Officers this morning, in terms of ways of reaching out to consulting parties who may have an interest in, um, in the tower that you're planning for. Um, also, ways of providing additional documentation, say, <laughs> about um, the analysis of effects. You know, there's nothing in the Form 620 that says include pictures from your balloon test, but of course that can be a very useful tool. So. Um, Consider that, use your judgment, um, and think about what's appropriate for the circumstances that you're working in and the likely challenges that you could face in your Section 106 review if you found yourself then in a point of um, looking at, uh, at adverse effects and negotiating a resolution to those adverse effects. Um, one other thing just to keep in mind is that uh, FCC is ultimately the arbiter about any questions about level of effort when it comes to the information you need to provide in, um, in the NPA process. So if you have a question about do I need to do this or that, then we would also be looking to FCC to, to shed light on that as they interpret their agreement. Um, ACHP is notified in that NPA process of all adverse effects and at that point we elect to participate or not in the process of resolving adverse effects and negotiating an MOA. Um, you can provide that documentation to us in PDF form if you want to. We're also one of those agencies that needs a hard copy for our files, so if you are willing to um, send that in hard copy, it's much appreciated, or on a CD or something that we can use um, to, uh, to hang on to it. Um, please wait, then, for the letter informing you about whether or not we're going to participate in consultation. That will be um, returned we have to respond within 15 days of receipt of a completely documented notif notice of adverse effect. Um, we don't participate very often in Section 106 reviews. 
um, uh, excuse me, in the development of FCC MOAs. Um, but when we do, it's usually because of sticky issues related to visual effects on historic properties or because there's a lot of strong public and consulting party interest in that. Those are often the triggers. Um, sometimes it can be because uh, of issues that concern um, properties of significance to Indian tribes or Native Hawaiian organizations. We apply our Appendix A criteria to make that decision, but those are usually the things um, that seem to come up with FCC MOAs. Um, we're often contacted by members of the public, tribes, preservation organizations, um, and others with concerns about telecom towers um, and whether or how they're subject to Section 106 review or to Federal Historic Preservation Reviews. This is oftentimes how we get the calls is, you know, I see something happening or I've heard about something that might be happening in my community. Is it or isn't it? Or, you know, how do I access that process? Um, part of our role is to help ensure the involvement of tribes, of other consulting parties, other individuals and organizations, as we heard about this morning, who may take an interest in what's going on. Um, in keeping with the overall purposes of Section 106 is a consultative process. Um, early involvement of those consulting parties helps facilitate better outcomes. Um, I'm reiterating something I know you've heard before. Um, but this is particularly important in the case of tribes um, because of that key role that they play given their special expertise in knowing where properties of significance to them are located. They have got to be involved in your identification effort. Um, if we get those questions about, you know, what is it, where is it, what's the status of this review, we do involve the FCC Federal Preservation Officer in responding and getting an agency perspective on the issue. So um, there is frequent and regular communication, I think, between our office and Steve. Um, any concerns about whether a tower was constructed prior to or absent completion of a Section 106 review, we get those questions occasionally too, are questions for FCC to answer pursuant to stipulation 10 of the NPA. Um, so that has to be addressed before any kind of review can move forward and that's something definitely where we would be referring the question to Steve and the others at FCC. Um, in terms of negotiating minimization and mitigation measures, that process that's at the core of step four of the section 106 review process, resolving adverse effects, um, and is, is still there present in its uh, in, in, that, in the spirit of that in the NPA process um, is, uh, is all about considering alternatives. At this point, the FCC does get involved at a certain level, but applicants still do a lot of work, particularly as part of putting together the mitigation plan. Of course, that, you know, mitigation ideas that you would be providing to us along with um, a notice of adverse effect. Um, so this part of Section 106 um, and the intent of, of the regulations and of the NPA is about considering alternatives. Um, one note here, just as far as timing and coordination, is that it's important to coordinate the Section 106 review with local administrative and zoning proposals. I think we've heard about that in a couple of contexts. First, because it gives you a great opportunity to conduct public <coughs> outreach so that you can also reference how you're um, looking at effects to historic properties in another venue that gives you access to the community to get the word out about what's planned. Um, it also is a timing and a planning efficiency question, making sure that you think through those two processes and how, the vi how they need to move together um, on parallel tracks so that you don't get one way out in front of the other and you know potentially have locked in some sort of a decision um, related to local zoning that would then, you know, cause you to go back and retrace your steps if modification of the tower, siting or design or something like that came um, to the fore through the process of resolving um, adverse effects. So think about the sequencing of those two so that they work in tandem rather than uh, limiting your options one way or the other. Um, involve consulting parties in the public in developing treatment measures. Um, if your effort to notify and involve the public uh, and consulting parties has been the bare minimum, this is the point where they're going to call us. Um, you know, they're going to ask for our help then, and they might also be contacting 
the State Historic Preservation Office, either one, about trying to help them facilitate their involvement. How do I get involved? I've got concerns. And it's a lot easier to start that conversation if the tower applicant has been the person or the body to reach out and they can you know find out about things that way rather than feeling like this has already gone way down the pike and I've not had an opportunity to provide input so that's where that can be um, can be a good move and encourage reasons why involving consulting parties early can be to your advantage in the planning process um, know that consultation is not a private conversation between the applicant and the SHPO or TIPO SHPOs play a very key role in the provisions of the nationwide PAs, but they are not the only player. There are other parties who have a right to come sit around the table and talk about it. Um, it's also not a clearance process. You know, the SHPO told me to, so therefore, you know, or said this was okay. Um, and then that kind of is the end of the story. Other federal agencies we've alluded to, such as um, the American Battlefield Protection Program, um, a national park unit. Um, the National Historic Landmarks Program also housed within Interior in NPS, if you're adversely affecting a National Historic Landmark, may have a role in consultation. So think about those um, situations where uh, you might have another agency that comes to the table with knowledge or concerns. Um, tribes and Native Hawaiian or organizations, of course, we've um, discussed already but have a role because they in particular can speak to how properties of significance to them may be affected um, you know more or less by any given tower proposal their expertise is very important um, consider local preservation plans and goals um, as you consider measures to uh, to resolve adverse effects um, and, and when I'm talking about all those different treatment measures or measures to resolve, measures to avoid, minimize, or mitigate, you know, that can, can encompass a great range of things from modifications to design, providing visual screening, um, documentation, be it something like data recovery or historic building documentation, interpretive materials, restoration projects, studies, syntheses of of um, related information. There's a range of, of uh, possible things that can be done um, to resolve adverse effects, but good mitigation is always, as, as we like to say, uh, appropriate and in the public interest. Um, you're doing something that will then benefit the community that values the historic property that's affected by what the federal agency is ultimately licensing. Um, Telecommunications towers often have effects on historic districts. Um, and in, in my view, I think it's especially appropriate to consider how the community has defined its own historic preservation goals in those instances, you know, particularly because you're affecting um, something that's a community-based resource. Um, questions there, just you know, tips you also heard from the SHPOs. Have you involved a local historic preservation commission if there is one in that town? Um, is there a state historic preservation plan goal that might relate to um, the situation that you're working in that could be a platform for then developing mitigation measures? Um, one thing that we see sometimes in FCC uh, mitigation plans or MOA drafts um, is, is the idea of providing funding or support for preservation projects, and that can certainly be appropriate mitigation. However, caution, clearly describe a preservation project in, in the MOA draft. You want to make sure that um, the relationship between whatever is going to be funded or supported and the undertaking is clear. Um, if, if you can't nail it down at this stage in the process, setting up a process to develop a scope of work and agree on that is another way to get there. Um, stipulations that just name a dollar amount and are vague about the purpose um, should not be included because they could be misinterpreted by a member of the public as a fine, and there are no fines in the Section 106 um, process in, in that sense. So uh, MOAs can be developed that include those types of creative mitigation measures. Just make sure you avoid confusion about the nexus to your project. What, how is this um, related to uh, to what's going on to the effects from from the tower that you're planning 
And here's just a question, but show of hands, how many of you all have written or drafted all or part of an MOA before? Yay, lots of them. All right. Now, the follow-up question. How many of you all, when you went to that task, pulled out an old one and started working from that? Okay, there's some honest folks in the room. We've all done it. We've all done it. You know, kind of like the cut and paste approach to drafting an MOA. But here's my, my message on that, is be creative. Um, just because you used one type of mitigation on your last project, that does not necessarily mean it's the best type of mitigation for your current project. All of this is situational. It's certainly nice to start working, you know, if you have good models and the SHPO says, we, you know, we think this would be a good idea and here's how it has been written into a past MOA, by all means use it. But don't get locked into this, you know, this situation that, oh, we're having a visual effect, we're gonna do this kind of, you know, we're gonna prepare a National Register nomination. That might be the right decision. It might also be, um, you know, there might be something else that's more appropriate for that situation. So um, focus on context sensitive mitigation that can really enhance the historic properties that are being affected by your project and their settings. Enough said. In terms of developing memoranda of agreement, of writing the agreement documents themselves and drafting stipulations, um, first of all, I'll say it again, remember the requirement to notify the ACHP. Want to make sure that part of your record is clear um, in, the, in the event that you're going to have an adverse effect. Um, FCC applicants certainly get an assist from the FCC in terms of writing MOAs, but good drafting and clarity um, can be well worth it in the process of, uh, of good consultation um, and, and getting a better initial draft together. A um, couple of things about better agreement documents just to keep in mind. Um, agreements consist of, of essentially uh, the same, you know, they're always roughly the same format with the same sections. They begin um, after the title, of course, with a preamble. That's a series of recitals, the whereas clauses, um, that record the essential history of the consultation, including who participated, what the affected historic properties are. Um, it would certainly need to identify, you know, that this is an action related to an FCC license that is the federal connection, um, and also probably tell us how the public was involved and offered an opportunity to provide input, anything else that's relevant to kind of tracing the history of how you got there. Stipulations then are the who, what, and when. This is the to-do list that um, establishes commitments that FCC ultimately is responsible for because they're the ones who are going to sign on saying FCC shall ensure that the following um, measures are implemented. Um, but they always begin with that affirmative statement, you know, FCC shall ensure the following measures will be carried out. And they need to be written in active voice to be effective. Um, this is a to-do list, it's governing project implementation, it needs to clearly identify who's responsible for doing anything, when it's going to get started, when it's going to be completed, and it should be written in such a way that if you handed this to a cold reader, they wouldn't have a lot of uh, difficulty in determining, you know, would they be able to pick that up and read the paragraph and then say, I will know when that task is complete. You know, is there enough information there that it would be clear to somebody to know whether or not that obligation had been fulfilled. Um, so allow adequate time in your time frames and in your duration for any potential delays. We've all encountered something unexpected in putting a project together, so make sure you've got enough time for that. Um, and just be as specific and clear, simple and plain language as you possibly can be. That often makes for an easier road of implementing it, particularly if somebody comes along after you who's responsible for carrying out some of those uh, stipulations that didn't have the intimate knowledge of the whole consultation conversation. And finally, signatures, any party that's assigned a responsibility um, under the agreement should be an invited signatory. Keep that in mind if you're working with local preservation organizations or other groups who might take on a role in carrying out some of the stipulations. Um, a final note that Steve asked me to say a couple of words about is the um, ACHP program comment for RUS, NTIA, and FEMA um, telecommunications facilities. Um, which uh, happened in 2009 in response to a large volume of Section 106 reviews 
resulting from uh, Recovery Act funded programs and mandates. Um, the effort began, uh, was initiated by RUS and NTIA, who requested that we issue a program comment um, related to their review responsibilities when an FCC licensed tower is part of a larger RUS or NTIA assisted project. Um, FEMA also asked that its assistance for emergency telecommunications facilities be added to the program comment before it was issued by the ACHP. So that's how we have those three agencies um, involved in this. Program comments are one of the program alternatives um, that's available through our regulations and they allow the ACHP to comment on a federal program or class of undertakings rather than on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, in this instance, the program comment focused on coordination of Section 106 reviews when FCC and another agency have review responsibilities for the same telecommunications facility. Um, the program comment relieves RUS, NTIA, and FEMA of the need to conduct duplicate Section 106 reviews when those agencies assist um, telecom projects also subject to review under the NPAs, uh, the NPA and the co-location agreement. It's very simple. RUS, NTIA, or FEMA do not need to duplicate the Section 106 review for a tower construction or modification undertaking that, and this is the legalese, has undergone, will undergo, or is exempt from review under the FCC NPAs. Um, beyond that, how the agencies coordinate their reviews is up to them. Um, you know, I would think from a practical standpoint, it might be somewhat easier to implement um, if the FCC review is being concluded on the, on the front end of um, that overall project planning. I think we'll hear more from the agencies this afternoon. Um, the program comment has no effect at all on the FCC nationwide programmatic agreements. It doesn't change them or do anything to them. It also does not allow those agencies to quote unquote use the FCC NPAs for any other aspect of their undertakings. They remain responsible for 36 CFR Part 800 just like any other federal agency is for their undertakings. Um, note that the SHPO or TIPO has to be notified. Um, in those instances by RUS, NTIA, or FEMA when they're using the program comment. Other than that, thank you all for coming. It's really exciting to see this many folks interested in, and thank you to FCC for organizing this and allowing us to be a part of it. I'm really glad that you were able to, to participate. I think the message that you give is something we'd like to reinforce, which is that You've heard a lot of us talk today about our process and including the public, tribes, SHPOs, all those folks. So it really is a public process you're engaged in. I think that's a good message to take away from you. This is not, not something you're doing in isolation. It's something you're doing with, with a lot of uh, people. And sometimes that's a challenge, um, but uh, that's the nature of, of the project. Um, do I have any questions for, for Blythe? Oh, we have the, have the after lunch slumbers. <laughs> right after lunch. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> well, what can I say? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was hard to juggle the schedule around. Um, any, any thoughts for, for Blythe? Okay, okay. Um, why don't we take a, a, a brief stretch, but don't leave the room. Don't leave your chairs. Um, because with Blythe's uh, presentation talking about their role in the Section 106 process, I want to transition then to um, Don Johnson. Are you going to be joined by Irene as well? Yeah, I, Irene Griffith. Um, Don, a lot of you talk to all day long and, and interact with. Irene is actually going to be a, a new person for you all to, to, to meet, although you all work with her. Irene is the person who is the, actually, the only person at the commission, if you're doing an EA, you have to interact with, with Irene. And because um, Irene's the one that does all the, note, the EA reviews, making sure that all the pieces are there, that the building permits are there, the SHPO letters are there, and puts them on public notice. So uh, why don't we transition? Thank you very much, Blythe, for, for coming over. Appreciate it very much. Uh, hey, it's my pleasure here today. 
See, I probably talked to a, f a bunch of you on the telephone. <clears throat> Hopefully you don't talk to me too often because usually when I'm involved, it's not a real pleasant situation a lot of times with towers. But at the same time, my uh, phone line's always open and uh, don't hesitate to call. Um, I think there, there's, a, there's some uh, misconceptions in, in, about <coughs> attorneys sometimes, <laughs> but uh, I'm, cer I'm certainly one to uh, uh, share my knowledge or in, in insight and, and help uh, anyone out. Um, so the, uh, I know that uh, um, everyone's kind of made my job sort of easy walking through everything today. Um, but uh, I guess at one point, I guess to be the hard guy. And that is, we, um, Steve's mentioned uh, about, you know, getting things right. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I guess I have to ask a question. Uh, um, so this group, how many know the difference between site licensing and geographic licensing? Oh, you, you, because in the next few years, you're going to have to know the difference. And you're going to have to know the difference right now. Because it's very, because we have geographic licensing, market licensing, classic national wireless, and all the main carriers that sell telephones. Um, everyone in this room is pretty familiar with that. We've done uh, MOAs together, et cetera. Um, but uh, it's also going to be a lot of build out in um, with public safety with uh, the uh, utility companies and a lot of sharing of infrastructure. Uh, every, that's everyone's about. Everyone wants to save money these days, and that's how you save money. Um, nevertheless, um, we have very divergent uh, groups of licensees. Uh, the, um, the same people that you can rely on for correct information and proper coordinates and where the check is, everything else at the at the uh, tower company or the uh, carrier is not the same when you're dealing with the San Joaquin County Sheriff or when you're dealing with the State Coordinating Committee or when you're dealing with someone from Duke, uh, uh, someone out in the field with, uh, with one of the ma big energy companies um, or what's uh, very, um, uh, uh, expansive th today is using communications in remote areas because of uh, natural gas and oil uh, that's uh, that's uh, uh, being uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, drilled for. Uh, anyway, um, and, and in that area, you've got not only the classic site acquisition people. <coughs> Turnkey contractors, dealers, etc., and uh, <coughs> although the um, licensees and tower owners are ultimately responsible with uh, the with uh, those uh, licensees that I mentioned, they don't build towers day in day out, years on end. They might build three or four towers, then stop, then get a grant and build some other towers. The folks who are here from uh, Laura, John, and, and Jill from uh, the various other agencies have had a Herculean task. Uh, we're working with the, with the grant uh, uh, programs over the past several years. Um, and um, and we, uh, we, because everything, you know, everything's usually FCC licensee related in some way and fashion, um, uh, are doing the, uh, are doing the, un the underside work. And 
the biggest problem makes makes it difficult for them improper information lack of information and we're not talking about historic preservation or stuff I'm talking about well we need to make sure this environmental assessment is through and by the way the coordinates are off a few hundred feet and we're supposed to get the grant from and money from NTIA three three days after that environmental assessment is granted and you said it was going to be granted two weeks from now so what do we do we go why didn't you tell us about this in the first place or why didn't you tell us about this several months ago um, or in, in short um, we are relying on you when it comes to the uh, to, to the those grantees to provide proper info uh, proper and correct information uh, and to our agency to their agency to coordinate with the uh, with those uh, uh, those licensees which have time frames that are unrelated to the historic preservation process you know, whether it be interference coordination uh, you know uh, 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 budget concerns you know, uh, we want you to interact with us but we also expect that if you're approaching a sensitive site and you have a licensee like the, like that, not a tower, major tower company or, or, or a carrier, that that yes, you should be on the phone and talk and call us and explain what's going on so we can assess it too, and also discuss it with our licensing people and our and uh, and uh, people like Irene, so we know uh, on the FAA. It helps no one hear about this way down in the process uh, and, and, and uh, we're all ultimately here so I like to say the, and the word public interest has been thrown around well the the uh, um, if you the what's happening especially in the the uh, um, with the grants and what's going on with uh, public safety is true is 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 truly in the public interest if you want to if you want to and uh, we all want to be a part of it it's not just what the guy in the field says it at one of the carriers so we want to so we, and uh, other than that I wanted to inter introduce uh, Irene and I know you've been on the uh, telephone with Irene and Irene and I have known each other for years and then we uh, sit in this uh, uh, next to each other in the office so we, if she's got a, if she uh, has a question she can holler at me but uh, and I'll, I'll give her and give her an answer and um, my number is 202 418 7444 just don't ask me to give you an email because I'm not going to do that because I'm an attorney <laughs> okay but I'll be more than happy to talk with you and uh, and, and talk with you and and as I've said I I have um, experience in the broadcast licensing area the the site licensing area and with the geographic licensing and uh, with the uh, and, and I was the point person setting up the um, on the legal side um, for the uniform licensing application system and uh, uh, both Irene and I knew the knew the uh, attorney who set up the tower registration system and I'm uh, he's uh, um, he um, I'm sure would be very surprised at what that's turned into after these years and um, and uh, before I uh, close and again it's been a pleasure I wanted to also um, uh, uh, thank someone who's not here and not he with a, uh, not uh, uh, with us any, uh, anymore, and that's uh, actually two fellows. Uh, one, uh, Frank Stillwell, who you know, was a lead uh, uh, attorney in this area for years, and uh, and also uh, 
Jerry Vaughn, uh, who was the deputy chief of the uh, Wireless Bureau, uh, and uh, he got everything off the ground, not, not only with the uh, electronic filing system for uh, applications, but also with the TCNS system, and then which uh, Steve uh, took, uh, uh, Steve, uh, a couple years later, um, you know, turned the uh, E106 system into, uh, you know, a, a, into a fantastic system that uh, uh, every, everyone runs here between the uh, uh, E106 and the uh, uh, TCNS system. But I am the low-tech guy, but I don't know how to use BlackBerry. I don't text. But the engineers, back in the 80s, engineers taught me how a cell, uh, cell telephone was set up. So, so I, and I used to look at seven by 14 maps of, cells, uh, of, uh, of cellular markets. So, so it, uh, um, anyway, that's, and did broadcasting and all that stuff. But uh, um, the uh, NEPA checklist that's on our website is uh, fantastic, and that's actually from Irene's over the years. And uh, so you definitely want to use that uh, always. Um, and it's about where I am. So um, I have to take off here in a couple minutes, but if there are any questions, I'll take them real quick. Very good. My pleasure. took my agenda away, Don. <laughs> I have no idea what to do next. I have nothing in writing. What would you, what would you do next? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me get back to the microphone so you can hear. Um, Don's always a, thank you. Always an interesting presentation, Don. Thank you. Um, what? What I'd like to do next is, is move right along. The next panel discussion is special considerations for um, broadcast towers and for public safety towers. Um, and we're fortunate that we have a couple representatives in the room from both our media bureau. We have two people, Mike, Mike is there. Okay, Mike, why don't you and Audrey come over? Um, and then we'll also David Ward from um, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau is here. Why don't you join the, the, the table? That way we can, can be efficient about what we're doing. There are some handouts um, on the table from, uh, from the Media Bureau about uh, citing for uh, their tower projects. And as I think Jeff mentioned earlier, you know, Media Bureau does broadcast towers, radio towers, TV towers, they do their licensing. So they have their process for that. But I'm the, the Federal Preservation Officer for the entire agency, even though I'm housed in wireless. And the same thing with public safety and homeland security. I do all the environmental compliance and section 106 reviews, because I only do section 106 um, for the public safety towers. And with that, I'm turn you loose. Uh, thank, thank you, Steve. Is this, is this working? Can you hear okay? You need to pull uh, them up close to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm Mike Wagner. Uh, I'm the assistant chief of the audio division uh, in the media bureau of the FCC. We license radio stations of various uh, sorts. And my colleague here, Aja Denisik, uh, is uh, in the video division, which licenses TV stations of various sorts. Um, my telephone number is area code 202-418-2775. That's a direct line to my place, and it's michael.wagner at fcc.gov. Pretty simple to contact me if, if, if broadcast, if radio stuff comes up for you. Uh, Jeff, you uh, good luck with her <laughs> email address. If you have questions um, about video or TV issues, um, 
My number is 202-418-2651. As for my email, I have a, I have a long name. Um, it's Adrian, that's my full name, A-D-R-I-E-N-N-E -N -N -E dot Denisik, D-E-N-Y-S-Y-K at FCC.gov. And to, to make life easier, uh, one of these days when I get back to my desk, probably tomorrow, I'll email everybody a contact list, okay? Because we have, between Aja and Anne-Marie, uh, my, <laughs> my name is sometimes hard to do too. We'll, we'll do that. So uh, I'd like to call your attention to the couple of handouts that we have in the, in the, on the table over there. One is called Broadcast Tower Placement, and one is called uh, Environmental and Historic Preservation Compliance for New Broadcast Station and Modifications to Existing Broadcast Stations, which is a really long title, but the two handouts are really good. They actually take you through what it is that we do and the forms, the actual forms on which you apply for uh, permission to build. And um, the third uh, handout that I'd like to call your attention to, as Don just mentioned, is the environmental checklist. That thing is, it's, it's gold because it not only tells you what are the environmental criteria that we care about, but what sources you should consult with to evaluate whether there's going to be a significant impact under those criteria. It's, it's, uh, it's an essential tool to complying with the FCC's environmental rules. Um, what we thought we'd do is sort of keep this on a, a, a practical level, sort of if we can demystify the Commission's licensing process for broadcast things. and. Uh, while we're doing so, it would be sort of unpaid uh, testimony for uh, environmental consultants, um, which are uh, pretty much critical also to in doing uh, environmental compliance for the broadcast field. Now, Don mentioned uh, geographic area licenses in his last presentation, and this is a broadcast lawyer's view of a geographic area license, okay? So this is painting with a very broad brush. but. With the geographic area license, you are awarded a, uh, a license to provide wireless service to a given area, and you put up the towers that you need to com get complete service coverage. And in many of the, and that's when the environmental compliance comes in, because you have to put up a tower. It could be dozens of towers, uh, and you need to do compliance on each one of those. Um, for a broadcast tower, um, you need prior commission approval of a facility in terms of the power, height, uh, frequency on which you're going to broadcast, and location down to the second of latitude and longitude, and you need a per permit from us to do it. And uh, in fact, you need, we actually authorize the location on the tower. Um, if you got some leeway with like three meters on the tower, uh, if, we if, we, if you issue you a permit, to go at 81 meters on a tower and you can go up to 84 without having to change. But if you go up higher than that, you need another permit from us. So we really regulate that right down to the second. We need to know where the, to where the, st where the towers are going to be <coughs> and what power they're going to operate with. Um, also differ because although there aren't as many broadcast towers as there are cell towers, um, ours can be, they're not always, but they can be a lot, lot bigger because we can authorize towers that are up to 2,000 feet. Uh, and depending upon the, the size of the station and the area that's, that's authorized for coverage. <coughs> now there's a, a two-step licensing process. Um, first, the applicant comes in and applies during a filing window for a given frequency. Uh, and they, we've got these forms, which are discussed in one of our handouts there, that contain all the information that we need to evaluate the proposal. Now. You know, it, it's kind of bureaucratic to talk in terms of forms, but the fact is we have to make a determination on the legal and, tec legal and technical qualifications of each applicant. And this form says, answer these questions, give us this information, and then we can make that determination. Um, and if you're successful, what we do is we issue something called a construction permit. And that is a piece of paper that says, okay, you can build a radio or television station at, th at these coordinates, at th on this frequency, at this power, and this height. And you get three years to do it. If you're not constructed and on the air in three years, your permit goes away without any further action by us. It just goes poof and turns into a pumpkin. Um, and the second step is, provided, let's say you do that successfully, then you come in and you file a license application with us. And that contains a bunch of technical information that our engineers look at. 
uh, that says, okay, we built this thing at these coordinates with this power on this site, and here's the antenna we put on it, and it's working the way we said it was going to work. Uh, that overview is <coughs> essentially how we license broadcast stations. Um, now, for this group, the critical, uh, the critical component of the licensing process is the question on all of our construction permit and license forms uh, that says, uh, is this project categorically excluded from environmental processing under the rules? <coughs> it's a yes-no question. <coughs> the Commission has gone to, uh, for m almost all of its forms, just basically a yes-no compliance sort of certification. We won't grant an application uh, unless we have a yes box checked. Okay. Um, <coughs> that being said, um, a lot of the construction permits that we issue come out of an auction process. We have a process for, com for deciding who among mutually exclusive applicants gets a frequency and we hold an auction. And the one who values it most, that is the one who bids the most for it, will get it. Now, until you know that you're going to get a construction permit, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for you to go out and do a, a, a site evaluation and go through the whole NEPA and Section 106 process if you're not even, gonna, not even sure you're going to get the permit. So <coughs> it's okay to file a construction permit application with a no box check saying uh, we're, undergo we're doing the Section 106 and NEPA evaluation. We'll amend the application when we've completed it. That's absolutely fine. Um, <coughs> one of the things that we need to emphasize is that the certification is just that. It is a yes-no certification. We don't, want to we don't have to show your work to us unless there's an environmental assessment. Um, like, we don't want to see the Form 620 that you filed with the State Historic Preservation Officer because if you show that to us, then we have to give it to Steve and he's going to have to evaluate it. And it's gonna, it will be duplicative for you because it's, it's a matter of the public record. It's a matter of public record if it's in the application form and we have to look at it. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, the, uh, the environmental question on the broadcast construction permit forms are in the, in the engineering section of the uh, application. And there's been a movement, sometimes very vocal, to get it out of the engineering section because consulting engineers don't do NEPA. They don't do Section 106. Um, but it's probably, if I may, if I were a betting man, I would say it's going to stay there because a very significant component of the environmental certification is radio frequency radiation exposure. Uh, you know, these, these antennas, they're, they're like little microwaves and they put out radios, radio frequency radiation out of the antennas. <coughs> um, Adya's group, uh, television stations, they can operate in, literally in terms of millions of watts. So we have very strict rules about how close these things can be to people and how much exposure there can be to people who are on the tower and who you have to shut it down for, for, for repairs and such. Um, so it will probably stay there, but, it, but the environmental certification will remain a part of the process forever. Um, now, even that, that it is in our the environmental question is in the engineering section of the application means that it's mostly staff engineers who take a look at it. Um, and, but the engineers at the, in the media bureau are now trained that if, if there's anything other than an unqualified certification or if, or if anything looks hinky, they'll go back to the applicant and say, explain this, we need more. Excuse me, for example, if there's a certification in the application, but there's text later on in the application that says our certification attaches only to our radio frequency radiation exposure. Then our guys are going to go back to the applicant and say, what about all the other criteria? Or, uh, and we have seen this happen, that an application comes in and says, uh, here sh this shows that the radio frequency radiation exposure is okay, and we've done section 106, and we've done TCNS. Um, then the begs the question that we're going to ask, okay, what about environment, what about migratory, what, not migratory birds, what about endangered species? What about floodplain? What about wetland? You know, so the best answer is after you've done the legwork, and we'll get to this in a moment, an unqualified certification that if yes is, if yes is the right answer, then make yes the answer. Um, <coughs> the, um, The, the processing policy of the Commission at this point is that we don't look behind the certification. Okay, if we get an unqualified yes, then the application will be processed and we'll go along our merry way. That said, 
there are war and horror stories that can develop. And uh, this is why I want to invite applicants who are here to talk to environmental consultants about it. Because if it turns out that you give us a yes certification, uh, but you didn't do the legwork, then all kinds of bad things can happen. There's a case that I spent a, a lot of time on in out of coming out of Cody, Wyoming, uh, where an applicant was putting three radio stations into Cody and checked yes, to had the unqualified um, had the unqualified yes answer, but a competitor in the market who may or may not have wanted more competition from PlayStations in Cody, Wyoming, actually hired its own environmental consultant and checked and found out that this applicant didn't do anything uh, before it checked. It didn't talk to the State Historic Preservation Officer, it didn't talk to the Fish and Wildlife Service, didn't do any of that stuff, and filed a, a petition to deny the application. <coughs> Now, that raised a whole bunch of questions, and, uh, and it cost the applicant a whole lot of money because not only did they end up having to do all the environmental certification anyway, but they had to pay their lawyer to help litigate it, uh, you know, defend against the petition to deny. And there's a possibility that they can find themselves in an evidentiary hearing for a false certification for making the checking the yes box without uh, having a justification for doing it. So my really st stringent advice is please don't do that. You know, contact a consultant, do the, do the legwork before you make the certification to us. Um, and real, real quickly, so I don't run into uh, David's time, the, uh, if it turns out that you cannot answer yes, that it's categorically excluded, that, for example, there is a, uh, an adverse effect on a historic property or it is in a floodplain, then, the, then what you do is you file an environmental assessment with us. <coughs> and this is, we are the people who don't deal with, I, that, that don't run the EAs through IRENE. We do them ourselves. And um, the environmental assessment will contain the information that's on the worksheet that is in the back and is also in the uh, Wireless Bureau and our website. And then if the information's there, we'll put it on a public notice for 30 days and look at the com any comments that come in. And thus far, very, very few of them have received comments except uh, except sometimes. And then uh, we will issue a letter, if, if appropriate, uh, for the finding of no significant impact. And then the, we will, uh, in, in that same letter, we'll grant the application. Um, so that's sort of the Media Bureau process for uh, as it inter interfaces with uh, environmental regulation. Um, I'd be happy to take questions now, later, after David's, after, uh, David's presentation, whatever, whatever Steve thinks is appropriate. Let, let's let David um, do his presentation for, for public safety, and then we'll, we'll do questions. And I'm impressed. We're pretty close back on time. Yeah. Yeah. My, name is, my name is David Ward. I am a, an attorney in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau Policy Division. The uh, public safety aspect or special considerations are really uh, not as difficult or as uh, involved as the Wireless Bureau or the uh, Media Bureau. Uh, our applicants, public safety applicants that go for a broadcast license, apply for one, uh, will go through the similar or identical process. For example, a municipality that wants to uh, set up a AM radio station adjacent to a highway so that they can broadcast announcements of uh, blockages or accidents. Uh, they'll put up a sign uh, tuned to uh, 1240 on your AM dial. Uh, those are low power AM stations that public safety spectrum has been set aside for such activities. To get a broadcast license in one of those, essentially the process is the same. To get a broadcast license, the environmental requirements are the same. Similarly, with single channel radio and cell phone licenses, the process that uh, a commercial vendor would go through is similar to what a public safety official would go through. The difference, there's actually three significant differences that impact public safety communications and the ability to procure adequate wireless communications. Uh, the first is the uh, fact that public safety needs service everywhere, all of the time. 
Uh, we don't know who is going to need a medevac. We don't know where the next tornado is going to hit. And so our public safety and our emergency first responders uh, do not have the same flexibility as to where to locate communications devices that will allow for sufficient coverage and radio relay. That means when selecting sites, we don't have as much flexibility uh, when it comes to making um, mitigating efforts to accommodate certain environmental and historical constraints. And this is uh, not a waiver situation. This is reality. This is something where public safety officials have to keep in mind that they may have to pay more for mitigating the effects that, or mitigating the construction in order to accommodate uh, commission and federal uh, environmental and historical protection rules. And that leads to the second problem or unique situation. Uh, most of the wireless services for emergency first responders are state and local, which means they draw from funding that is very restricted right now. State and local governments are having a lot of trouble uh, meeting, uh, making uh, ends meet. And so in order to uh, expand as is necessary public safety wireless communications, the, there is not much resources left over to do this kind of mitigation. And so it is a real planning dilemma for uh, emergency first responders at the state and local government to accumulate enough resources before they launch a project like a, a new tower or piggyback off of an existing commercial tower. And finally, the third special consideration is the uh, emergency restoration of public safety communications uh, when there is a natural disaster like a flood or a tornado or uh, heaven help us, something worse. Uh, in that instance, most of those emergency uh, uh, restoration is covered by contract. There are certain state and federal laws that will give uh, emergency first responders priority for the uh, restoration. For example, in the FCC, it's found under Part 64 of the Commission's rules. Part A, I'm sorry, Appendix A is for wireline restoration. Appendix B for wireless restoration priority where state and local governments also have their own local city uh, ordinances and state laws that also call for priority. And normally when these things are constructed, there's budget set aside in order to expedite the restoration of emergency first responder comms. And so those are the three essential differences between what you heard from uh, cellular and single channel wireless and, and broadcast uh, wireless communications. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to mention in regard to the public safety uh, towers, uh, one, a reminder that, that because they're licensed by the SEC, they have to go through the environmental compliance process. But the other thing is that we encourage, or trying to encourage the public safety community to build towers that are strong enough to accept co-locations if, if they wished. We're not requiring, nobody's requiring them to do that. But one of the things that we have found is that in an effort to save money at the, at the local community, they've been building very light towers that won't accept commercial co-locators. And they're, they're doing themselves out of a, a, um, a funding source. And uh, we don't get into to money transfers and things like that here, but just to say that, and you all know this, that, that co-locations is a fairly uh, lucrative business these days, and the public safety community, if they were building stronger towers, could take advantage of that as a way of providing income for their systems or whatever. Um, are there any questions for our three panelists? We have time for a few, because we're back on track. Yes, sir. station in an auction process and I've got to submit <clears throat> within 30 days an application 
how much time do I have for the EA? Because I'm in a very difficult state. Mr. Everest, um, as, I, as I hope I, if I didn't make it clear earlier, I'll try to make it clear now. The, you. you definitely don't get a waiver of the 30-day period for the for filing the, the application, but you can file the application and check the no box uh, and say, we're doing the environmental, we're doing it, and there isn't a time frame under which uh, you need to f submit that. Once the application's on file, we'll hold it until you finish the, the, uh, the process. Not a problem there. Um, thank you very much, guys. Thank you for coming down, for doing the handouts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We prom according to the agenda, we promised you a break. Um, if you want to stand up for a few minutes, because I know uh, the, the um, other agencies need to come up and take, up, take the podium, uh, don't wander real far, because you're going to miss really good stuff. <laughs> Better stuff. Presentation. We have questions and answers. We'll be doing that all day long, and we'll allow time for this. So hopefully we'll, we'll get people out of here in this sort of the 4 o'clock, 4.30 hour. Um, although we're happy to answer questions this we're 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 trying to serve you i've had a couple things that, that came up as questions one is regards to das systems distributed antenna systems and the view that don's not here but anyway i'll speak for him um our view okay let me say this my view and don's view with distributed antenna systems is that they should be handled as a single project. Just if you don't know what a DAS system is, it's, they're, they're real popular in historic districts or in urban areas because it's just a single little antenna that sits on top of stoplights and, and street signs and uh, telephone poles and just whatever. And it provides Wi-Fi and, and communications in urban areas. They're real neat, they're inobtrusive, it's not, not really a big deal. To my mind, it, it just makes common sense to, to treat a, a single DAS installation of multiple nodes, two, three, four hundred, whatever they are, as a single review project. To try to do them individually makes no real sense. I don't know why anybody would want to do that to themselves. You know, you want to fill out a complete form 621 for 400 little, little antennas about that size on top of your telephone poles and, and lights in, in an urban area? Why, why do that? Um, if you want to do it, I'm not going to stop you, but, you know, that's, that's your business. Question in the back. Um, you kind of get that into the D-106 form that wants, you know, one point, one set of coordinates, and it's not designed to accommodate that. I know. Um, pick out a point and put that in the, in the, the descriptor as the address, and then do an attachment that shows where all the other points are going to be, along with your photographs. That's, that's easy. Um, the other question is on getting in touch with me. Um, I do some telecommuting, their agency encourages that, and, and I don't live in DC. Um, I actually live near the ocean. Um, so I like to, to be that way. So the best way, and I travel some for the agency, so the best way to get in touch with me, because it gives me a record, is by email. And I gave you my phone number earlier, which is 202-418-1986. And I do try to return phone calls as quickly as I can, uh, but a lot of people call me. It's my email address, which is Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot Del Sordo, D-E-L-S-O-R-D as in David, O as in Oregon, at FCC.gov. And I will send around a contact list for everybody. And because I used to think that my name was hard until I met Aji and Namory and that sort of stuff. Um, with that, this this next this last panel is is something that's been is interesting for me. It's this panel has grown out of the program comment that actually FEMA started and then backed away from it, and then NTIA and RUS took the bull by the horns, and then FEMA came back into it. So it was a very sort of confusing. Part. But it's worked very well, and one of the things that's happened is that Laura and I knew each other from working together at the Advisory Council. And for, for connections, just so you know this, is that Laura and Jill and I have breakfast every Thursday morning, and we talk about all of you. 
we share project information because especially with the broadband projects that they're doing under the Recovery Act, there's a lot of towers involved. So they're doing all the fiber and they do the, the fiber stuff. I don't do fiber stuff because um, it's not usually licensed by the FCC. But all the towers involved in their Recovery Act projects and all the uh, FEMA projects that, that um, are funded that include towers, uh, the FCC does all the reviews through our, our, our process, through our APA. So, the discussions we have on, on Thursday mornings um, have been very productive. We've solved, I hope, I think we've solved a lot of problems and made life easier for the three of us. Um, and um, so it's been, it's been a really good deal. So, so we talk a lot. And I also, will, will, just to give a plug, we're all federal preservation officers and the federal preservation officers with all the federal agencies meet on a regular basis and we all talk about you all. So, um, well, for good or for bad, you probably all talk about us, so, so it's the two-way street. Um, but there is a lot of communication about what it is that Section 106 process means and, and good common sense ways to do that. And this is one of the reasons why we're doing this day and why we're giving you guidance on DAS and talking about some other things because it just makes good common sense because we recognize that we're expensive. You know, the processes we talk about can be expensive. So we're trying to figure out ways to do it better. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my buddies. I'll let you, the three of you, they've, they've drawn straws to decide who goes first. And I'll let each of you introduce yourselves. And w when they're done, we'll do questions and answers. So thanks a lot, guys, for coming. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm John Ketchum, FEMA's Historic Preservation Officer, joined by. Uh, Jill Dowling. I'm the Preservation Officer for Department of Commerce. And Laura Dean, I'm the Federal Preservation Officer and a recovering archaeologist uh, for the Rural Utility Service. I'm Ann Crowdy. I'm not a Federal Preservation Officer, but I'm half of Laura's brain most that's, of the time. That's exactly right. Well, I'm going to kick things off. Um, as I was saying to Steve earlier, today actually is the longest day of the year, and I'm going to try to keep my comments actually to the shortest. Um, before I begin, I just would like to draw attention to the work of FCC and Steve and Jeff Steinberg and Dan Abeda, who's not here today, uh, but had a lot to do with the execution of the two programmatic agreements in 2001 and 2004, respectively. And Rick Kaplan now, uh, Jeff Steinberg's boss, and Don Johnson. Uh, I think they've done a terrific job of harnessing new technology and being able to demonstrate, as Steve just pointed out, some common sense solutions to expediting the Section 106 process. And I recognize that there may still be some angst uh, in the preservation community at some of the creative techniques that they have employed, but I think in this day and age of uh, economic and political scrutiny, those are going to be uh, vehicles that we are going to continue to need to explore and take advantage of as much as possible and obviously do it in a collaborative fashion with our stakeholders at the state and local level. I'm also impressed at the turnout today. Uh, I don't know if uh, Steve promised people free tickets to the U2 concert tomorrow in Baltimore, but uh, this, is, this is pretty darn uh, good to see everybody come together like this. And, you know, distance learning has its place, but to bring people together and uh, put a name with a face and have some substantive discussions over a six to eight hour period, I think is pretty impressive. Just a little bit about uh, FEMA before I turn things over to my colleagues from Department of Commerce and uh, USDA RUS. FEMA is an assistant a assistance agency and uh, we have a headquarters here in Washington as well as 10 regional offices. As some of you know, in 2003, we became part of the Department of Homeland Security after uh, paving our own destiny for uh, a number of years. And I think it's fair to say that there have been some, uh, there have been some speed bumps in that transition to DHS. One of the practical aspects that I think probably we were most uh, ill-prepared for is that for the first time we had a significant component of our assistance that was devoted to preparedness. Uh, you might be surprised by that actually uh, for an emergency management agency at the national level, but previous to 
9-11, we really focused our attention on the aftermath of disasters. And with 9-11, and particularly some of the interoperability challenges uh, from that day, as well as I should add in 2005 after Hurricane Katrina along the Gulf Coast, I think it became clear to the department that they needed to do a better job as well as to Congress in providing assistance to alleviate those interoperability issues. And so FEMA came uh, to uh, essentially uh, have at its doorstep a number of preparedness programs. Uh, beginning in 2004, 2005. And that really was the genesis of, as Steve accurately described a couple minutes ago, FEMA having some conversations with FCC as well as the Advisory Council several years ago about how they could streamline review of co-location and construction of telecommunication facilities. And thank you, thanks to the, the efforts of my colleagues uh, to my right, uh, who decided that uh, they had perhaps a little bit more political capital that they were wish wishing to expend. Uh, they did take the initiative of pushing forward with the program comment and FEMA was able to take advantage of it very late in the development process. Just to add that typically, uh, with the exception of this program comment, as Blythe indicated earlier, under the Advisory Council's regulations, uh, 800.14 program alternatives, uh, FEMA typically relies on what are known as state-specific programmatic agreements, also under 800.14 program alternatives. And these are agreements that are negotiated with our state historic preservation officer counterparts, state emergency management agencies, and on occasion, uh, federally recognized tribes. Uh, though oftentimes tribes will prefer to have their own uh, separate protocols and procedures negotiated with FEMA. But those state-specific agreements really drive uh, forward the compliance review for our assistance programs. And most of those continue to be associated with disasters, but increasingly those preparedness projects uh, are rearing their head as well. What I would say about the program comment is a couple things. And in the back, I should mention uh, there is an information bulletin that spells out the review process for FEMA's uh, responsibilities for tower construction and co-location. And please pay particular attention to that. Uh, it really lays out a three-step process. But as uh, Blythe and others have mentioned earlier, FEMA is taking advantage of an FCC review. So for all practical purposes, we want to make sure that you are going through that FCC review first as an applicant for assistance. We do not want you coming to FEMA first because that is going to make uh, our review time period that much longer. So start with that FCC review, then come to us with good documentation, and we should be home free from there. I would say, though, in the first year and a half since the program comment was enacted, uh, there had been some growing pains. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, the reason for that probably falls most on FEMA for uh, not necessarily having a systematic way of reaching out to its applicants for assistance and local government as well as uh, our stakeholders and consultants. I think that's getting better, uh, but we need to continue to mature and improve in that regard. I would also just keep in mind that, uh, or want you to keep in mind that as has been alluded to today, the program comment is specific to Section 106. It does not address other environmental laws. And while obviously there may be opportunities to categorically exclude tower construction or co-location from further NEPA review and streamline our endangered species and migratory bird requirements, this program comment speaks to only one particular law, that being 106 of NHPA. And then finally, there may be some tower uh, construction activities uh, as well as ancillary activities uh, in close proximity to a tower. For example, the construction of a emergency operations center, what we call an EOC, that are not part and parcel of this program comment and FCC's programmatic agreements. And those would need to be addressed through a independent FEMA review. So something just to, to tuck away and keep in mind. 
As I mentioned, the information bulletin, uh, which is uh, in the back there, it's also available uh, on FEMA's website. Uh, you can uh, download that easily. And then we also have uh, essentially a help mailbox that uh, if you have questions as you're going through the review process that you can ping us on and we will get back to you as soon as possible, someone uh, in our program office. And then I may have unwittingly provided a link to the old website uh, for FCC, but FCC, uh, in my opinion, has one of the better websites for environmental historic preservation review out there, and uh, I would just put a plug in for taking advantage of it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jill, and happy to answer any of your questions a little later. Thanks, John. Um, so we're going to kind of tag team here. I hope we haven't really run through this except very informally. We, we hope we'll be entertaining. <laughs> um, John had mentioned political will, and I think that as much as political will, if not more, we had era impetus <laughs> to get the program comment uh, moving because um, the real reason behind our alliance and our working so closely with Steve is driven by the time frame. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act um, provided both NTIA and RUS with $7.2 billion to expand access to broadband um, and to do it really quickly. <laughs> um, $4.7 billion of those dollars went to NTIA to support broadband infrastructure to enhance and expand public computer centers, encourage sustainable adoption of broadband, and develop and maintain a nationwide public map of broadband capability and availability. And we want to talk today a little bit about the lessons that we've learned. Um, we're really glad, at least um, in looking around, to see a lot of folks that we work with. It wouldn't have been possible. I think we, both of these programs are making incredible incredible success stories across the country in a very important area and it's taken a lot of people to polarize and mobilize um, to get a bunch of work done and, um, and to put projects together that would never have been possible without these programs. Um. Um, to give you a little context, uh, RUS prior to 2008 had not had anybody on board who met the Secretaries of Interior Standards for Historic Preservation. So I came on board in 2008, Recovery Act February 2009. We met with NTIA and FCC in March, and um, in the Advisory Council in March 2009. So I laughingly call the past year or so, and maybe two years, our life living dangerously. Um, uh, for RUS, the program is a broadband initiatives program. I don't think we have a lot of applicants here or folks who've worked with, with our programs, but um, our, uh, our part of the Recovery Act was meant to provide funding to underserved and unserved rural areas. Um, we really didn't quite know what to expect um, when the Recovery Act, when the money was made available. We knew the components of the projects, but we didn't quite know their composition, how they would play out. We've gotten projects with 47, 50 towers and fiber projects with 2,700 miles of fiber and more than one. So we've gotten some huge projects and complex in the sense of the numbers of miles and the timing. Um, so NTIA's project um, or program is the Broadband Technology Opportunities Program. And as I mentioned, the, the main one that we uh, deal with in Section 106 is comprehensive community infrastructure. And these are projects that are laying thousands and hundreds of thousands of miles of fiber or stringing it aerially, um, building towers, as we've discussed, um, as well as the public computer center components and sustainable broadband adoption. Okay. 
I just did. Okay. Yeah, Pippis. Um, just as an aside, they thought as late as March 2010, somebody thought that I would do all the 106 reviews for all the BIP projects. But I disabused them of that notion. And we have Ann Crotty here, who's with ICF. It's a consulting firm that's helping RUS with all of its broadband initiatives program. And she and I have been working since May to try to complete these reviews. So all of the grants for both programs were awarded by September 30th of 2010. And the environmental award conditions for compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act and NEPA, and um, in the case of NTIA, we're doing environmental assessments for many of our projects. There also are a lot of categorical exclusions. These environmental award conditions were scheduled to be removed within six months. Um, projects have to be substantially completed within, six, within two years, mm -hmm. at least 60%, and then fully constructed within three years of award. So this all um, happened very quickly and in, in similar to the story that uh, Laura tells the Department of Commerce and NTIA did not have a historic preservation specialist on board either and I started I think it was at the end of last August so it's been a year of living very dangerously. Yes. Uh, the um, money is available the, the people applied for the money if they didn't correctly anticipate how much money they would need, there is no other money. If they can't use it, if there's a problem and they have to decline, the award goes back to the Treasury. Once our applicants sign on the dotted line, they commit to completing the project within the time frames. So you can understand, you know, just a regular project ratcheted up with congressional deadlines where if you don't complete the work, you potentially lose the money. It makes for a very uh, hot and heavy <laughs> kind of consultation in 106. So we anticipated fairly early on that we would need to do some streamlining. We'd need some, as John said, some real common sense solutions. So just the way that ERA worked, the um, projects were reviewed and awards were made and there really needed to be a great um, effort between the Advisory Council and the National Council of State Historic Preservation Officers and NTIA and RUS to establish a vehicle, a programmatic agreement to allow Section 106 compliance post-award. So we have a number of tools, um, the nationwide programmatic agreement that governs, governs the project, which we'll talk about in a little more detail, the program comment that um, Steve mentioned and John has been talking about, and then also a memorandum of agreement that um, was a life, another life-saving aspect, allowing NTIA and RUS to take advantage of a modified version of TCNS to help with tribal notifications. Do you want to? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so the nationwide programmatic agreement, which was signed in November of 2009, um, Advisory Council, Nick Shippo, RUS, NTIA, and other stakeholders were engaged in reviewing, obviously, and commenting on it, allows us to do Section 106 post-award. Uh, no ground disturbance, construction, or other activities that may affect historic properties can begin until the agencies determine that Section 106 review is complete. Um, and, and another important thing, it's really been something that we have had to communicate very clearly to our applicants who aren't used to dealing in many cases with federal requirements, is that, that the way for us to do this um, is we need to design the projects to avoid historic properties. And that's something that we have em emphasized throughout. Want me to keep going? <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I was just going to say that, that uh, just a little bit of background. You know, one of the challenges to trying to develop these common sense approaches was not only did we not know exactly what we would get. I mean, we had a general idea. But the agencies are also different in that our U.S. already had a telecom program where we give funding to rural co-ops. NTIA had not had money for uh, assistance money for um, 
any kind of broadband applicants prior to this. So, you know, part of that challenge is then working with the agencies to try to get something that works for all on some level. And quickly. <laughs> and quick, quickly, yes. In fact, I think this nationwide PA actually ended up being done in maybe two months. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. um, so one of the, th the things that has been quite helpful is that the PA contains an exemption for broadband over existing power lines where you're using um, existing poles and there's no pole replacement. And so in both of our cases where we're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles, if we can limit these APEs by having some of the runs essentially an agreement that there's no potential to affect, that's been a um, critical lifesaver. Also the sustainable broadband adoption projects that um, BTOP funds, education, training, those are all logically exempt from Section 106. Um, and then there's another provision that says where we are able within the projects to do regular um, 106, 36 CFR, 800.3 through 0.7, we don't have to notify the Advisory Council of adverse effects if we're following those standard practices. And uh, fortunately for us in the past year, I would say we've only had, knock on wood, one adverse effect for a tower project to date, so it's been a moot point. Yeah, we haven't had any, not for tower or for fiber optic construction. I'll tell you the details later. <laughs> um, so the second tool that I mentioned was the program comment, which you've heard um, a little bit about first from the Advisory Council and then from John. Um, where we have BIP and BTOP funded projects that include telecommunication facilities that are regulated by the FCC, NTIA and RUS don't have to consult to take into account the effect of those where they're going to undergo a uh, review by the FCC's process. And Blythe was better at using the exact legalese in that, that program comment. Um, projects, we have a number of projects that have both fiber and tower components, and so that is what has occasioned um, what Steve mentioned, which is our constant and now routine every week uh, meeting to discuss these in an effort to keep the projects going on schedule. Right, and, and not only <coughs> keeping them going, but also uh, sharing any efficiencies which we may have developed. Um, we share agreement documents, um, we share anything else we can think of um, where we have uh, meet a bump in the road. So unlike typical government, you actually have uh, four agents, three agencies, and actually FEMA if we need FEMA, uh, actually working together to try to solve a problem. So that, that's pretty different for government. And Blythe had made the um, suggestion that it you know, the ideal situation is when the FCC can conclude their consultations for the towers um, as we are concluding our consultations for the projects. But we found that um, just given the scope and the scale of this pro these projects and the timing um, from which they had to come into existence as applications and then become reality when they were funded, um, we do have situations where we have towers, you know, that where they're still g undergoing some siting review, they've got some land acquisition, and, and given the other um, guidance that we've heard, which is it really isn't good for um, these tower consultations to go ahead and initiate in TCNS too early, um, essentially we do have some towers that are lagging behind the other components of the project where we can go ahead and initiate the consultations. So the timing of these two consultations has been one challenge that we meet to, um, to try to resolve. Um, we let, me just, let me just add one thing I learned is that our co-ops, the ones that applied to our U.S. for funding, need our money in order to go forward and do the studies that are needed to meet FCC's requirements. And so the way we've been doing that is, is executing PAs, which allow RUS to say to our telecom office, we've done 106. They have a follow-on program of procedures. And as part of that, it says we can release construct funding for our construction 
or advanced funding for studies that are needed. So, you know, that was something we didn't anticipate. Um, another thing that we have learned <laughs> is uh, the complications when we do have towers that are proposed on tribal or federal lands. Steve mentioned this morning that those, those towers aren't, um, don't consult under the NPA. And so in some cases, getting to that um, understanding of exactly where the towers are landing, which towers that's going to be the case for. And then in some cases, too, just because the projects are large and we're dealing with um, co-ops, mm -hmm. um, PUDs, uh, sometimes a bunch of people working together who really don't do these projects in the same way that the large providers do, um, certifying the applicability of the program comment. Um, I've had people ask me if their towers needed to be FCC licensed, <laughs> and I'm the last person you want to ask that to. So we give them uh, Steve and his colleagues' telephone number, and, and they work on that. And then also con confirming the exemptions of co-locations, because while um, you know, the, there is the self-certifying elements of the FCC's process, but we need to make sure that those co-locations, when we are um, needing to make sure, in our case for our NEPA purposes, that all of the work is done and all of the potential impacts to cultural resources are taken into account, we needed to have some processes in place so that we can understand that the FCC agrees that those towers have undergone review and meet the other criteria necessary that they are um, exempt from, from review in those cases. Um, and then finally, in the case, and I mentioned we had one adverse effect, that was kind of a lessons learned because the FCC then has a public comment process and an EA process, and in because NTIA is already doing an EA on a project, we had to work out how we were going to coordinate those efforts so that we didn't end up essentially with two EAs on the same project. And our U.S. doesn't have EAs. We have categorical exclusions in our regs, and we could not, we did not fund anything that didn't meet the category, CADEX threshold. Because no, we don't, I'm sorry, we don't have EAs for BIF, right. We didn't, in looking at these projects, we did not fund anything that didn't meet that CADEX threshold because our sense was we wouldn't have been able to get it done. Um, the timing was just such that we wouldn't be able to do it. So the other aspect in which we partner with FCC is um, in utilizing the TCNS system to notify tribes of these projects. It's been incredible and we're very grateful not only to Steve but to Diane and to Anne Marie for all of the assistance and guidance and they have done um, a, a huge amount to make these projects possible and to help us in the um, often overwhelming um, effort to communicate about linear projects that you, yours can be in the thousands of miles. I'm not sure we've gotten up to the thousands, but in the many hundreds of miles to get the word out to everyone who could be um, impacted by the ground disturbance that's associated and to have a conversation and dialogues with tribes that potentially could have issues. Um, so uh, you've he all heard way more um, and way more eloquently about TCNS than I could possibly tell you. Um, but I in the case, because we do have recipients, and in so many recipients we've been processing these uh, grants in this six-month time frame for, when tribes do request more information or consultation, we have processes by which the government, um, I or the environmental um, analysts at NTIA, get back in touch and get the tribe's permission to have the recipients exchange information. And if it looks like that um, interest is going beyond an information exchange to be an actual issue, we, we get back involved and, and talk about resolving it. Um, for RUS, uh, TCNS was, has been invaluable. I mean, it was, as I said, only going to be me. Now it's the two of us. Um, we just didn't have the resources. So having TCNS as a notification system was just essential. Um, one of the, the slight differences um, 
between NTIA and RUS was my sense uh, with the projects, we have about 240 projects, 297 projects that we need to finish by September. I mean, we, we started last year, um, and so whatever's left over, we have to finish by September. My sense was that we wouldn't even begin to do it or be able to do it unless I got involved, Ann and I got involved in all the projects that needed our attention. So RUS has been actively involved in all of these, these projects. So if there is a tribal concern, it comes, hopefully will come to us through TCNS or other ways and so we can respond to them. Um, both of our agencies have delegation authorities associated with uh, these projects and certain section 106 responsibilities we do rely on the applicants to follow up with but um, in both cases as is typical I mean we res remain responsible as the lead fed federal agency and the guidance that we put out in terms of best practices um, early in post award is a strong encouragement that um, that the recipients again many of whom don't have a lot of experience get active with respect to these consultations. Um, we very strongly encourage the use of qualified experts and consultants in order to um, meet the requirements to establish the APs and to um, get the due diligence, the, the desk surveys, and, and figure out where we need to do survey and additional work. Um, it, it was also very important to message out that route site selection and enge engineering design needed to be sufficient in order to actually have a conversation. Um, many of our projects um, might not have been as shovel ready as uh, ERA would have hoped. Um, and, and a lot of them you know, were changing and evolving as, as the funding was coming online. So that was a challenge. Um, and just identifying and working with the other regulatory agencies that are, are involved in the projects um, and, and keeping the communication going in the same way Laura is emphasizing. It's just her on the cultural resource side for NTIA, it is just me. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of people uh, that we need to be responding back to in terms of email and telephone calls and, and uh, the, the need for communication has uh, one been critical. <laughs> one thing I realized too, you know, you. you not having been at RUS very long, I'm s I was still learning about our projects and applicants. And um, um, that's one of the things I learned, that our applicants applied to BIP with a concept for a project. They needed federal funding to take that design further. So, you know, part of it was the, is the shovel ready issue, but there is a reason for that, right. in that they don't have the money. So, um, it, it, it sort of means like we're always in flux with some of these projects. We're trying to figure out when to do 106, but they're moving targets. So that has been quite a challenge. And then while there's a nationwide programmatic agreement that's allowing our uh, consultations, our project-specific consultations post-award, in certain cases, as Laura mentioned, we do use programmatic agreements. Sometimes it's to deal with the timing issues associated with the FCC consultations. Um, some of it is, is related to this moving target issue as engineering design and final, you know, final decisions are being made about what community anchor institutions might get hooked up and so forth and so on. There are, there is this, this amount of flux in all the projects. Um, it, it does, you know, require the recipient to really understand at a time when they're doing so much, the six month period of trying to get, uh, other, in our case, other environmental work done, as well as uh, all the other aspects of their project in line. It uh, requires an understanding of that agreement and the phases of Section 106 and, um, you know, the fact that you still are going to need to get some 36 CFR 61 qualified assistance in order to do those studies. You're just doing them later. Um, and then there needs to be a, a mechanism in place on the agency side to
to ensure that that's done, to monitor the implementation, um, and uh, increased um, importance and emphasis on the communications with SHPOs. And I, I think that Laura and I would both say we are very appreciative for the, sh the SHPOs who were not just dealing with our ARA projects, but it's been an incredible number of years, two or three years, that this has all been going on. And so this idea that we have these projects in flux and, um, you know, we've got a lot of money out there, it's been, it's been an incredible effort from, it, I think, everybody who's been involved on, on all sides, from the recipient to the consultants to the SHPOs. Um, so PAs, we use them as a mechanism for assimilating the FCC consultations. And then finally, and this is your big point, a way of memorializing the requirements to actually finish the 106. Yeah, uh, we've got a telecom office. So the office I'm in, which is environmental, has to communicate to that telecom office that it's time to release the fun advance funding. And what, if any, conditions go with that. So the PA then is our vehicle for memorializing those conditions. Where we have the app, we, we expect our applicants to sign that agreement. So I send it to them and I ask for their comments and I think we have had we, we're getting comments from applicants now. They're concerned about the phasing, which suggests to me they've actually read the agreement, which is a good thing. Um, I want you to know that in, I've been doing this a very, very long time, and PAs can take years to complete. I think the best we've done is less than 30 days. Yeah. yeah. Two weeks. Two weeks. I think the best we've done is two weeks. So. Our partners, some of our partners, I owe. I tell them I'm bringing a case of champagne when this is all done. We're going to have a party <laughs> and what have you. But the shippos, some of the shippos have just been outstanding, Come, coming back from vacations and providing comments in two hours. So, so the challenge, these are, were incredibly expansive undertakings, very tight timelines political pressure, which we probably haven't emphasized enough, all of the projects that were approved came with um, governor's approval and support and congressional s approval and support, um, a as well as the era time frames, and we hear about those things, um, as I know the ship has to. Uh, relatively limited but definitive potential in some cases to affect historic properties and restricted federal resources, as we've described. You know, we didn't get huge amounts of contractor help or support to, to make this happen. So I, I think this slide just reiterates some of the challenges we've had, and, and, and it's across the board. Size of the projects, timing, um, uh, the nature of the projects, of the, the change in the projects uh, with design and what have you. Um, the advantage for me is that hopefully our U.S. will continue to have a broadband program. And that means that now I have all kinds of tools and relationships which back in 2008 I did not have. And I have an understanding of broadband construction you would not believe. <laughs> so uh, when we look to the future, we hope to continue our relationship. But we don't know right now how any of the agencies, if or how any of the agencies will be involved with continued broadband deployment. What we know is that this is important to the administration. Uh, it's my understanding it has become important to various governors and something that is being pushed by them. So I expect that broadband will not disappear from the landscape, whether it's RUS or NTIA, FEMA, it's pretty, well, I shouldn't say that, but FCC also may be involved. So one of the reasons we wanted to participate today was just to meet you guys, and, and so you would know us, and we intend to continue our relationship. We've been talking in our meetings about protocols, uh, about some of the types of work that are typical that we've been able to get a, a handle on, I think quantifying what the potential for effects is and having those conversations. In the case of NTIA, we've also developed some best management practices that we've been effective in working with SHPOs to implement for making connections to potentially historic buildings. 
um, also for identifying unmarked burials and rights of way, additional guidance that we can give to contractors to um, you know, help us uh, ensure that we are taking historic preservation into account. Um, uh, the, go ahead. Yeah, let, let me say that, 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 that in my mind what we're working on now is how to establish establishing what constitutes a reasonable and good faith effort for doing archaeology for these broadband projects. We had no, I had no sense, Anne had no sense, Jill, nationwide what this all looks like, but we're getting a better handle on it now. And so our common sense going forward, that common sense solution or solutions that we come up with will be tied directly to what's reasonable, good faith, and in the public interest. And we've identified a real need to talk more to Native American tribes and TIPOs um, about these projects and their effects. A, a lot of the projects that we have that are serving Native Amer American communities, you heard Jeff talk before about the real challenge to bring broadband and wireless. Um, in those cases, we are talking about burying fiber and we are talking about sacred sites and things that, um, you know, just it was very, um, great to hear Anne-Marie and Jeff talk about these things because we deal with it and we, we live with this um, you know, need to be sensitive when we're doing something that might seem small and it might be restricted within a right of way, but how disturbed really is that right of way and where is it? Um, so these are all conversations that need to continue. We need other federal agencies uh, to, to join in the conversation as well. We've had a lot of projects that are going through BLM land or Forest Service, and um, there have been challenges in those permit requirements and uh, working together as well as we, we should and could be as federal agencies. And um, we really have gained an appreciation for um, high quality professional cultural resource consultants because um, we have had a lot of consultants make a huge difference as the SHPOs have in terms of thinking outside the box, understanding the era time frames, meeting some challenges um, to help their clients uh, make these projects happen. Do you wanna, no? Okay. Oh, uh, 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 as an introduction here for, for our U.S., um, I would echo what Jill said. Um, I would also say, uh, kind of as an opening here, um, Steve is going to pay for us to go to the Virgin Islands when all this is over so we can have a debrief and write our experiences from the <laughs> year. Um, we've seen just about everything imaginable <laughs> in the past 12 months. Um, so, so we know some of the, the beginning to get an idea in areas where, where we really need to, to pay greater attention. Um, and um, my prior experience was also suggested to me that where we get into trouble is when the federal agency is not paying attention. Well, RUS and NTIA and FEMA are definitely paying attention to these projects and we need to work better with the consultants. As Steve said very early this morning, it's probably best, I mean I realize you have a client, but it's probably best to think of the agency as your client at the end of the day, especially for these broad, these Recovery Act broadband projects, era broadband projects, because of the congressional scrutiny. And the most successful um, projects that I have worked on, you know, I, I've noticed that the cultural resource consultants, by the time I finally can talk to them, because this first point here about knowing who your client is, you know, sometimes we have cultural resource consultants who are sub to EA consultants who are talking to an engineer or subbed again to an engineering firm who are working for a grants manager. And that whole idea of just getting that a good fix on these grant projects of, of where everybody is, finding out the lead agency, getting a name and number for the preservation officer or the cultural resource contact. Um, and, and then f being able to talk to someone who can tell you, or, uh, you know, are there tools? Is there a programmatic agreement or program comments or BMPs? A lot of times when consultants are subbing to other EA and engineering consultants, 
all they're paying attention to is the timeline in which they have to get this work done. And there have been a number of times where, you know, by the time I've actually talked to someone and I can, you know, tell them that we have a PA that exempts aerial over existing fiber, all of this information is on our website. We've done webinars on it. Um, we've had workshops on it, but sometimes the way that the hiring and procurement process goes, cultural resource consultants come on board late. And so they, you know, it's just know that information is out there and, and, and look for it. Um, confirming that there's accu that you have accurate project information. Well, yeah, and, and I won't go over each one of these, but these have been some of our experiences. We've had a project, I talked to you, some of you yesterday about it. We thought we were at the end. We happened to look at the map and notice all the green and realize, wait a minute, that's in a national forest and nobody had talked to the Forest Service. We then realized the same project was crossing uh, tribal lands. Um, so that then delayed our resolution. Um, fairly early on, Ed and I told a, 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 an applicant that our job actually was to take their engineering information and translate it in a way that it could be understood by historic preservation folks. Um, and my experience with that was um, very early on I was told, well, we have uh, to construct the fiber plant. And I thought, oh, my, my image was this big building that needed to be constructed. What they meant was the fiber cable, I know, I understand now, <laughs> but had that gone to Shippo, for example, they would have had the same image. And then it would have been confusing. So what we're trying to do is eliminate those possibilities for confusion. That's why the accurate information is so important. It, if it's not accurate, not complete, it causes delays it causes additional work which can delay the project. And along those same lines, learn the typical types of work. If you're a consultant working on these projects and you're handed a map and it's just got a red line that's following a major highway, understand that if that is, you know, if that's vibratory plowing, you're talking about just a couple of inches, you know, versus if it's being directionally drilled. Essentially, you know, we're th this is along the line of protocols some of the information that we're talking about, but, but get this information to understand the construction impacts. I had a consultant who had been handed a line on a piece of paper and I didn't understand, I mean, I didn't actually know because of all the procurement where they were, but when I finally talked to them, they told me that they were waiting to talk to the SHPO because they had to get 1,400 paper forms for archeological resources within a mile of a line they had on the map and it was a project that um, part of it actually was aerial and existing but part of it or the majority of it was just going to be plowed so really critical you want to go on this one well uh, uh, we've had a couple of, of uh, the area of potential effects for our projects are defined by the agency they're not defined in a nationwide PA. Um, as we go forward, one of the things we certainly want to do is clarify what is the APE for con fiber optic cable construction or broadband construction for certain types of projects so there is not confusion. Again, um, we've had a situation where we asked uh, for, for a background study of an area a quarter of a mile um, that included the fiber optic cable um, so that we could make an assessment of potential and what have you. As, as that came back to us, the, that quarter mile was not a study area but became the APE. So that then became a problem, certainly if it had been transmitted to the SHPO, because the SHPO would have every reason to believe we were constructing something that was a quarter mile wide or would have that, that potential effect. So, so care needs to be taken in this application and how it is discussed, because it, at the end of the day, beginning and end of the day, it's a federal decision. So we just wanted to end by emphasizing um, that having a qualified archaeologist in particular involved in a project 
is really critical. Um, it enables us as an agency to be able to move as efficient, efficiently as we can through Section 106 and take historic preservation into account. Um, a lot of times, at least with the BIP and the BTOP projects, we were dealing with um, providers or recipients who didn't have any experience with these federal compliance requirements and were used to putting in projects fast and projects that you know essentially when you go out there you're driving down the road now they they are you could see the little flags there there may already be some in the roadways that we're talking about so it, in, in some cases that getting your mind around doing these section 106 reviews um, it's it's not not that easy if people are doing this pro these projects all the time with with their own money um, there are, are limited resources on the federal side be aware of that um, and as cultural resource experts closest to the project as they change or etc um, your role is critical and we're thankful to you when you are doing um, the good job that we've been seeing as you know we are very thankful to the shippos and the um, advisory council and it's been great working with Steve collaboratively and Laura um, in implementing this program comment. Yes, Steve and Jill keep me sane <laughs> because I actually feel like a moving target these days. Um, um, just so you know, they didn't take away any of the other work. So we have to do, what we're trying to do is regular work and the broadband on top of that. So it is extraordinarily challenging. But because of, of our Thursday meetings, it's a chance to vent and talk about some of the issues. And sometimes, many more often than not, we actually get things solved, which, which makes a huge difference. So thank you. I should thank you. I, I, I find it a very relaxing <laughs> Thursday morning experience. For me, too. I'm not yeah. in the office. Well, <laughs> but at least you're in your building. Yes. So we get to hang out someplace else. Um, are you guys okay? Are there any questions for our, our distinguished panelists? Uh, the, the questions? There's one right, right back there, Jim. Is all the cultural resource work finished at this point? No. I thought it had to be finished by September. No, 2011. all the money has to be awarded. Had to be awarded by September 30th, 2010. So it's so the money is awarded, but our, our, our nationwide PA allowed us to do 106 post-award. So we are now trying to do 106 on all the 290, however many projects there are. Um, in some cases, the projects are so large, 2,700 miles, that the cultural resources work won't be done for a while, especially if they're in certain parts of the country. So we're, put, we're, we're establishing procedures through a PA for those types of projects. And we, we, we reached, Jill is ahead of us, but she didn't have as many projects. But we're 50%. We're past we're 50 I We're 60%. I didn't have an <laughs> Well, that's all right. <laughs> Are there any other questions that you have? Um, well, yes. For the cultural people, you mentioned that you've been finding some new ways of identifying unmarked graves and right -aways. Could you comment on that? I think that would be very helpful for us cultural people. Um, I, I don't know that there are new ways, but we did also develop a best management practice like the way, one that we have for um, attaching broadband, essentially um, in, in the state of Virginia the VDOT rights of way, it's a big concern there. And so we've developed, um, it's like a, a four page brochure and um, it details things to look out for, it's illustrated. And we, I, I think that it is on NTIA B to NTIA's BTOP um, environmental compliance page. And if it's not, I can get it to get it to anyone who would want to ask me for it. But typically what we do in terms of implementing it, um, we will we first have a requirement in Virginia in particular for um, USGS quad maps to be reviewed so that if there are cemeteries listed there that aren't in the survey we know about them 
And then um, the BMPs are customized to whatever the project is, the project management information in the local contacts. Um, and then they are, it's a requirement that those are given to the construction folks and that they're trained on them going out. Any other questions, thoughts? Okay. Um, to those of you who are nervous at lunch, we're so far behind, we're five minutes early. <laughs> so how about that? So you can all make your plans. Um, I'm really glad that our speakers came. I think that I learned a lot from all the presentations. I learned a lot from the questions. Um, and actually f found the day to us a little tiring um, for exciting because I, I think you know that that so often for for federal preservation for federal employees we do our work in a vacuum one of the things that's been nice about the program comment has brought the, the the four of us together working on shared projects and so we get to talk about how our agencies are different and what we do and how how APEs are are organized differently and how we what we consider to be effects because I think um, among us Laura's the only archaeologist, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So there's there's something <laughs> there's something that Laura brings that, that all of us historians and architectural historians don't know because we don't do dirt. I don't do birds or dirt. Um, <laughs> although I started out as an archaeologist. My undergrad degree is in anthropology. Um, and that's actually how I met my wife. Yeah, we were doing a, a, an eighteenth century Quaker cemetery in Pennsylvania. So um, so it's not romantic, but it's how it happened. Um, <laughs> so I, so I, this has been a real good opportunity for me. I think it's been, I hope it's been a good opportunity for you guys. That is something that, that you come away, whether you're at the bottom of, of the pile as a, as, an as a cultural resource consultant, taking marching orders from engineering firms and, and other kinds of clients, or at the upper end of the, of the food chain where you're, you're an SEC licensee getting all of your minions to, to do all the work to satisfy our needs. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways of looking at this, so I think it's been very useful. Um, the, one of the things I would ask you to do is a little a logistics, I guess, before we break up. Um, if you have any comments about today, how it went, how security was, how lunch was, how we were, um, send me an email. We don't have a formal, you know, review or anything like that sheet. Um, it was just wasn't worth the effort but you know semi comments good bad or indifferent and you know we'll consider that the other th question I had and I had some requests for this during the day is is this something that that you found useful and you would like to have happen again not next week obviously but you know if, if we did this either together or individually on perhaps a yearly basis special topics or whatever it is if you if you think that's going to be useful again send send us an email and say, yeah, you want to do this, you'd, you'd be willing to take the time and effort to come in from LA to, to, to hear what federal agencies have to, to tell you. And if, if you're interested, send some suggested topics. What, what you feel in your field practice, you need to learn from us as federal employees and federal agencies to make your work better. Because that's, that's also the hidden message in this. And I've said it a couple times today, and I know they have as well, is that we really do take the old joke, you know, from the federal government I'm here to help. We actually sort of take it seriously. And we are here, we recognize that we work in assistance agencies and that the job of our agency is to assist you to go through our licensing process, to get your grants and do whatever. And so we feel an obligation, especially here at the SEC, to be helpful. And which is why I really encourage you, if you have questions, don't struggle with them. Call Don gave you his phone number um, I'll give you his email later um, <laughs> and you've got my phone number and email address so um, just ask us you know who it is. so so that's it if you want if you think this will be useful in another year's time say tell me that tell me what topics we should consider whatever um, and I also had a request from some people in the audience to send around the registration list and that gets into a variety of kinds of issues if you think it's a good idea, we can do that. If some of you don't want your, your email addresses and contact information released to the, to the world at large, 
um, let me know that too because we can always take names off the registration list if you're concerned about people knowing who you are I don't care why the reasons are um, you know it's a few um, a lot of what we've done today is up to each, you know each of the agencies set their own agendas what they wanted to talk about so um, so with that I think we, we are done we're done actually by my schedule early because we're gonna do conclusions at 430 um, I'm sure we'll be around for for a little bit if you want to answer questions I really thank you again for coming I um, was thrilled to death that, that the shippos came these guys stayed for the entire day I know for the guys from Annapolis it's real easy I mean I'm gonna get home after they do um, but you know Betsy from from um, Virginia Mark I guess left early uh, but it's just really great to see you here and it's, and it's actually really good for me I think Laura mentioned this too we see all your names and, and email addresses and your, your contacts on the telephones but it's nice to see you know who you are um, and I think probably vice versa so so with that, thank you very much for coming and um, <laughs> glad you came